It's a rather blowy Sunday morning here at Motorland Aragon, where we have been greeted by fairly low ambient temperatures, fairly strong winds, and a full package of races to come across five categories. This is the GT Wind Series weekend here at Motorland Aragon. My name is Adam Weller. I'll be joined by Izzy Browning and Lucas Gajewski on today's broadcast. This is our circuit for this weekend, the 18-corner, 5.3-kilometer circuit circuit known as Motorland Aragon, a venue that for the past 15 years has been one of the most revered circuits here in Spain. As you can see, we're not expecting a wonderfully warm day. Hopefully we are expecting a dry day, mind you. It's going to be rather different circumstances from what we had earlier in the week during testing and even what we had yesterday here at the uh, circuit. So we've got high winds, we've got low temperatures, and that means it's going to be a very difficult day for the drivers and for everyone, frankly. Uh, but of course, those tailwinds, headwinds will have a difference, will have an impact on what goes on in the cockpit. And there are many cockpits to consider this weekend. We have no less than five categories with us this weekend. We, of course, have the GT Winter Series, the GT4 Winter Series, Formula Winter Series, and the returning prototype winter series but we also have Euro Cup 3 here today for a pair of races a non-championship weekend for them in advance of their summer season so five categories to bring you two of the best junior single seater classes as well as GT and prototype action it's going to be a thrilling day here at Motorland healthy mix of sprint and endurance races as well of course the prototype wind series racing over 50 minutes plus one lap the gt races uh, a 30 minute sprint apiece for the two gt categories as well as a 55 minute enduro in the gts and an hour long enduro in the gt4s if you didn't join us yesterday, it was a day of thrills and spills. A major accident at the start of the Formula Winter Series race. However, everyone was okay uh, in that incident. We raced into the night uh, in the prototype Winter Series, and we had some brilliant dueling in both the GT and GT4 classes. That tells you the story of northeastern Spain, really. If you look into the distance, you can see the snow-covered mountains. If you look around you, you see the desert and blue lagoons. It is a fascinating part of the world here at Motorland Aragon. We will be getting started this morning with the Euro Cup 3 category. Some new names, some new faces to Euro Cup 3 on the grid this weekend. Uh, we have the main class. We also have the rookie class for drivers who haven't driven uh, regional spec cars before. Uh, so a few drivers making their first dabbles above Formula 4. Uh, this is almost the direct step up, really, from Formula Winter Series, which, of course, is uh, run in collaboration with Giedlik and uh, the organisers of Spanish F4, who are also behind the Euro Cup three category if you haven't seen euro cup three racing before you'll note that these while they are regional cars they do have a slightly different body kit uh, a rather more advanced body kit i understand it does provide something of an aero advantage over the standard spec 270 horsepower engine in these cars so quite the step up uh, from the rather tamer formula four cars uh, we very much look forward to welcoming these cars on to the grid. We were due to see Santalock racing with us. Unfortunately, their entries have not arrived, but we still have 14 cars on the grid for this one from MP Motorsport, Campos Racing, Polo Motorsport and Drivex. Of course, uh, three of those teams also competing in a Formula Wind Series this weekend. So there's a... Uh, a very big contingent from Campos, MP uh, and indeed Drivex this weekend uh, in their awnings. They've got a lot of manpower, a lot of personnel uh, on the grid and uh, they will be looking for success across both categories. As we see there, the crews getting the uh, tyres ready to go out there on the circuit and... Uh, 
imagine everyone trying to keep warm and it's going to be quite the task I think in the early stages of the day uh, to keep those uh, tyres up to temperature as well I was hearing in some cases uh, close to zero degrees Celsius some people were telling me others were saying oh maybe we'll get two or three degrees this morning uh, it is about that two three maybe four degrees Celsius if they're feeling generous uh, is what we're seeing uh, from the temperature gauges this morning so hardly uh, an ideal morning for uh, anyone who hasn't packed their jumpers from the UK it's deceptively sunny but it is not very warm this morning and uh, thankfully I shouldn't really acknowledge this, but I am in the commentary box, so I'm a little bit warmer. Uh, unfortunately, uh, diligent cameraman Johnny and uh, Izzy Browning will not be quite as warm. They'll be down on the grid in the next few moments as these Euro Cup 3 cars get ready uh, to go racing. There you see the iconic backdrop of the uh, famous Aragon Wall here. Uh, it's in all of the pictures for good reason. It's quite the spectacular uh, circuit landmark, uh, more imposing in person uh, than it is on camera. This 5.3-kilometre uh, circuit with quite a few deep braking zones. Of course, the most obvious being the turn 16 hairpin after the long back straight. However, uh, the corner you see in the distance there, turn 12, that's also a good overtaking zone. You can also get it done into turn 5, maybe set up at turn 5 for a move at turn 7. Uh, and, of course, the first corner as well, you can... Uh, make a brave lunge if you so choose. It's a, a circuit, uh, one of those modern circuits that has been designed with the classics in mind and it uh, does certainly seem to have paid off uh, a revered circuit. Quite a few drivers, well I think almost uni unilaterally, universally uh, new to the circuit unless they've competed previously in Spanish F4. Um, so all of our GT drivers for example are touching ground here for the first time and uh, everyone is really excited to be here and of course this is winter series sunday so this is the day where it's nothing but racing we'll be bringing you racing action from nine in the morning up until uh, six at the evening so we've got a full program of racing not even time for a lunch break as well today uh, it is a packed schedule of racing but if you haven't quite scratched the itch after uh, formula one and world endurance raced on saturday uh, in the middle east then well We've got uh, a full quota of Sunday racing for you uh, if you're feeling a bit lost and maybe feel like you might have to go to work because it's, it's Monday. Surely the Grand Prix's already happened. No, no, no. It's Sunday and there's still some racing for you to watch. So the car's arriving to the grid. And it uh, will be uh, Christian Ho starting from the front of the grid. And the front of the grid is where we find Izzy Browning. Izzy, over to you. Morning everybody, welcome down to the grid for the first race of the day. As Adam has already said, it is pretty windy down here and it is also a bit chilly. We've also had some rain overnight, so that's definitely going to play into the grip on the track this morning. But as I said, the first race of the day is the Euro Cup 3 race. Euro Cup 3 are in their second season and we're just waiting for the cars to come down now. We're still waiting for our pole position to come in. But yeah, Euro Cup 3 are in their second season and they have actually raced at Aragon before and they will race at Aragon again at the end of July. So it's a nice, nice weekend for them to kind of feel out the conditions and get used to the track. Um, and a lot of our drivers on this grid today will be back at the end of July in that Aragon round. We are gonna see if we can talk to a couple of our drivers so our pole sitter, as I said, Christian Ho is not here just yet, but we do have our P2 and our P2 is Valerio Rinicella. So I'm going to walk down and see if we can grab a word with him. They've got two races today, as Adam's already said, and our race one P2 is Valerio. Can we grab a word quickly? How are we feeling ahead of this race? So yeah, I'm happy to come back here to Spain. That's the idea there for here and I really enjoy it. So let's see if I can win this race on the start of the season. Perfect. And also you've got a uh, good good look down to turn one. So what are you going to do to be able to make sure that you're, you're first coming out of the first corner? Yeah, I'll try the best that as possible. So let's try to lead the race. Perfect. Wish you best of luck. Thank you. 
Uh, oh, our pole sitter has now arrived, so we're going to see if we can go and have a chat with him very quickly. So our pole sitter, Christian Ho, second in Spanish F4 last year and has actually won in Aragon. So, Christian, you seem to like this track. You've won here before. So do we think we can do it again today? Oh, we'll see. Uh, I think it'll be a pretty hard race to manage. It's my first race in Euro Cup, so yeah, we'll see. But obviously the goal is to win. Perfect. We wish you best of luck for today. Right, we're going to carry on down the grid. We haven't just yet had the three-minute board, so we are going to carry on down. As we carry on down, we've got another MP motorsport car on the left. We've got the 25 of Javier Segrera. Javier's competed in GB3 two seasons, one with Elite and one with Carlin, now the Rodin team. And one thing to say as well that Adam has also said on the commentary is a lot of our teams are doing the Formula Winter Series as well. It's been a very, very busy night for Campos race. They obviously were rebuilding that car of Maciej Gwadish in the Formula Winter Series yesterday. And they've also got cars out on the Euro Cup 3 grid. As we continue down, we've got Owen Tangavelu. He competed in Freca last year. So a lot of these cars, as Adam said, based on the regional car, but with an updated body kit. And you can kind of see a, quite a nice front wing i'd say if johnny if we just come down here on noah lyle's car you can kind of see it's a more sophisticated front wing than than some of the other um the other cars in the in the regional categories noah lyle starting alongside so noah has competed in british f4 last year and spanish f4 and um, and he'll be looking to have a good season in euro cup this year but for now we're going to head back up to adam in commentary Thank you, Izzy. As we saw then, Christian Ho on pole position for this one. The, uh, the mechanics now vacating the grid. The one-minute board has been displayed. The 15-second board is about to go up, so cars will momentarily be rolling for our first race of the day. And it will be Euro Cup 3 with the first of their two non-championship rounds here at Aragon. Of course, so we alluded to the fact that uh, we will be back here in late July uh, in the Euro Cup 3 sphere. Uh, of course, it will, with any luck, be a lot warmer uh, by the time they come here. But this is going to be some great track knowledge uh, for our drivers. It also establishes hierarchy among our drivers. Uh, about half the field, in fact, more than half the field, are new to regional spec cars. And they'll all be looking to stake their claim. Uh, you can denote the rookies by the red numbers on the car. And we'll talk you a bit more through that as we get on with the racing action. So then, the grid for this race. It is uh, Christian Ho starting from pole position for Campos. Valeria Rinicella is next for the 55 team. That is, of course, an MP Motorsport entry. Javier Segrera is in third place alongside Owen Tangavelu. Noah Lyle is in fifth place alongside Emerson Fittipaldi Jr. Theodore Jensen is next in seventh place alongside Michael Shin. Solomon Zanfari is in ninth place alongside Georgi Zaravsky. Uh, and Garrett Berry starts 11th place alongside Gaspard Le Galais. Row seven of the grid is also our final row of the four UAE in the winter of 2023 and was actually, th actually third place behind Christian Ho in the 2023 Spanish F4 Championship. So he will be very keen uh, to try and uh, beat Christian Ho on this occasion, given what happened in the championship scrap last year uh, with Christian just outscoring uh, Valerio Rinicella. Valerio might have a slight edge because he did the first two rounds of uh, Formula Regional Middle East uh, with MP earlier in the year. Whereas, as you heard from Christian there, it's his first regional spec car race. So he's going to have uh, a little bit more to contend with here in terms of uh, maybe first time going into the deep water on the first try. You see everyone trying to get some temperature into the tyres at the last minute. Of course, a, a wider, chunkier tyre on these cars versus the FWS machines as well. So it's that little bit harder to get the surface of the tyre up to temp. 
We can see the cars now just lining up. It will be uh, Valentin Klus that lines up last at the back of the order. Expect him to come through in the Campos Racing number five. For the first time today, we will go racing for 30 minutes plus one lap. The green flag flies. It is time for the Euro Cup 3 2024 season to get started with this non-championship round. We are underway and it's a very good start from Rinicella, but still to the front of the order as they go through turn one is Christian Ho. Everybody else through the first couple of corners cleanly and it is the Campos driver that leads the way from Rinicella, from Sagrera, uh, from Noah Lyle. I think they're in fourth place, side by side further back in the pack and one of the Drivex cars there just being forced slightly out wide. I believe that was Zaravsky uh, side by side with Berry further back in the pack. Some lockups as they run through turn five. Side by side with uh, the number two car there that we see in the hands of Noah Lyle. Noah Lyle uh, with the Lee Exotics backing, which we also see on Bianca Bustamante's FWS car. So they have a fairly active presence. They also backed a car in the Bathurst 12 hour a couple of weeks ago. Again, everybody seems to have got cleanly through the first few corners, which is always the first battle. Uh, Blokina and Le further back are uh, side by side at the back of the order. Oh, and a bit deep into turn 12 there uh, from Christian Ho, but Sagrera and Rinicella also didn't get a brilliant run through that corner. I just wonder if they're struggling there with some tailwind pushing them into the turn, so to speak. Around the outside there in the Drivex car goes Zaravsky and loses out a little bit on that one. They compact together at turn 15, but I think just about everybody stayed clean-ish as Rinicella and Sagrera run line astern. Looking to the outside here is Rinicella who fell behind Sagrera. Sagrera holding second place then. Oh, and very, very, very deep into the corner goes well half the field maybe more one driver going straight on there didn't quite catch who that was uh, going straight on at turn 16 but everybody continues on their way we'll see the order then as they come past three wide in places as they work their way through Christian Ho from Javier Segrera from Rinicella is your top three the Palo cars there getting into it the black machines further back Fourth place now is Noah Lyle ahead of Owen Tangavelu. Theodore Jensen sixth and uh, Emerson Fittipaldi Jr. seventh. But we've got a safety car uh, out on the circuit and only 12 cars came across the line. So we might have lost a couple of cars in that one because 14 cars took the start. That said, all of them are registered as coming across the line on my timing screen at the end of the first lap. So... I'm not sure quite what has caused the safety car just yet. Theodore Jensen, Garrett Berry and Emerson Fittipaldi Jr. 6th, 7th and 8th. Valentin close up to 9th place. It was Michael Shin who went straight on in such a big way uh, going into turn 16. We do have the safety car out. We do have the snatch vehicle running parallel to the track there at turn 11 which ah now there is the answer to the question of why we have a safety car out there and the answer is uh, Le Galais so the 20 car is in the gravel and has Blockina actually crossed the line at the end of the first lap no she hasn't so Blockina seemingly also involved is there a second yes there is there's a second car uh, just hiding behind the, uh, the the kind of hill in the middle of that section of circuit could just make out the rear wing uh, of uh, the Blokina car as well. So that means that unfortunately the two Drivex cars that I did mention were side by side, unfortunately managed to find each other uh, while going side by side. So Victoria Blokina and... Uh, Gaspard Le Galais have not had the start to the weekend, the start to their 2024 seasons that they would have hoped. And the safety car is out as a result of that. A costly error uh, for Michael Shin, though, on that first lap of the race. 
uh, just straight on into uh, turn 16. Rather remarkable that no one seemingly made contact at, uh, at turn 16. We saw them all go deep into the corner. Seems as though the wind is uh, blowing them down the straight then. They don't have the luxury of uh, headwind slowing them down. They've got the inconvenience of the tailwind pushing them into the corner. And we saw the effect of that going into turn 16. So it's Christian Ho from Javier Segrera, your top three. Segrera uh, comes in not in the rookie class, so he's got a little bit more of a, a background uh, in Euro Cup 3 specifically, as a matter of fact. Scored three podiums in the 2023 Euro Cup 3 season. And before that ran uh, two years of uh, GB3. So he's, he's had a few years of running uh, just below uh, FIA F3 level. So he's got some good experience. He had some very good results last year in Euro Cup 3. So one would expect him to be a favourite uh, on this grid. And sure enough, he's already moved up to second place from row number two. Of course, you mentioned you hear the name Emerson Fittipaldi. Emerson Fittipaldi Jr., the youngest son of the two time Formula One world champion and two time Indy 500 winner. Uh, Emerson Jr. came into cars via Danish F4 in 2021, uh, took three victories in that season and has been running uh, Italian and German F4 in 2022, uh, Frecker last year and is now uh, coming into Euro Cup 3, a driver with uh, some name on Monday. So he's uh, seeing out his... Uh, 18th trip around the sun in the best way possible uh, with, uh, with a weekend of racing here at Motorland Aragon. He was uh, one of the drivers that started karting a little bit later actually, only 14 years old uh, when Owen Tangavelu started kart racing. Moved into uh, French Formula 4 in 2020, was fifth in the category in 2021. Uh, also raced regional cars last year so uh, a lateral move across to Euro Cup 3 so then the safety car one would suspect will be in shortly but we have not yet had a uh, formal confirmation uh, that it will be in this lap. I, however, do not see any stricken cars anymore here at Turn 12. So for Christian Ho, he now has to form his first safety car restart uh, outside of Formula 4. Nothing that he hasn't weathered or drilled a million times before. The safety car will be in this lap as well. So uh, safety car uh, lights are, are already out. So that is good to see. Safety car will drive off into the distance then as we get to the end of this straight. And it will then be on the Campos Racing driver Christian Holt to dictate the pace from there compacting the field together as they try to get some heat into the tyres at such a low speed. I'm not sure that weaving actually does generate any heat, um, to be honest with you. But uh, let's see how good of a start it is for Christian. Javier Segrera, of course, raced Euro Cup 3 last year. He's all too familiar with this exact scenario. So we'll see uh, whether he has a trick in the book. Noah Lyle, of course, is relatively new, new to regional cars, but since he did the Middle East Championship, he's not registered as a rookie. Whereas Segrera has plentiful experience in this car, in this aero kit specifically. Christian Hull oh, gets a bit of a nudge there from Javier Segrera, and Christian takes that as time to go, and he disappears off up the road then. Christian Ho resumes the race with 18 minutes and 45 seconds left to go. Javier Segrera still there in second place. 
Uh, hopefully both cars are okay. It was the lightest of touches, so I don't think there'll be any damage to either car's bodywork, really. You can see there's some water uh, in some of the divots in the kerb still from the rain that uh, fell here last night. Certainly a clean circuit again after the rainfall yesterday, so maybe not yielding much grip out there at the moment. This is two Campos cars and two MP cars in at the top four then. Further MP machine in fifth with Owen Tangavello at the wheel, Theodore Jensen and Garrett Berry in sixth and seventh place for Polo competition. Of course, the uh, team, or Polo Motorsport, I should say, the team run under the name of the uh, the IndyCar star, Alex Polo. Christian Ho then heading towards turn 12. Oh, and again, he goes deep, again, struggling to get the car stopped under racing speeds. Now, Javier Segrera will be hoping to get a good run out of turn 14 and 15. They power out of the corner now, and it does look like Segrera is close enough that the slipstream will pull him potentially into this. And, in fact, he feels that he's got the... Uh, He's got the traction to maybe make the move without the slipstream. It's three wide. Sagrera and Rinicella go either side of Christian Hull. It's Sagrera with a nose ahead. Sagrera has the inside line for turn 16. Rinicella now to his outside. Christian Ho has to settle for third place then. And again, they get caught out by the braking zone at 16. The number 18 car, I believe that is Garrett Berry. Into the side, was that of Noah Lyle or was that Valentin Klus, one of the Campos cars? Uh, but we have a pair of damaged cars there, stationary then at turn 16. It was uh, Noah Lyle that got collected by Theodore Jensen. In fact, Theodore Jensen in the uh, number 30 car was the Hello Motorsport machine that spun. And we have full yellow once again. Uh, out on circuit, the number 30, the number two, uh, both in a spin there. No, we're lo there was really nothing that uh, Christian Hull could do on such a long straight. The contact between Noah Lyle and Theodore Jensen will be investigated after the race, so... Uh, they will both be heading up to the headmaster and uh, getting them maybe slightly reprimanded. Of course, there's also uh, the matter of a push-to-pass system uh, in this championship as well. I think it's roughly 25 brake horsepower uh, extra on tap for the... Uh, for the push-to-pass, much like uh, the IndyCar system. Obviously, they have to use that sparingly, ration it across the race distance. I dare suggest that uh, <laughs> that was uh, spammed quite heavily uh, as they uh, as they ran down to uh, turn 16 in that three-wide scenario for the lead. We don't have to wait long before we go racing once again, though, because uh, we are now having the safety car in. The lights are off on the safety car. The safety car has been declared in this lap. Now it's Javier Segrera's turn uh, to lead the way. So Segrera will lead the field off for this restart. He's got uh, Rinicella behind him. Christian Holt there in third place, Owen Tangavelu in fourth, and Valentin Klus, who starts at the back of the grid, already up to fifth place. Can he get a podium out of this? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, it is Segrera then that leads it as we are rolling once again. Going defensive then is Christian Hull for third place as he's got uh, Tangavelu all over the back of him. Lock up there from the fifth place man, Valentin Klus. Valentin, I think, was one of very few drivers not to go massively deep into uh, 
turn 16 a couple of laps ago, which is how he moved up from ninth to fifth position. Everybody running through turn five once again. And it is Segrera from Rinicella at the front and Christian Ho just about holding on despite the advances of Owen Tangavelu. It does seem as though Christian is maybe slightly struggling for pace. Uh, maybe struggling for tyre temperature early on. Christian Hull has fallen off the back of Segrera and Rinicella already. The two MP cars disappearing up the road and the rest of the field is compacting behind the youngster from Singapore. Again, they're struggling to get the cars stopped into turn 12. And so again, <laughs> I think maybe brace a little bit as we go into turn 16. Christian Hull Again, goes fairly shallow at turn 15, and that might be an opportunity, therefore, for Owen Tangavelu in the slip. We've got a car slowing. It's Valentin Klus. Valentin Klus is slowing from fifth position. Valentin seemingly has a problem then. It's side by side for third position. Owen Tangavelu with a nose ahead, but he's got the outside line. Who's braver on the brakes without being too brave? It is Christian Hull that just about holds on. Some lockups further back. Hopefully everybody has stayed out of each other's way as we continue to run side by side in the battle for third place. Owen Tangavelu looks like he's just about done it, but will Christian Ho fight back as they run towards the first corner once again? He goes to the outside line at turn number one, but I think the threat has been covered off there quite handily by Owen Tangavelu, and he'll be hoping but he does indeed now have the pace over Christian. If Christian was simply struggling to get the heat back into the tyres, I have no doubt that the tyres are now back up to temp, so maybe he can find the pace now to fight back. Now, Valentin Klus seemingly did cross the line to start a new lap, so whatever issue struck his car may have actually already... Uh, rectified itself but Valentin dropped to the back of the field we have a, a track limit uh, warning against uh, Rinicella now is it just a warning I think it is for now just a warning uh, for Rinicella I haven't seen any confirmation of a penalty pop up on screen yet the top two go through shot Tangavelu in third place Christian Ho down there in fourth place, and then it's young Emerson Fittipaldi Jr. in P5. He'd love to make it four from four at the top of the field for MP Motorsport, but he's got uh, Christian Ho to try and get past. Very close running further back in the pack there. Sagrera and uh, Rinicella, I don't think, are close enough for anything to go down here unless Rinicella is feeling particularly brave. He does have a look to the inside. I'm curious to see what goes on among that pack further back, though. Uh, from fifth down, they're all very close indeed. From sixth down, hopefully they all make it through the hairpin in one piece. Uh, but they were very, very close indeed. So Guerra and Rinicella cross the line to start lap number 10 of the race then already. Uh, over 20 minutes into this one, despite the safety car, it has flown by a bit. You see Valentin close at the back of the pack there, still running. So uh, the German is still out there. Valentin, who uh, joined ADA CF4 back in 2022, halfway through the season, the very moment he turned 15. A couple of years on, he's moving into regional cars. Saw Solomon Zanfari there just behind Garrett Berry in the battle for eighth position. Our two leaders head down to the corkscrew once again then. Segrera looking to start his season off on a high here. A reminder, this is a non-championship event, so they aren't scoring points here, but uh, momentum is momentum at the end of the day. A trophy is a trophy. And a victory here, a good result here, positive data here will all strengthen these drivers' campaigns. Not all of these drivers are yet announced for a full season effort in Euro Cup 3, but uh, I'm sure some of them still investigating their options. There's the sole remaining Drivex car 
in the hands of uh, Georgi Saravsky. Running in P6, and he's got uh, Michael Shin just behind him. Of course, Michael Shin, who on the first lap rather dramatically uh, straight-lined turn 16. He's still in the process of trying to recover his way up the order. Five minutes and 35 left on the clock as they cross the line this time. Then, of course, once the clock hits zero, we'll be on the penultimate lap on the race of the race officially uh, because of the plus one lap. Looks like the DriveX car has fallen back. Yes, I thought Michael Shin was uh, tucked up nicely behind uh, Zaravsky uh, as they came out of turn 15. And sure enough, Zaravsky's lost out not just to Shin, but also to Garrett Berry and is now under pressure from Solomon Zanfari as well. So Zanfari uh, just in the wheel tracks there of Zaravsky. Looks to the inside as they run through turn number five. Garrett Berry up to seventh then. Uh, Huyen Shin, Michael Shin continuing his path up there as well, of course. Uh, Huyen going by Michael, the Korean name. Uh, is the one on the official entry list coming up from F4. Hoping for a positive weekend. If he can salvage a top five after his moment earlier on, I think that would be a pretty positive outcome. But he has to try and close in on uh, Fittipaldi Jr., who's about two, two and a half seconds up the road. Certainly seems like tricky conditions that our drivers are faced with this morning. Low ambient temperatures, strong winds, and uh, everyone fighting to keep the cars on circuit. Rinicella in the slipstream once again of Javier Segrera tried to get to the inside, but there was no way through there. So he goes around the outside line. Rinicella deep into the corner, and Javier Segrera holds on in at the lead for the time being. With such a long straight, there's a whiff of inevitability about the side-by-side -side action uh, for the lead. Can Rinicella maybe set himself up for a go into the first corner? He's again going to be only off of the outside line. Segrera covering it off well. Rinicella, though, around the outside. He leads. So it's a great move from Rinicella to go all the way around the outside at turn number one. He just had the momentum in his favour. And Rinicella is your race leader once again. Of course, he started on the front row. He lost out to Javier Segrera early in the race. He and Segrera then swallowed up Christian Ho in the Campos Cup. And now it's the 55 that assumes the lead. But can Javier Segrera have a go? Owen Tangavelu now a distant third place ahead of Christian Ho. I don't think Christian has the pace in the car to try and fight back, but he's not a million miles away. A slip up through the turn 12 through 15 complex may yield an opportunity for Christian. Fittipaldi will be keeping an eye on Michael Shin in the background as well for fifth and sixth place. Segrera, a couple of car lengths back on Rinicella as they go through turn 15 and that didn't look like a great run through 15 either for Segrera maybe uh, two three kilometers an hour slower at the apex and that means that even with the slip and even with the push to pass he's not going to close in sufficiently I don't think uh, going into turn 16 further back it's a lot closer though you see there's Zaravsky in the red-nosed drive x car with Zanfari just behind him Zanfari to the inside line as they Run to turn 16. As the car alongside does lock it up and really runs Zaravsky out of space there. That was uh, right on the limit of fair, I would suggest. Uh, but uh, it gets him through uh, into the lead of the battle for eighth position. And uh, after running in the top half dozen, Zaravsky is starting to fall back and Valentin Klus now the only car running behind him. Doesn't appear that there have been any uh, formal track limits penalties 
across the race distance that I can see on the notice board. So that's uh, some positive running, if so, because uh, we've seen a fair bit of track limits this weekend already here at Motorland Aragon. Rinicella leads the way then with 44 seconds left on the clock. Now, is this the penultimate lap? I think it might well be uh, that the clock hit zero roughly as they go through the hairpin. So we are on the penultimate lap of the race. Rinicella and Javier Segrera just three tenths apart at the line. Can Segrera fight back? Will we see any movement further through the order? A big uh, mistake there from Zanfari again, running it deep into the corner, not having a good run through turn 13 either as a result of that. Can Zaravsky maybe use that as a chance to fire back? I'm not sure he's quite close enough, but one of the MP cars has had an off. Who is that? Is that, is that Segrera? It looks like the 25 to me. I'm just trying to squint uh, at the number of the car or is it Owen Tangavello in the 26 um we'll have a look it's actually the 24 car it's e e Emerson Fittipaldi Jr I could see the two but that's not very helpful when you've got three cars with consecutive numbers and it was Emerson Fittipaldi Jr then he must have made an error at 14:15, uh, and that has handed third uh, fifth place over to Michael Shin we've got a car slowing as well uh, that looks like Valentin Klus again having a problem uh, with his car but now gets it back underway looks like there's some electrical gremlins at play there we've seen an error then for Fittipaldi Jr he's just ahead now of Garrett Berry as Valentin Klus is again coasting we're on the last lap of the race and at the front of the field Rinicella has built a lead of about a second over Javier Segrera. So Segrera looks like he is uh, not quite able to fight back on this occasion. It is the final lap of the race here at Motorland Aragon. The first appearance of the season for Euro Cup 3 under racing conditions at this non-championship round and Rinicella in his first appearance in a regional spec car is looking to start off in the very best way possible. Rinicella did do the first two rounds of uh, Formula Regional Middle East, but I think because it was only uh, the two rounds, he's still classified as a rookie driver. So not quite his first ever appearance in a regional car, but it is his first appearance in Euro Cup 3. And unless Javier Segrera has something special for him uh, going through 16, 17 and 18, it is going to be Valerio Rinicella that crosses the line to take his first Euro Cup 3 victory. No points, but a lot of pride for Valerio Rinicella, who leads a 1-2-3 across the line for MP Motorsport. Owen Tangavelu crosses the line third place. Christian Ho fourth ahead of Michael Shin. Emerson Fittipaldi Jr. recovers to sixth place ahead of Garrett Berry and Solomon Zanfari. Georgi Zaravsky finishes in ninth place and we'll see Valentin Klus hopefully come across the line while he's been continuing to fight. Uh, no, actually, we will not see uh, Valentin Klus across the line. Uh, you see the car stationary there at turn two. So whatever gremlins are in the system, uh, in that Campos car, the number five machine. They have proven terminal for the time being. Hopefully that car uh, can be fairly easily sorted ahead of the second race later on in our schedule. But not the start that he would have wanted, certainly to his time in Euro Cup 3. Valeria Rinicella, though with a lot of positives to take out of that race. Had a brilliant scrap with Segrera with Christian Holt. Christian said on the grid from pole position that uh, he thought it was going to be a difficult race to manage and he didn't quite have the race pace of those around him, but still an impressive showing for Campos racing driver, but it's the MP cars that uh, 
are dominating in this one. And uh, while I know the teams are separate, the Euro Cup 3 personnel and the Formula 4 personnel, there's not that much crossover between them this weekend. Uh, I know that the MP Motorsport uh, garage was alive with uh, activity as they tried to fix Matrai Gwadish's number seven car. And uh, Gwadish, uh, I believe, will be out there in Formula Wind Series later on. Rinicella, though, leading the cars to Park Ferme, to the podium. And we will hear from him once again with, uh, with Izzy Browning. He sounded fairly muted in the car early on, fairly focused on what was uh, ahead. And we'll see now quite how he feels after claiming that race victory. Pulls the car up in P1. see the tyre deg on those handcooks as well. They've actually sustained quite well, but uh, certainly these will be consigned to the uh, recycling heap, I'm sure. And up onto the car comes Valeria Rinicella. Great to see that it means a lot to him. Taking a win and uh, on just his third weekend, in a uh, regional spec car, his first weekend in a Euro Cup 3 spec car. He is a race winner. Uh, he'll get his helmet off before he talks to us for the benefit of the broadcast. But uh, he is one happy driver after this one. Um, Valerio Rinicella with uh, just three tenths of a second over him at the, uh, at the end, over Segrera at the end of the race. Owen oh, Tangavelu, of course, making it three from three for MP Motorsport on that podium. And uh, certainly scenes of celebration, albeit not for long. They can't afford to celebrate for too long because we are going to be racing again uh, very soon uh, with some more of our single seaters, of course, in the form of the Formula Winter Series. Uh, the schedule for today is one that, as I mentioned, is extremely compact, and it is Formula Wind Series up next. So a double dose of junior single-seater racing to kick off your morning. Uh, will it be two wins in two different specs of cars for MP Motorsport? Well, certainly, Valeria Rinicella has laid his cards on the table and said, right then, F4 boys, that's how you do it. We'll see... Uh, whether our MP crews in FWS can match the performance we just saw from Valerio Rinicella. Izzy is ready down at the uh, underneath the podium, so let's hear from our race winner. Hi everyone, we're down here with our race one winner, Valeria Rinicella. Valeria, that looked like a really difficult race out there. A lot of wind out there. How was it for you? Yeah, it was super fantastic. I'm really happy to come back here and uh, win in uh, Motorland. It was the only race that I didn't do a podium or victory last year in F4. So I'm really happy to complete all the race here in uh, all the track in Spain. So really happy. It was really difficult. The start was not the greatest, but I managed to with the safety car to come back in P1, so I take the victory. And you made an absolutely fantastic move towards the end of the race to grab the lead, so just tell us about that. Yeah, I just trust the car on the outside and feel the downforce, so really happy to enjoy this race. And you've got another one later to do it again, hopefully, yeah? Yeah, we say one new tyre, so let's see if, what I can do. All right, best of luck. See you later. He heads off up to the podium, and we'll go back to Adam for all the replays. Thank you, Izzy. Firstly, we'll just take a look, I think, uh, at the results of that. I'll run you through the results in full. Rinicella, of course, your race winner in that one, ahead of Javier Segrera. Owen Tangavello in third place. Christian Ho in fourth position, ahead of Michael Shin, uh, rounding out our top five. Emerson Fittipaldi Jr. recovering to sixth place despite a late moment. Garrett Berry in seventh, ahead of Zulman Zamfari. Georgi Zaravsky in ninth position and Valentin Klus rounding out your uh, classified finishes despite not ending up crossing the line on the last lap in 10th. Noah Lyle, Theodore Jensen, Legale and Blockina all had issues over the course of the race distance. It was a good start from our pole sitter Christian Ho at the beginning of the race. 
However, as we went down towards the uh, the first of the uh, hairpins at turn 16, the first run through the hairpin, it became rather evident uh, that uh, people were struggling to get the cars stopped really, really deep into the uh, hairpin went Michael Shin. He did very well not to collect anyone in that moment. The tailwind really making these drivers struggle to get cars stopped into turn 12 and turn 16. The MP cars surrounded poor Christian Ho at one point. And it would be Segrera that took the lead as this incident between Jensen and Lyle ended both of their races and brought out a second safety car after the pair of DriveX competitors uh, Blockina and Legale had set out a safety car earlier in the race. Zaravski in the third DriveX car was being swallowed through the field after uh, running in the top half dozen. Meanwhile, a great move here in two parts. It was not quite successful for Valerio Rinicello around the outside at turn 16, but when he got to the first corner, he had the confidence, as he said, he had the arrow underneath him and he moved into the lead of the race. Further back in the field, Solomon Zanfari making up places there. Quite the block pass uh, on uh, Zanfari, uh, on Zaravski. He went a little bit wide, did Solomon, but he still managed to get the car home, and it was a win. And an all MP Motorsport top three here at Aragon as we kick off Euro Cup three with this 2024 pre-season event. A win for Valerio Rinicella. It was great to see that it meant a lot to Valerio. He was pretty happy with his efforts in that race and uh, get the opportunity to do it all again later on. The Euro Cup 3 race number two set to get started at uh, 10 past two local time here at the Motorland Aragon. Of course, next up on the grid, on the circuit, we will have the uh, horde of Formula 4 machinery, the buzzing hornets of Formula Winter Series. 38 cars set to start on this one. I don't know if we will have all 38 necessarily after the incidents and accidents in yesterday's race. I understand the MP Motorsport of... Uh, Seemingly got Matchai Gwadish's car ready, but of course, when you replace an engine, replace a gearbox, etc., etc., there's a lot of room for gremlins to uh, to muscle their way in also. And we'll have to see uh, whether or not Matchai's car is fighting fit. Certainly for his benefit, I hope, uh, that he does get the opportunity to perform. He was very uh, disappointed, of course, uh, yesterday. Had an interview with Izzy, and you could tell that he was... Um, very upset with the circumstances uh, stalling the car and uh, a couple of the drivers having nowhere else to go so then the Euro Cup 3 race has concluded of course in a few moments time we will see the podiums uh, up there so we will have Lukas Gajewski up on the podium and uh, I was up there yesterday I can attest the fact that it's Quite blowy up there, quite cold up there. I imagine it's not the most pleasant place to be this morning, but it's a little bit sweeter uh, if you're offered a trophy. And that is exactly what our uh, podiums will be uh, offering. And I understand that there will be a rookie podium as well as an overall podium if I have my, uh, my facts straight. But uh, we know, of course, that Valeria Rinicella is going to receive a, uh, a pot, a trophy, a first race win in Euro Cup 3 and uh, that momentum will be critical for him. Um, you can get positive energy, positive data, build yourself some confidence in testing but there's nothing quite like racing and uh, this non-championship event at Motorland Aragon giving drivers the opportunity to really really find their footing under racing conditions. So then we will just mention as well some information that I've got uh, from uh, some of our media crew that uh, we are going to be down one car in FWS. Unfortunately, Carrie Schreiner does have a cracked chassis uh, after her uh, impact with Machai Gwadish. So while Gwadish's car is okay, 
It seems as though Carrie's is too damaged. So uh, unfortunately for Carrie, her weekend comes to an end early. I know she was quite shaken up after the impact yesterday. Hopefully she now has time to uh, to regroup, rally, and get ready to uh, head to Jeddah for the uh, F1 Academy season opener that she will take part in next weekend. But uh, no Carrie Schreiner for the West rest of the weekend. What we will have a lot of this weekend, though, is Lukas Gajewski presenting podiums. Here comes the first of them now. Thank you very much, Adam Weller, and welcome everybody from the podium as well for the first one of the day after the first race of the day for Euro Cup 3. So let's kick off our first podium ceremony for the uh, Sunday action here at Motorland Aragon. And we start with our rookie podium. So please welcome in third place of the rookie classification, Garrett Barry. In second place, it's Christian Ho. And your winner in rookie class is Valerio Rinicella. Well done as we welcome Andres Mendres from the Spanish Formula 4 and of course the Euro Cup 3 organization to present the uh, trophies to our winning three Wookiee drivers up here on the podium. And of course, let's gather them on the uh, highest step of the podium. Just as well, guys, please share the highest step of the podium for our pictures. Yes, thank you very much. And then can we please have another big round of applause for our top three finishers in rookie class. For Palo Motorsport, it's Garrett Berry in third. For Campos, it's Christian Ho in second. And for MP Motorsport, your rookie winner, Valerio Winicella. Thank you very much, guys. Now, coming up next is our overall podium, and of course, we will celebrate with the winning team just as well. So, please welcome for the winning team, MP Motorsports. In third place, congratulations for MP Motorsport, our Tangavelo. In second place, for MP Motorsport, just as well, Javier Sagrera. And your winner for MP Motorsport, once again, it's Valerio Rinicella. And for the winner, Valerio Rinicella, let's listen to the Italian national anthem. Well done, thank you very much. That's the Italian national anthem for your race winner here in Motorland Aragon after the first of two competitions today as Andres Mendres is handing out trophies once again. MP Motorsport, the winning team, locking out the podium with our Tangevelu in third with our second place driver Javier Zagrera and of course your winner Valerio Rinicella as we have two more trophies presented by Andres Mendres. So please guys, get together on the highest podium just as well for our final podium picture after race number one for the the Euro Cup 3 here in Motorland, Aragon. And then, can we please have another big round of applause from the pits, your podium in race number three with MP Motorsport, Owe Tangevelu in third place, Javi Zagreya in second, and your winner, Valerio Rinicella. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed. So that concludes our first of many podiums today here in Motorland, Aragon. And of course, plenty of more podiums are due to follow today. Next up, we stay with single seaters. Formula Winter Series on their penultimate weekend of the season. They've been out yesterday. Very spectacular, a bit too spectacular, if we are honest, as Adam Weller has pointed out earlier on in commentary. Cars are lining up in the end of the pits and heading towards the grid. So it's race number two for Formula Winter Series, live from Motorland Aragon, coming up next. Yes, indeed, we move from Euro Cup 3 to Formula 4 machinery with the Formula Winter Series. It's going to be an extremely intriguing race for my money. Uh, Griffin Peebles, who with a single point yesterday moved into an undisputed championship lead, 109 points for him, 108 points for uh, Andres Cardenas. Uh, he is starting from 15th on the grid. That, for me, is the biggest story, that Griffin is going to have to start a long way down the order. Uh, we have Andres Cardenas starting from 5th place. Of course, he had a moment in race 1 uh, that meant that he uh, ended up not scoring, ultimately. Uh, had to fight his way back through the field. But uh, he'll be looking to right those wrongs and get some good points on the board. Another big story, of course, is... Uh, newcomers to FWS certainly not newcomers to Formula 4 racing in the form of Keanu Alizari and Jack Beaton both of whom have been incredibly strong uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, few months across uh, Asia Southeast Asian champion Jack Beaton and uh, Keanu Alizari who of course was one of the primary protagonists uh, in the championship battle that ultimately went to Freddie Slater in uh, F4 UAE. I note that Alexander Savinkov has already made his way down to the grid. Uh, everyone else has only just left the pit lane, so I'm not sure uh, the, whether, or not he's, uh, whether or not he's gone early or whether everyone else is showing up late. In fact, it might be that he's the only car that hasn't decided to do two installation laps, uh, which might well explain that. Of course, they do two installation laps, do a practice start uh, down in the uh, pit lane. So uh, Keanu Alazari. Uh, and Co will surely arrive on the grid in the not too distant future. We do have one of the black, white and red cars showing up to the grid now, but I suspect that could be Kabir Anarag if it pulls up on pole position. We know that it is uh, Keanu Alazari, uh, but uh, both Alazari and Beaton lock out the front row on their first appearances in Formula Winter Series. And then it's an all rookie uh, row number two. Uh, with Machai Gwadish and Kabir Anarag. Hopefully Machai's car is running. We hope to see that number seven down there on the grid. MP Motorsport have put a mighty shift in to get that car down there. Izzy Browning, uh, your mighty shift continues down on the grid. Over to you. Hello everyone, welcome down to the grid for our second race of the day. I have to say, myself and Johnny behind the camera are feeling a little bit chilly down here. So uh, I'm a bit jealous of Adam off in the commentary box. We're just waiting for some of our cars to um, come through onto the, onto the grid. I will note, I did just see in the pit lane a front wing change for one of the Rodin cars uh, just quickly. So we've had a couple of uh, cars being delayed, but yeah, we are just waiting for the cars to come down now. So we've got our P2, so we might try and grab a quick word with him before our pole position arrives. So P2 is Jack Beaton. Keanu Alazari starts on pole for the second time and Jack Beaton for the second time. Does look like they might just be doing some work on the car. I'm gonna see if I can get round. Are we able to jump in quickly with you, Jack? So you start again on the second position alongside the same guy as yesterday. What's the plan to get him today? Yeah, starting P2 again. Uh, we know what to do. Yesterday we had a really bad safety car restart. So the plan is uh, once we get in front, just stay there. Be aggressive and yeah, that's the plan. 
And it's quite cold down here. So is the te tyre temperature something you're worried about this morning? Yeah, for sure. The fastest guy today will be whoever has the most tyre temperature. It's uh, really cold. It's going to be really difficult. So hopefully we can be that person. All right. Well, you better hope it's you then. Best of luck. <laughs> so as we continue down the grid, we've got Maciej Gwadish's car over here. Um, they have managed to put the car back together, as Adam said. So we're going to grab a quick word with Maciej if we can. Maciej, are we able to jump? Uh, oh, it's just being spoken to on the radio. I'll just let him carry on quickly. So I have, am just hearing in my ear that the 57 of Leah Block got a puncture on the way to the grid. So we don't expect her to be turning any time soon, turning up to the race any time soon. Um, Adam, we'll keep you, have to keep you posted on that one. Right, I am going to dive in with Maciej just quickly now. Maciej, just quickly, how are we feeling for this race? Um, quite confident. I mean, I hope I'm going to have a good start. Uh, we tried to do a really good formation, like just to warm those tires. Um, we tried to do best side than yesterday. I mean, yesterday, of course, I really so much clash, and today uh, we tried to even have a wheel spin. It's bad to lose two positions and stall and crash. So, yeah, confident. If I do a good start, we'll try to overtake immediately. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Best of luck for today. All right, the one minute boards have gone up, and we're about to get this race started, so we'll head up to Adam. Gosh, that was fast. I almost spilt my drink. Amazing. Uh, no resting around today in terms of uh, getting those grids rolling. Uh, the 77 car is down at the end of the pit lane with Thomas, uh, not Thomas Strauven. My apologies. Oh, that's Ella Lloyd, isn't it, in the 77 car? That's a, a big shame for her. So Ella will have to start from the pit lane. Uh, that might be on uh, account of not having two laps. She only got a, a lap or so of running in in quali uh, before the car stopped out on circuit so um, I think that might actually be a regulatory uh, matter that she is there in the pit lane uh, but she'll be starting from the back she recovered brilliantly to uh, get uh, into the top 25 or so uh, yesterday from the very back of the grid made up some good positions and avoided all of the dramas uh, the cars though are rolling and we have 38 set to race well 37 of course bearing in mind that carrie schreiner has had her issues and hopefully leah block will be there in spite of her puncture let's run you through the grid then for this one always a rapid fire thing when we go through this grid it is of course keanu alazari who starts from pole position jack beaton starting alongside him machai guadish in the freshly rebuilt mp motorsport car starts from third alongside kabir anorak andres cardenas in, th in fifth place alongside thomas strauven for rodin on to row four of the grid and it is one kota alongside akshay bora mikhail pedersen starts from ninth place alongside Lucas Fluscher who of course managed to move up to fourth position yesterday James Agosi in 11th and Kiko Macedo Francisco Macedo if you prefer on row six Flavio Olivieri is in 13th Gianmarco Pradel in 14th Griffin Peebles in P15 and Dawa De Decker in 16th place Peter Bazinelos in 17th place and Adam Hideg in 18th. Row 10 of the grid is Maxime Reem alongside Filippo Fiorentino, Alexander Savinkov and Rene Lammers in 21st and 22nd. Rene not with a good second lap in qualifying one, hence he's so far down. Lynn Hedenius in 23rd, Finn Harrison in 24th. Moving on to row 13, Leah Block was set to start from 25th. I really hope she is actually on her grid slot rather than starting from the pit lane after the puncture that's been reported. Arthur Durizon in 26th place, Edouard Borgna in 27th alongside Ernesto Rivera will be looking for a better run of fortune this time. Lorenzo Castillo and Preston Lambert start from row 15. Lenny Reed and Victor Dobzanski in 31st and 32nd, Nathaniel Berebi in 33rd, Enzo Tarnvinichkel, Enya Fry, Ella Lloyd and Bianca Bustamante round out our 37 car order here at Aragon. Carrie Schreiner, of course, sadly not taking the start. So then the cars are heading already towards 
the main straight with the beginning of this race. 30 minutes plus one lap to come. We saw the effect of the tailwind uh, going into turn 12 and 16 with the Euro Cup three cars. And I expect similar here uh, for the Formula Wind Series drivers. Hopefully they were all at the monitors uh, during the previous race and saw the issue uh, uh, as a result of that. I uh, also want to keep an eye out for Leah Block's car if she's in the queue. Is that Leah there? Yes, Leah Block is there uh, where she is supposed to be uh, on the queue. So that's really good news as well. I know a lot of people are here to watch the progress of Leah Block as she takes her first step into junior single-seater racing. And thankfully, despite a reported puncture uh, on the uh, first, uh, on her outlap, uh, installation laps, uh, GRS have managed to get a new tyre on the car and she is ready to go. Keanu Alazari is ready to go. He has been for a while. It takes a long time uh, to get 30 plus Formula 4 cars lined up in their respective grid slots. But we will do so in the next few moments. We saw and I'm just understanding that someone spun in front of Ella Lloyd, which is why she had her front wing replaced. Uh, so Ella Lloyd uh, starting from pit lane because her front wing was severed by someone else spinning in front of her. So that solves that mystery. Any further mysteries are about to be solved with some hearty rotor racing. We are going to go racing in just a few moments here in the Formula Winter Series. It's race number two, 30 minutes plus one lap begins. Now we go racing and it's a bad start again from Machai Gwadish. Thankfully, he's rolling on this occasion. In the lead, though, is Keanu Alazari as everybody else works their way through the first couple of corners. A lock up further back in the field. A few drivers locking up, of course, with these cold tyres, cold brakes, etc., etc. But everyone seems to have got through the first couple of corners relatively unscathed. Side by side, oh, Leah Block. Leah Block gets tagged there by the number 74. Ah, Lenny Reed into the side of Leah Block. Thankfully, I think all wheels still pointing the right way on Leah's GRS car, so hopefully she can continue on her way. It is Alazari in the lead of the race. We've got one car peeling way off the circuit, way off the racing line. I think that may have been the cram number 35 of Flavio Olivieri going ultra, ultra, ultra defensive. Dower de Decker bouncing across the curbs at the corkscrew. Rene Lammers going wide on the opposite end of the corkscrew as well. Everybody uh, piling through the corner. Now turn 12 is the first place where we saw people struggling to get the car stopped uh, in Euro Cup 3. And yes, again, we are seeing uh, drivers really, really having to fight it. We've got one spinning. It's a DriveX car. It is Macedo by the looks of it in the 66 that is facing the wrong way in a really uncomfortable spot. Uh, but hopefully he can get going again. We've got a front wing flying as well further back, or at least a piece of bodywork flying. I think that might have been, uh, well, I'm not sure who it was. It was either one of the Campos cars or Machai Gwadish. Uh, meanwhile, we've got some fighting further back there as Juan Cota tries to get past Thomas Strauven. Now, does everybody learn their lesson from the Euro Cup race? Have they realized how hard it is to get the car stopped in the current conditions? The answer is broad. Well, almost, yes. Not everybody has learned their lesson. One of the Campos drivers going straight on there. I suspect that could have been Finn Harrison based on where it came from in the pack. Either that or Ernesto Rivera. We'll see in a short while, but the safety car has been put out onto the circuit. So the safety car is out there. Rene Lammers is into the pits. So I think he was the other party involved in the contact that saw the white bodywork flying out of turn 15. And uh, I believe we can now cut to some replays as a few drivers peel into the pits with damage. Uh, let's get a look at the start then. Machai Gwadish got swallowed up by the pack, uh, but at least he got underway this time. Everybody else locking up some uh, smoke up in the air, but it was all okay. However, a couple of corners later, Leah Block, Lenny Reed meeting in the middle at turn three. And uh, Leah did get tagged a couple of different times there. One of the other cars tagging her as, as she was uh, spinning. So hopefully her suspension is intact. But I 
do wonder. Uh, we then saw a few drivers almost going straight on at turn 12. One driver spinning at turn 12, and that was uh, Kiko Macedo, Francisco Macedo. Uh, thankfully, everyone, I think, avoided him. Uh, but nonetheless, the safety car is out, and Macedo is actually in the uh, pit lane now. Rene Lammers making contact there. I think maybe that was with Finn Harrison, actually, uh, the contact. But nonetheless, we saw bodywork flying. It looked as though most drivers had figured out that the uh, tailwind uh, was against them coming into turn 16. However, one of the Campos cars with a tyre, I think, going down. I think the left, uh, sorry, the right rear on that Campos car was going down. Uh, and I think it was Finn Harrison because Finn came into the pit lane and is now on an outlap, as is Rene Lammers. So my hypothesis uh, is that it was Lammers and Harrison that got into each other. And as the bodywork was severed um, on Rene Lammers' car, Finn Harrison may have caught a puncture there as well because it looked as though the right rear was going down uh, as that Campos car went straight on. So then your order as we run around under safety car conditions as Keanu Alazari in the lead, beaten second, Andres Cardenas, the driver looking to try and uh, move himself back up into uh, the championship lead at the expense of Griffin Peebles. He sits in third place ahead of Juan Cota. Thomas Strauven in the top five for Rodin in fifth place. Us Racing's Kabir Anarag in sixth position ahead of James Agosi. Mikel Pedersen in eighth place. Akshay Bora in P9. Rounding out the top ten is Krams, Fli Fli uh, Flavio Olivieri and uh, Machai Guadish in 11th place. Ahead of Lucas Flusha, Gianmarco Pradell and Griffin Peebles. Our championship leader only in 14th place. As you've seen, the lights are out on the safety car, which means we are going to go back to racing this time. Desperate attempts to get some heat cycles through these tyres before they return to racing conditions. You heard Alazari. In fact, no, it was Jack Beaton, wasn't it? Talking about uh, getting these restarts right. And look at that Alazari going out very, very wide indeed to square off the corner. And that was a very good restart from Keanu Alazari. Pulled the pin at the exact right moment. And he leads them away as we return to green flag conditions. We are racing once again in the Formula Winter Series. It's Alazari, your front at the front of the field. I understand uh, that everybody else is just about running okay. I'm just getting some bulletins from pit lane as well. Uh, lots going on here around the paddock as the FWS cars uh, get started. I do understand that Finn Harrison did have tyres changed on his car, so I think, again, his tyre was going down, which may have caused him to go straight on in the manner he did going into turn 16. Nonetheless, MP Motorsports' Keanu Alazari is our race leader. You've got James Agosi there uh, just ahead now of Kabir Anarag, so he's made up a position there by the looks of it. And now Anarag under pressure uh, from Mikel Pedersen. Uh, this is for seventh position. Of course, Pedersen showed uh, his prowess in getting through the field uh, earlier on in the season at the season opener in Jerez. He didn't really have any particularly great qualifyings, but he would always be on the overtaking uh, train when it came to the race day itself. Uh, it was very good value for money to watch. Look at the understeer there for Jack Beaton in second place. A lot of the drivers really struggling with understeer uh, through turn 13. Griffin Peebles up the inside of Gianmarco Pradell. Pradell doesn't keep the nose in at turn 15. Quite wise, astute driving there from the young Aussie as Griffin Peebles moves up then. Uh, back past Pradell. Pradell was behind him at one point uh, earlier in the lap, but nonetheless, uh, we have side-by-side -side action as Pedersen now tries to get past uh, the 19 of Anarag. It looks like he's done so, but there's been contact. And is that Andres Cardenas? Yes, it is. Cardenas has been collected, I think, by one coater by the looks of it. Or is that James Agosi? I can't quite see the number. From there, we've got a car spinning as well. Nathaniel Berebi in a spin. But once again, the hairpin at turn 16. 
catches out our drivers and I suspect we'll see a safety car momentarily. Meanwhile, one of the Yenza cars trying to make up positions while they can. That's Adam Hideg trying to work his way through and it was friendly fire. It was Campos on Campos. James Agosi was the driver that made contact with the number 18, Andres Cardenas, both of our championship protagonists from the first two rounds are really having it hard and rough here at Motorland Aragon. The safety car, unsurprisingly, is out for a second time. Well, 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 that, uh, that tailwind is the story of the day, isn't it, here at Motorland. And Keanu Alazari. Our race leader, once again, takes a breath and uh, resumes leading the field at a reduced pace. I understand that uh, there was a broken front wing, unfortunately, for Ella Lloyd as well. So Ella was starting to work her way back through the order um, after starting from the pit lane, but she has had a second broken wing of the last half hour or so. She apparently we we understand she had a moment uh, with another driver on the installation lap spinning in front of her she now heads back out onto the circuit also into the pits but i understand into the pits definitively is andres cardenas uh, lucas gajewski reporting to me that the car is pitted and retired into the garage so andres cardenas are uh, one of our two drivers who came in with the championship lead on 108 points is once again not going to score. So once again, despite a, a difficult qualifying for Griffin Peebles, um, things are falling ever so slightly in his favour. I tell you what, if Keanu Alazari keeps scoring pole positions and race wins, as he has done to this point... It's not impossible that he's going to be a mathematical contender for the championship despite missing the first two rounds. Um, the misfortunes are such right now uh, for, for Cardenas and Peebles that it's quite possible. And even the driver that was third uh, in the points, discounting Matias Ferreira, who's not present... Uh, Machai Gwadish, of course, he was also a non-scorer yesterday, and he currently sits just 10th in this race. So, Keanu Alasari is going to be in not a bad position in the championship if things continue uh, in this manner. Alasari, your race leader from Jack Beaton, from Thomas Strauven, your top three. Strauven uh, capitalising there on the, uh, on the misfortunes down at uh, down at Campos and he is up to third place how he would love not just a rookie win he's currently the first of the rookie class cars overall in third place uh, ahead of Kabir Anarag in sixth the next of the rookie drivers but of course an overall podium would be extremely sweet nectar uh, for the young road in motorsport driver Strauven who uh, is making his first steps into junior single-seater racing with us. Hence, of course, the entry into the rookie class. He uh, was a runner-up in the WSK Supermaster Series uh, in the OK class last year. Uh, is set to continue his relationship with Roden into the Formula 4 Spain summer season as well. A young 15-year-old Belgian competitor really nice young man who uh, didn't quite have I think representative pace at times at uh, Jerez and Valencia and of course Rodin are coming off quite the high it must be said uh, elsewhere uh, two wins for Rodin Motorsport uh, at uh, at the Formula 2 race in Bahrain. So Zayn Maloney scoring two wins for Rodin in, in uh, Formula 2. Uh, they'd love to move into the Sunday this weekend with a podium, if not more, uh, from Thomas Strauven. Meanwhile, I understand that we are going green again. You see the safety car lights are out. I also understand from Izzy Browning that... Uh, there are reports of some oil, or at least some sort of fluid, potentially oil, uh, one would suggest maybe from Andres Cardenas, 
uh, and his car limping back home uh, to contend with in the last couple of corners of the lap. So they have to watch out for that as well. As they return to racing conditions, Alazari did a brilliant job of uh, getting the restart right last time. Let's see if he makes it two from two on getting the restart right. I suspect that in a lap's time, we're going to have to take a wide, lang a wide angle, hope and pray here at turn 16 and see if everyone gets through. Uh, let's hope we have a clean couple of laps then as Keanu Alazari uh, gets this one back underway. Alazari, your race leader, but this time Jack Beaton is a lot closer to the back of him as they run down to the first corner. Beaton to the outside line, making a bid for the lead here. He goes all the way around the outside and he does lead. Jack Beaton takes the race lead then for us racing. Alazari did not quite get the same calibre of restart this time. And now Thomas Strauven wants to capitalise as well. Some side by side further back in the pack also. But it is Jack Beaton that leads in FWS for the first time. The newcomer to the US Racing lineup for this weekend, replacing, of course. Matthias Ferreira, Beaton, the 16-year-old racer who raced extensively across the UAE, Italian, Euro 4, etc., etc., etc. Uh, in 2023, how he would love uh, to secure a victory here in the uh, Formula Winter Series uh, at the start of this day. He sounded very laser-focused in the pre-race interview earlier on. Thomas Strauven, meanwhile, will be focused on the opportunity at hand as once again everybody uh, struggles to stop the car at T12. Oh, and uh, Griffin Peebles getting into it there with one of the Monlau cars. That would have been Lynn Hedenius uh, that he was scrapping with further back in the pack for 15th position as crams Flavio Olivieri there uh, being rather blocked by Machai Guadish in the battle for ninth place. And Olivieri now losing out and Strauven trying any which way he can to claim second position. Now let's brace and hope that everyone's okay this time through turn 16 again the tailwind is going to play its games Gwadish there I think going deep into the corner several other drivers also uh, getting it uh, finding it hard to get it stopped and we got one in a spin is that Juan Cota in a spin in the number four car yes it is Juan Cota has had a moment in the drive x number four car so he comes from the top five to the very back of the order Meanwhile, everybody else streaming through. We've got a front wing off one of the cars as well. Uh, goodness me, the drama does not stop this weekend. Keanu Alazari under pressure then from Strauven, as we see there. Debris on track at turn 16 is the bulletin on the board as there's a big lockup into turn five. Hopefully everybody avoided each other there, didn't quite catch who that was. We've got some Yenza on Yenza. In fact, no Yenza on us racing as Gianmarco Pradell tries to get around Adam Hedeg. That's for ninth position. Hedeg and Pradell now running in the top 10. Maxime Ream trying to dive to the inside of a couple of the others there and getting a bit reckless there, trying to get past Gianmarco Pradell. Us racing on us racing. Uh, side by side for 10th place then as they now run through 11 into turn 12. Let's see who emerges in 10th place uh, ahead as they uh, come through. Dower De Decker up into 8th place now and he locks up in a big way. Oh, and Gianmarco Bradell goes straight on. We've got a spinner further back as well. Don't quite know who that is. Pradell trying to get back onto the circuit. Bianca Bustamante. Oh, that was a scary rejoin there, but she's managed to keep her car out of everyone else's way. Bustamante going straight on then. These conditions are incredibly difficult for our drivers, as we can well see. Enzo Tarnvinichkel in the Red Bull livery there. He's alongside the other uh, car from Cram. That's uh, Filippo Fiorentino. And uh, they approach the danger zone of turn 16 once again. And uh, Rene Lammers there going deep into the corner. One of the other MP cars also struggling to stop. That may have been Bazinalos. loss. Oh, and... Uh, I think one of the Drivex cars there going straight on, collecting the other MP machine. 
That might well have been Macedo involved in that one. Three wide into the first corner. Griffin Peebles around the outside there. And Macedo has ended up into the side of Lucas Flusher. As a matter of fact, Flusher in the 21 car is the MP Motorsport machine involved in that one. And once again, you'll be unsurprised to hear the safety car has come out. So we're not lacking for Volkswagen Polo mileage this morning. We get a replay of this one then. Lucas Flusche goes straight on here it's, uh, with a broken front wing as well. No front wing on Flusche by the looks of it by that point. And then you just see it through shot there. Very well picked up by our director there. We did just see Macedo um, very, very, very quickly going through shot. And uh, unfortunately managed to find uh, Lucas Flusche in the runoff area at turn 16. This race has been a very dramatic one indeed. And Jack Beaton is now your race leader. Uh, Gianmarco Pradell came into the pit lane with a puncture. It did look like that uh, car was running slightly odd. It uh, looked like a tyre might have been down after... Uh, after he went straight on at 12, and uh, you see the discussions there between Flusha and Macedo, and I think Flusha is well aware of just how difficult it is. Of course, he made a smaller version of the exact same error uh, down at 16. And uh, understandably, I think uh, Flusha having quite a civilized discussion with Macedo, saying, no, I know, very difficult. So I, I was on a track walk on Wednesday and bumped into Lucas Flusha, who was in about 17 layers of clothing uh, after the uh, after the cold hit as the sun came down and uh, was walking along with his older brother Lorenzo as well and unfortunately it is not the weekend that he would have wanted well the race is neutralized once again then. And uh, Jack Beaton is your race leader. Uh, turns 16. Actually, I'll, I'll broaden this. Motorland Aragon in general is rather like a pineapple. It's a very sweet circuit, but it also has thorns uh, that you can quite easily catch yourself on. And particularly in these weather conditions, Turn 12, turn 16, with the wind pushing them into the corner, seems to be the obstacle of the day. The thorn of the pineapple. Jack Beaton with 8 minutes and 48 seconds left to go. We'll be hoping for a good safety car restart. We haven't had the safety car confirmed in this lap just yet. We'll have to see quite how progress is going down at uh, down at turn 16 in fact I suspect it might be quite a long safety car period because I can tell you that from my commentary box window I see a uh, snatch vehicle uh, recovery crane heading down to turn 16 from the main straight uh, so that is more than likely going to be at least one more lap under safety car then your order then at this juncture of the race is Jack Beaton in the lead, Keanu Alizari in second place, Thomas Strauven looking very racy uh, in third position for Rodin Motorsport. Mikkel Pedersen in fourth place, Kabir Anarag in fifth position, Akshay Bora in sixth, Flavio Olivieri in P7, Dawi De Decker in eighth, Adam Hideg for Yenza Motorsport. I think that's the first time we've seen a Yenza car uh, in the top 10 this season, which is a, a reflection of the depth of talent and depth of uh, cars in the grid this year. Uh, 10th place for Lynn Hedinius in the Monlau Motorsport machine. Uh, 11th place for Maxime Reem, Arthur Derizon in 12th place. 13th for Matrai Guadish. Ernesto Rivera in P14. He's made some good progress. Enya Fry in 15th position.
Griffin Peebles in 16th, Fiorentino P17. Enzo Tarnvanichkel has been picking his way through the field rather magnificently, actually. I think largely just by <laughs> making his way through turn 16 without issue. Uh, he is up to P18, having started uh, 34th on the grid. Rene Lammers and Preston Lambert rounding out the overall top 20. The first of your female drivers in the order is uh, Bianca Bustamante in 23rd position. As you see there, the nose of James Agosi. That is uh, a very, very much warped piece of carbon fibre uh, on that car on the flatbed. Uh, but Bianca Bustamante, the first of the female drivers for DRS in 23rd overall. Uh, Ella Lloyd, once again, after not once but twice having to get a new nose on the car uh, this morning, is up into 26th position. So she could be challenging Bianca for the uh, right to take the women's trophy uh, at the end of this race. And Leah Block is just behind her as well in 27th. So that could be uh, an interesting little sub battle as well. But 32 cars are left standing. And to be honest, with the amount of drama that we've seen across this race distance, I'm almost a little bit surprised that it's as many as 32 because uh, we have seen a lot going on over the course of this race distance. The incident between cars 22 and 4 will be investigated at the end of the race safety car procedure is the uh, bulletin on my screen right now now nathaniel berabi is the 22 in the maffey racing car he's 29th overall and Juan kota uh, is 30th so those two are at least were uh line astern in the safety car queue and it sounds as if they, they may have found each other uh, in more ways than one uh, in that safety car queue. So let's hope that uh, neither car is damaged and they can both continue. Neither of them went into the pits last time. One car that will go into the pits is the safety car with four minutes and 50 minutes left to go. We are once again going to return to Creed Flag Racing. It's the long agonizing wait as they try and get some tire temperature once again down the main straight. Jack Beaton it's now his turn to manage a safety car restart for Keanu Alizari. It's now his turn to try and go on the offensive. And, of course, Thomas Strauven wants to be the wild card in this one. What about Mikael Pedersen as well? I've talked a lot about how impressed I've been by some of his overtaking, some of his racecraft. And he's up there in fourth position. So he's certainly in contention for a podium. Beaton waits a little bit longer than Alazari did to launch the car. But he does now do so. And he's got himself a car length. That is critical for Beaton as he runs towards the first corner. Alazari has Thomas Strauven on his gearbox as they run down to turn one. Strauven on the inside. Will it be Strauven for second place for Rodin Motorsport? No, not quite. As uh, the field fans out down the main straight. So moving and shaking further back, but it's Jack Beaton that leads the way. Oh, and Rene Lammers getting into it there with uh, Fiorentino. Cram versus MP Motorsport. Uh, thankfully, both cars seem to have uh, just bounced and continued on their way there. Alexander Savinkov getting hung out to dry at the very back of the field uh, by Nathaniel Berebi. Meanwhile, at the very front of the pack, it's Jack Beaton. That once again leads the way. Keanu Alazari has slightly dropped Thomas Strauven. Strauven, of course, with a shallow entry into turn one, will have cost himself a few car lengths as a result of uh, not having the best run through the corner. But the top five all pretty much in sync. The top ten all pretty much in one queue. In reality, the two Yenza cars side by side there as uh, 24 and 25 fight it out. Adam Hedeg, I think, has lost a position or two on this lap by the looks of it in the 24. The Yenza car may well have fallen out of the top 10, as a matter of fact. We'll confirm that next time they're across the line. In fact, no, he's still there behind Dawid Adeka, so he is uh, in uh, ninth position. In fact, the two Yenza cars dueling are a little bit further back in the order. And a couple of cars again running wide there uh, through turn 12. That's the precursor, if you will, as one of the uh, Yenza cars goes bouncing off into the gravel there in the back of shot. I think that was Arthur de Rizon into the gravel, but continues on his way. However, he will have lost some positions. Now, everybody take a breath. 
hopefully break early. Oh, no, Flavio Olivieri goes straight on there. Dower de Decker then inheriting seventh place. Enzo Tarnvanichkel with a lockup as well as he tries to stave off about five cars all at once. A few drivers are now just coasting into the corner, probably quite white, rightly, just to uh, make sure they get the apex of the turn. Uh, so Maxime Ream up the inside there uh, of one of the cram cars. That's Ream getting past uh, Flavio Olivieri for 10th position. So Maxime Ream gets another us racing car into the top 10 with that manoeuvre. It's beaten from Alazari, from Strauven, from Pedersen, Anarag and Bora, your top six. Half of the top six is us racing cars. Adam Hedeg in the first of the Jens is in seventh. De Decker in eighth. Adenius and Reem, now your top ten. Jack Beaton definitely feels like he's under threat. He is defending as they head through the corkscrew there, as we saw. Will Alazari be able to try and reclaim that lead that he held early on in the day from pole position? Uh, we have just on 50 seconds left to go. I'm uncertain whether this will be the penultimate lap or not. It's going to be quite close as to whether we hit zero before or after they cross the line. I think we might just get a, another two laps in. We'll have to uh, wait and see. Keanu Alazari gets a better run by the looks of it out of turn 15. He's firmly in the slip as they run down towards the hairpin at 16. Keanu Alazari, will he be off at the inside? Almost certainly not. So he goes to the outside line. Strauven follows suit as well. Beaten with the inside, with the high ground, if you will. Alazari deeper into the corner, but Beaten locks up, and that parts the seas for Thomas Strauven. Thomas Strauven gets to the lead of the race. Strauven for Rodin will emerge from the crest of the hill as your race leader. And we go on to the final lap of the race, and it is Thomas Strauven that leads the way. Second place for Mikkel Pedersen, is that? No, it's Jack Beaton in second place. Around the outside of him, though, comes Keanu Alazari side by side as they come through turn three. Alazari will have the inside line for four and five, but he doesn't even need to do it there. He gets up into second position. Mikkel Pedersen wants a podium out of this as well. Uh, Kabir Anarag Akshay Bora in the hunt as well, as it all is now kicking off in the lead for Thomas Strauven. He is just half a lap away from a first podium of the year and he's on the step that everybody wants as long as things finish as they are. Pedersen goes defensive up against Kabir Anarag there. They come through the corkscrew. Our field have given us some spectacular racing in the last several minutes. We've started to figure out how to manage the situation at turn 12 and turn 16. We're coming towards the final sector for the final time, and it must be said, Keanu Alazari is certainly pressuring Thomas Strauven. If he gets a good run through 14 and 15, Strauven may not yet be home free, but he sets himself up nicely there for a good run out of 15. Can Strauven hold on? He's certainly going to have to defend hard here against Keanu Alazari. He's trying everything he can to break the slip. There's also a good battle going on between Anarag and Bora there in fifth position. The two us racing cars jostling, but will it be Strauven that leads them into the final couple of corners? Alazari with a massive dive. Does he get the car stopped? No. Thomas Strauven with brilliant racing there. Let Keanu have the inside. Let him go deep into the corner. And it will be Thomas Strauven for Rodin Motorsport that takes the win in the Formula Winter Series. Strauven has done it. Alazari takes second, Jack Beaton rounding out our podium, but it's a new team and a new driver on the top step as Thomas Strauven takes it, Mikkel Pedersen for fourth place, Kabir Anarag rounding out your top five in that one, Machai Gwadish rewarding the MP Motorsport team with a point there in 10th position. Of course, both of our championship protagonists not scoring in this race. Griffin Peebles in 14th. Andres Cardenas already out of the car. 
So again, the two drivers that have been the stars of Formula Wind Series in rounds one and two, having no fortune at all in the third weekend of the year, adding more complexity and more parties to the championship battle. Uh, this is going to be a very compelling next four races. Race three here at Aragon, the three races at Barcelona. The season is shaping up very, very nicely. And for Thomas Strauven, he does indeed add to the victory tally this weekend for Road in Motorsport after a pair of wins for Zayn Maloney in Formula 2. Strauven will be elated with his result. Really, really lovely young man who is very measured when you speak to him. And uh, I know there was some disappointment from himself as to how the first couple of weekends went, but the progress is plain to see now. And I'm sure he is going to be a very, very happy young man when he uh, gets out of the car, when he speaks to Izzy Browning in the next few moments. It is three different teams in the top three as well with Rodin Motorsports, Thomas Strauven, MP Motorsports, Keanu Alazari, and Us Racing's Jack Beaton. Of course, it's four from four as well with Mikael Pedersen of DriveX uh, also uh, involved there, finishing in fourth position, one shy of a podium. Thomas Strauven then is the first rookie to win a race overall as well in the FWS this year. Delight for Strauven. <laughs> as uh, hugs and congratulations are offered across the board. And uh, Jack Beaton signalling there in the background to his Us Racing crew as well. I think there are a few happy chappies down under the podium at the moment as uh, the debrief begins with Rodin Motorsport. Thomas Strauven then is our race winner and uh, after 13 fraught laps, Many a safety car restart and dramas galore. Uh, I think it's safe to say that it's a well-earned victory, don't you? Uh, great result for Thomas Strauven. Just seven tenths in it between the top three at the end of that race. The first of the uh, female drivers home ultimately was once again Ella Lloyd. She managed to get herself up to 20 seconds. So two victories in the race for uh, road in motorsport in fact scratch that three because Strauven has taken both the overall and the rookie class win and Ella Lloyd is the first of the female drivers home in 22nd now Bianca Bustamante must have had an issue towards the end of the race because she was running a little higher up the order and she ultimately finished 32nd so there must have been a drama of some description for Bustamante towards the end of the race. She'll be looking to rally and regroup then going into uh, race number three for our F1 Academy grads. It will be their last FWS appearance of the year. Let's go to a first time FWS winner though. Thomas Strauven is in the pits. Hi everyone, I'm down here with our race two winner, Thomas Strauven. Thomas. Absolutely fantastic race. You must be so pleased with that. Yeah, I've been working a lot for this because uh, we started in Jerez with a quite OK race and in Valencia we had a shocker. But now really brought the point and uh, yeah, I got into the lead and, and they, they told me it was last lap. I was like, this needs to be it. And I got done the lot. He actually overtook me in the last corner and I did the switch back and I won. So yeah. I'm very thankful to the team Roda Motorsport, my uh, parents and my sponsors for everything, so yeah. I was actually in the Rodin garage when you, uh, when you made that move, so the team were just absolutely elated for you. You must be so, so proud and so happy to bring that for the team. Yeah, I think that they were really happy on the radio as well, so yeah. As a rookie driver, only my third race, it's uh, really good to, um, or third weekend, to be on the top spot, stop step. And what does that do to your confidence going forward? Because we've got another race, so surely you'll be ready to make some more moves later. 
Yeah, I, I saw a little bit further back, P13, but well, that doesn't stop us for going back, uh, forwards. Congratulations. Go enjoy it. Go to the podium. Thank you. <laughs> As our race one, race two winner. Start to get around the outside of the 87 and swoop into the lead. Some contact further back as Juan Cota got tagged into a spin. And uh, Maxime Ream bouncing across the curbs to get past Gianmarco Pradell. Also, Pradell then went straight on. He would have a puncture as uh, we continue to have dramas. Bianca Bustamante bouncing across the uh, gravel to avoid Alexander Savinkov. Uh, down towards turn 16 again. We had one of the MP cars go wide. Two of them as Lucas Flusher went wide. Macedo comes across shot at full speed. He's in a spin and he collects Lucas Flusher. Safety car once again. Jack Beaton to the lead then. Thomas Strauven by this time was up into third position, of course, inheriting the place from Andres Cardenas. And soon he would get his opportunity to move further up the order as Rene Lammers and uh, Olivieri got into it together. This was the moment then where we had Olivieri uh, lose some time. He locked up as they uh, ran together further back. Maxime Ream got himself up into the top 10 by passing the Crown Mode Sport car. Thomas Strauven managed to get past the two uh, cars in one fell swoop there as uh, Beaton and Alizari kind of held each other up. Alizari had one last attempt to get back past Strauven though, but he managed to take the win, hold the lead and secure victory in a uh, very good fashion there. Expert driving towards the end of the race from Thomas Strauven. He seemed to get his head around it more so than anybody else out there. A deserved, justified victory for Thomas Strauven and for Rodin Motorsport. Delight for the team, even if not everyone gets a hug. Lukas Gajewski, down to the podium with you. What a frantic race and what a frantic end to the race in Formula Winter Series on Sunday morning. Welcome everybody once again from the podium. Let me clear the balcony and call our winning drivers after race number two onto the stage. And we start today as we did yesterday with the podium for our best female racer in race number two. Congratulations for Road in Motorsport. It's Ella Lloyds. Ella climbing the uh, highest step of the podium for the second time this weekend as Jakub Prasek from our tire partner Hankook presents the uh, trophy to our winning female driver on Sunday morning here in Motorland Aragon. Big smiles please and a big round of applause for Ella Lloyds. And of course it's been Ella's first outing so uh, let's grab a quick word Ella. Please go back on the highest podium. This is yours. Ella, how did you enjoy your time in the Formula Winter Series so far this weekend? Yeah, obviously my first weekend in F4 and it's been going pretty good. Can't thank the team enough. They've done a great job this weekend. One more race, of course, coming up later on this afternoon. What are your expectations? It's always difficult to judge, isn't it? Yeah, it's obviously difficult with like safety cars and that, but we've just got to keep pushing forward. It's just a year to learn and yeah, keep moving forward. Ella, thank you very much and best of luck for the rest of the uh, weekend. So this is Ella Lloyd, your best female racer in Formula Winter Series race number two of this weekend. Coming up next is the rookie podium, top three, coming onto the stage. And please welcome in third place of the podium for Jensa Motorsport, Adam Hideg. In second place, for us racing, Kabi Anurag. And your rookie winner, although this is not going to be the biggest one today for him, from Rodin Motorsport, Thomas Strauben. Well done to our three winning rookie drivers as we welcome Andres Mendres from the Spanish Formula 4 organization, Robin Silbach from Gatelich Racing and Jakob Prasek from our tire partner Hankook to present the trophies to our three rookie drivers. First podium in rookie class for Adam Hideg, second one for Kabi Anorak and your winner is Thomas Strauben. This is your rookie podium. And, of course, we are very good in time, so uh, we can speak to our top three 
rookie finishers upstairs. Uh, we need to have a word, of course, with Adam for the first time on the podium in rookie class. How does it feel, Adam? How was your race? Yeah, it was a nice race. We started, I think, 19th, 18th. So, yeah, the start was not the greatest, but then after it was, our speed was very nice, and then we could pick up some places. And yeah, at the end, we finished, I think, seventh overall, third in the rookies. So, yeah. It was uh, good to be here in the rookie podium and next race next weekend we go for the overall podium. Absolutely, there is one more race to go this afternoon. Adam, thank you very much. Uh, Kabe Anurak, your second trip to the podium in rookies this season. Tell us about your race. Uh, yeah, we started P4, off the line we stayed P4. Mistake on my side, dropped me down to six. Um, managed to finish fifth, I think it was a good race overall. Just one mistake cost me uh, the position to Thomas and uh, what followed was uh, still a good race but could have been better. Kabi, thank you very much. And of course, uh, good luck for the uh, remaining race later on. Thomas has already been interviewed downstairs, of course, by Izzy Browning. So uh, thank you very much to our rookie drivers clearing the stage for the overall race podium here in Motorland, Aragon. And we start with the best team, the winning team in race number two. Congratulations to Jamie French and Rodin Motorsports. In second place, his second podium of the weekend for us racing, Jack Beaton. In second place for MP Motorsport, it's Keanu Alazari. And your winner with his first victory in Formula Winter Series for Rodin Motorsport, Thomas Straubin. Thomas Straubin, congratulations. So let's listen to the Belgium national anthem for the winning driver. Well done and big round of applause to your winning driver Thomas Straubin with his first victory in Formula Winter Series. As we present the uh, trophies, we've got Robin Seelbach and Stefan Lehner from the Gatlich Racing Organization, Andres Mendres from Spanish Formula 4 and of course Jakub Prasek from tire partner Hankook. Once again, well done, big round of applause as we gather our winners and of course Jamie French from Rodin Motorsport on the podium just as well and uh, this is your final podium picture after race number two at least one more competition coming up i'm just going to wait for a couple of seconds and then of course uh, we need to have a bit of a word with our drivers because this was absolutely fabulous to watch uh, jack hang on hang on a second uh, that was very very exciting to watch what you did out there how did you like it yeah, it was fun until the last lap, really, for me. Um, obviously, I got the lead on the safety car restart and then, uh, yeah, made a mistake in the end and lost it and went back to P3. And I was lucky even to keep the P3. So, yeah, interesting race, fun until then. But, yeah, it was still, uh, still a good result. One more to go. One more. Let's go. Thank you very much, Zach. And I think everybody else has disappeared. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid so. So that's it in terms of interviews after Formula Winter Series race number two here in Aragon. One more race coming up later on this afternoon. However, it's GT4's next. Always very exciting. They've been out yesterday for their first race of the weekend. Second competition is coming up with some new drivers, of course, being squeezed into the cockpits until they uh, will share their driving duties later on in the endurance race this afternoon. So coming up next, second race for GT4 Winter Series live from Motorland Aragon.
I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Javi being very efficient there uh, with uh, getting the podium ready for the next race. What a uh, race that was then in FWS. We now switch focus to the GT4 Winter Series where we have potentially a situation where I think this weekend, if things continue onwards, Porter and Day could be champions by the end of the weekend if things go brilliantly for them and poorly for others. Let's go down, though, to Izzy Browning, who has GT4 cars arriving behind her. Welcome back down to the grid. We're here for the GT4's first race of the day. And as Adam said, the big question is, can the Forsetti boys make it two for two? They start on the second position today as opposed to yesterday. But Jamie Day managed to make it a win, so can Mikey Porter do the same? We are going to try and talk to Mikey, but he's just being spoken to by Matt George right now. Um, so I'm going to come across to the number 11 Schnitzlam racing. This should be Mar Marcel Marshevitz in the car today. Obviously, Joel Mesh had that battle yesterday with the McLaren. Um, so I'm going to dive in and see if we can have a chat. Marcel, how are we feeling for today's race? Uh, very good. So uh, I'm very confident after the qualifying. Uh, I like the track a lot. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the race. And you've got the best position to start from. So how are we going to keep the four Setti boys behind you? Yeah, just have a good start and then uh, yeah, just stay on P1, I think. Best of luck for the race. Thank you. Right. I'm going to see if I can pop across and grab a word with Mikey Porter, but he might just be still having a chat. It looks like they are having a chat. So I'll grab Jamie instead. Jamie, you had a win yesterday. I'll see we spoke to you already. Uh, Adam said in commentary, it's possible you guys could be champions by the end of the weekend. So how do we feel about that? Yeah, we're just taking it one race at a time at the moment. Obviously, just trying to get the good result first off and then the points come later. So uh, again, this morning, just hopefully Mikey has a nice clean race and then we see where we come out at the end of it. And you had good learning yesterday. So is there any tips you were giving him yesterday on the track and uh, how to keep the others behind? Yeah, definitely. There was a few things to give to him and hopefully he's just taking it on board. And I think we should have a nice, easy race and see if we can get into the lead early doors. Perfect. Well, we'll see if he can do the same. We're going to continue down the grid as Mikey's still being spoken to. So we've got the number 78 McLaren car behind. Now, they were the ones that were having that really, really tough battle with Joel Mesh. I said yesterday, if you were watching our coverage, that Joel Mesh was, uh, he was struggling a little bit with his back as he got out of the car. So uh, we'll see if Marcel can do do any better. And hopefully Joel's OK for the, for the race uh, this afternoon. But yeah, expect the McLarens to be up their back. Battling. Um, we've seen that the two on the front row have pace and so does this McLaren. So we are definitely going to be seeing some great battling. The GT4s never, ever disappoints us. And then finally, just coming over to the number 84, we've got a new entry. This is Alex Connor. They are the new entry this weekend. Um, and I, can we dive in and grab a word with Alex? Just quickly, just quickly, one quick question. First race of the day, how are we feeling? Feeling pretty good. Um, I think pace was there yesterday in the long run, so hopefully we can uh, do something today. Awesome, best of luck, have a good race. All right, we're just about to get the one minute board, so we will hand back up to Adam, but this is gonna be a great race, so don't go anywhere, make sure you're tuning in. Oh yes, the GT4 Winter Series is always where some of the best racing of the weekend comes from, and we expect nothing different this time. Mikey Porter, Marcel Marshevix there on the front row of the grid, as Izzy just said. Uh, we've got some uh, really wonderful machinery, as always, on the grid this weekend. Some teams that uh, are, well, new, some updated driver lineups uh, to contend with as well. A few unknown commodities as it were some drivers we expect to be uh, disruptors if you will one of them could be this man alex papadopoulos from sixth on the grid in the nm racing team's pro-am entry this is the same car that has been the am class number 15 uh, over the course of the rest of the season alberto di martin couldn't make it here this weekend so it's been converted to a pro-am entry and alex papadopoulos the pro 
of the Pro-Am class. He starts from sixth position. Uh, you have uh, Ivan Ekelschik there as well in fifth place. I'd also keep an eye on Daniel Drexel in ninth position. We have him uh, with an onboard as well. He's just behind Tim Neuser on the grid. The Razoon more than racing Porsche. I expect Drexel to uh, maybe come on a little bit stronger in this one. The 15 second board has been shown and the cars will soon roll on their formation lap. As I alluded to, it is mathematically possible that a GT4 win series title is provisionally secured this year in favour uh, of the second place car, Mikey Porter alongside Jamie Day, but it will rely on uh, misfortune for Schnitzlaum Racing's Joel Mesh. Uh, it's possible, though, that we do have a champion before the end of the day. Schnitzlaum Racing's Marcel Marshevix will be holding the hopes for Joel Mesh in this race. Look at that gap from qualifying. Two thousandths of a second separated Marcel Marshevix and Mikey Porter, who gets better every weekend. Zach Meekin in third place alongside Alex Connor on row two. The debuting second CV performance car in the hands of Alex Connor. Ivan Nikolchik in fifth place, the first of the Pro-Am en Pro entries alongside Alex Papadopoulos. Row four of the grid is Emil Yerdrum in the number 85 Pro-Am CV Performance Mercedes. Tim Neuser is eighth, the first of the Cayman Trophy cars. Daniel Drexel will line up from ninth place alongside Max Huber, while Enrico Ferdera and Jan Nicholas Somershoff are forming row six. Richard Wolf didn't take the start yesterday. Hopefully he's with us this time. Christian Kuhn rounds out the back of the order. just have a look at this shot for a bit longer we might see whether the bmw is there or not actually i didn't mean to keep an eye out on that and i unfortunately wasn't smart enough to do so we do have the bmw there so yes richard wolf will take the start in the resume more than racing bmw so that's great news we've got our full quota of 14 cars for this race Mikey Porter and Marcel Marshevix on the front row. Marshevix as the pole sitter in a rolling start situation. Our first rolling start of the day. He therefore has the inside going into turn one. We'll see whether he can convert that into an early lead. We've seen in the formula categories that uh, it's possible to make a move around the outside at turn one. So that's what Mikey Porter is going to hope to emulate. Uh, of course, we saw Zach Meekin uh, do the same. In fact, Tom Lebon do the same for Elite Motorsport in Valencia in the GTs. Of course, the other question mark is the effect that the uh, tailwind will have on the GT cars. Obviously, the Formula cars are a deal lighter. Uh, the wind is maybe a bit more of a pronounced effect on the Formula cars. Uh, but we've seen already that 12 and 16 seem to be incredibly difficult to get right in this weekend's conditions. So all remains to be seen. All questions remain to be answered. And we will now go into two by two formation for this 30 minute race. Unlike the previous two races, there is no plus one lap. It's a straight 30 minute race. Once the clock hits zero, we are on the final lap. And it's Marcel Marshevix who will start the first lap in the lead but for how long he's got great competition around him not just from mikey porter but also from that second row of the grid as well let's see who is going to be the pace setter in the early going as we go racing for 30 minutes in at the gt4 winter series marcel marshevix leads it into the first corner it is going to be Mikey Porter settling for second by the looks of it. Max Huber out a little bit wide through turn one. Richard Wolf picking up a couple of places already in the BMW in the back of the pack in the AM category. Good start from everybody. We are clean through the first couple of corners then as we go into this 30-minute race. Yesterday, that elite McLaren of Zach Meekin in the hands of Tom Levin yesterday, it looked very strong versus the two front-engine cars ahead. So let's see how Meekin handles this circuit. He loves Portimao. He says Portimao is his favourite circuit. Therefore, I expect him to enjoy Motorland Aragon as well. It's not quite the same character of circuit, but it is similar to my eye. There's a, 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 a whiff of Portimao about Motorland Aragon. Of course, both circuits of roughly the same vintage. Both circuits considered some of the modern classics of uh, modern-day racetracks. 
Here comes our field then towards turn 12. It is Marcel Martovic that leads the way. Porter in second, Meekin in third. Of course, Meekin's car cuts a much smaller hole through the air uh, than the two uh, front engine cars ahead of him. Uh, that does mean that in order to make sure it isn't massively faster at the end of the straight, the uh, power, the torque is a little bit lower uh, on the McLaren. So that does mean coming out of the turns, it's sometimes a little bit uh, hampered as we see side-by-side -side action between Papadopoulos and Yerdrum uh, among the Pro-Am class. Daniel Drexel is our camera operator as we watch this battle. Then and Porter gets caught out. Porter goes wide at turn 16 and falls back as far as third place. Zach Meekin gets up to P2. So there's our question answered as to whether the tailwind would maybe affect some of the GTs. The answer is yes. It's still side by side in the back of shot there between Papadopoulos, or rather Yerdrum uh, and Papadopoulos. Drexel getting involved now though to the inside for the Pro-Am lead. Oh, everybody just about finds their way through. Side by side for second in class then as Papadopoulos uh, staves off the advances of Daniel Drexel. I do apologise, Drexel is a pro-class car. Our leader in Pro-Am uh, is Ivan Ekelchik. Ekelchik in fifth place overall in the Vimavert Motorsport Porsche leads Pro-Am. So the two Mercedes are fighting for second in Pro-Am. Drexel, a pro driver, uh, is uh, fighting to try and get past the Pro-Ams. I think uh, everybody in the Pro-Am cars in this race, with the exception of Somershoff at the back of the order, uh, is a pro driver. So we've got uh, all pros, as it were, uh, in Pro-Am this time. So it's a particularly strong grid as we uh, work our way through turn 10 once again. Look at how wide some of them are <laughs> coming through turn 10. Uh, what are track limits, Query? Marshevix, Meekin and Porter, your top three then. In fourth place is Alex Connor. Ivan Ekelchik looking to try and make some headway in the Porsche. Through turn 15 goes Alex Connor. Connor will be keeping an eye on Ekelchik behind. Because that uh, Porsche, again, slightly more slippery at the end of the straight. I expect it to maybe have a couple of kilometres of an hour extra over the Mercedes by the time they get to the apex. And Ekeldrick tried to get to the inside there, couldn't quite get it done. Of course, Alex Connor, with some experience of these uh, GTs, was previously a junior single seater star and has been trying to establish himself in prototypes and GTs more recently. Ivan Ekelchik, one of the leading lights in uh, GT4 European Series last year. So a good scrap between two promising young talents at the moment. Vim Avert Motorsport calls this young man their superstar. We got one driver there struggling, I think, at turn two. I think might have been Mikey Porter that kicked up a little bit of gravel there, but thankfully the car is still present. You can wash out at turn two if you're following someone closely into the gravel trap. And we saw, I think, the remnants of just that scenario from Mikey Porter there. It's three manufacturers and three teams in the top three once again then. Marshevix from Meekin from Porter. Zach Meekin and the Elite Motorsport crew have really rallied after struggling across the Portuguese elements of the uh, GT4 Wind Series calendar. They have looked strong in Jerez, in Valencia, and indeed here at Aragon. And could yet be fighting for second in the championship with... Uh, well, they are very much fighting for second in the championship with... Schnitzelown Racing's Joel Mesh. Of course, Marcel Marshevix wasn't present at Estoril uh, at the start of the year, which is why we don't speak of him as a championship contender because he, unfortunately, was a non-scorer in the first three races. Travel issues meant that he couldn't get to Estoril. Uh, he was meant to do the full season alongside Joel Mesh. Mikey Porter, of course, uh, last time out in Valencia, was doing double duty, sharing the number seven 
uh, with Matt George as well as racing in this number 19 car. Mikey has been uh, improving weekend on weekend. Of course, uh, his efforts in Valencia mean that his manager, James, now has a tattoo uh, with the word safe and Mikey Porter's signature. Um, I've heard that might not be the only tattoo-related um, bet, wager, however you want to put it, uh, in the Forsetti garage. I feel like someone else has to offer up their body at some point. It can't just be James. Mikey Porter very quick there through turn three, using all the runoff and a little bit more as he tries to get to the back of Zach Meekin. Porter, of course, made that error on the first lap, went deep into the corner, and is now trying to bounce back from that. Tim Noiser has gotten back past Daniel Drexel, as we see there on the picture and picture. So uh, the Cayman Trophy leader, Tim Noiser, up into eighth position. The top three down through the corkscrew section of the circuit, past the Mark Marquez statue that overlooks turn 10 and 11. Rather apropos that the uh, the motorcycle racer of the 2010s has his statue overlooking a corner where the, all the MotoGP bikes are sideways and exciting. Mikey Porter was a little bit deep there into turn 12. I'm glad he got that thing stopped. I thought for a horrible moment that he was going to go straight on there. Oh, he does go straight on into 14. Uh, hopefully gets a decent run out of turn 15, but uh, missed the apex at 14. Loses a car length or two ago. He will not be close enough to Zach Meekin's challenge into the hairpin. Alex Connor uh, now some seven seconds off the lead, so has lost a half dozen seconds uh, to Alex Connor. Connor is uh, going defensive once again on Ivan Ekelchik. Ekelchik, the pro am leader. He doesn't seem to worry too much about that. He wants some more overall positions as he tries to get around Alex Connor, but can't be done there at 16. Our top three come past in an unchanged position as the fourth place battle continues on. Ekelchik will be keeping one eye on the car ahead of him and the other on the other CV performance machine, which is, of course, the second-place car in Pro-Am. Papadopoulos, third in Pro-Am, following on as well. Highly, highly competitive Pro-Am class this weekend. Ekelchik and Wimmerwerk Motorsport, along with Jaeger Hishin, of course, uh, returning to the paddock this weekend for the first time since Portimao. Great to welcome them back into the fray here in the GT4 Winter Series. Great scrap here for fourth place overall. I get the feeling that Ekelchik has the speed advantage. It's just a matter of using it to uh, using it to make the position. I think his best shot is inevitably turn 16. The hairpin at the end of the long, long back straight. <laughs> Daniel Drexel there, uh, about 10 metres. <laughs> Well, exaggerating, one and a half metres, let's say, over the track limit. That was uh, pretty far away from the uh, far away from the racing line. There's a lot of tarmac runoff here at Motorland Aragon. Speaking to uh, Bianca Bustamante back in Jerez about what to expect to Aragon. She just laughed and said, yeah, track limits, they're an issue there. <laughs> and that applies to all classes for sure. Great, strong field then, fighting for fourth all the way back to tenth. Several battles in shot there as they came out of turn 15. Is Ekelchik close enough? I personally think he's maybe a car length too far back. And it seems as though he agrees, which is... Uh, Something of a relief. Enrico Ferderer has looked like looks like he's gotten past Daniel Drexel as well. So Enrico Ferderer is up into ninth place in the 110 car, or at least he was uh, at the timing beam in sector for the end of sector two, which is on the long back straight. If we look to the back of shot there, it does look as though uh, Enrico Ferderer has gotten past. So yes, Ferderer is past Daniel Drexel, and uh, he can now try and chase his team boss, as it were, or at least his team manager, Tim Noiser, to try and win Cayman Trophy. You ride on board there with Drexel as he follows Ferderer. He's got some work to do to close up on Tim Noiser. 
Meanwhile, this battle further back for second in the Mercedes, or second in Pro-Am, uh, the all-Mercedes battle uh, just behind this fight for fourth overall. Got lots of fights to choose from here as uh, Ekelchik and Connor go at it as Yerdra and Papadopoulos fight for second in Pro-Am. Uh, further back there, Yerdrum was very, very wide out of turn seven. And yet to see uh, any warnings pop up on screen for uh, you know what, track limits. Um, but we are uh, seeing a new camera angle by the looks of it here is a very good camera angle as well. Lovely stuff as uh, Emil Yerdrum. Uh, and Papadopoulos follow this battle for fourth place. There is Yerdrum. He's gone very, very wide by the looks of it at turn 12, and he's going to have to yield there to Papadopoulos. Yerdrum must have uh, got slightly wrong-footed there at turn 12, and he loses out to Papadopoulos. Let's see if he can fire back uh, to this new adversary. Papadopoulos, the uh, American racer, Race TCRs in Michelin Pilot Challenge has been forging his path in GT4s in Europe. Ivan Ekelchik forging his path to the outside at turn 16. Going deep, though, as does Connor. Both parties not quite getting that apex. Uh, Alex Connor, with the inside line, with the high ground, holds on to fourth position for the time being. But uh, something tells me that this battle is going to go on for the next 17 minutes unless Ekelchik can find a way through. I feel Ekelchik has the pace. He's just not got a Porsche's width to get past at any point. Tim Noiser is right on the back now of Yerdra and Papadopoulos as well. So the battle for sixth overall is now a three-way. Yerdra has got him back past Papadopoulos, as a matter of fact. So Emil Yerdra has snuck back through somewhere there. I have to assume turn 16. Very well done, young man. Uh, you were losing that position only momentarily. Papadopoulos and Noiser then in uh, seventh and eighth just behind him. I wonder if Yerdra went deep into the corner and that held both Mercedes up because Tim Noiser is uh, rather closed in on the two of them quicker than I was anticipating. There is Connor and Ekelchik going through the corkscrew for fourth and fifth position and Ekelchik just losing the rear a little bit there. Marshavix, Meekin and Porter, your top three as they run through 12 and 13. Tap of the brakes there from Marshavix. Zach Meekin puts the power down. A little bit of a squirm as he comes out of the corner. And now he's in the slip of Marshavix. I think he's closer than he has been for the last several laps. I don't think he's going to get quite close enough for a move into turn 16. But he is uh, certainly looking like the form driver out there at the moment. He was a couple of tenths quicker than Marcel Marshavix on the previous lap. Marshavix deep into 16 as well. Porter also deep into 16. Zach Meekin pretty much nailed that corner though. So it does look like Meekin has his head around the conditions right now, as challenging as they are. And as we approach half distance in this race, Meekin is certainly stating his intent in the rear view mirrors of the Schlitzlau Mercedes. Through turn two they go. And then turn three. Meekin keeping it a lot tidier there, keeping it rather more within the lines than Marshavix up ahead. It looks like Marshavix is fighting the car a bit more than Meekin. Meekin's car seems to be complying with his wishes. They might have found a little something extra then. In that number 78 McLaren, it's wearing one of the doors off the 27 we saw at Jerez, I know for a fact. <laughs> because the 27 car sits in the paddock sans door. <laughs> But they've done a good job of getting the car refreshed, ready and set up. Seems like the Artura is a strong package as they head into the summer racing season. And it's a package that could well help them in the battle for second in the championship as well as the battle for the race lead. This is the battle for second in the championship. And uh, 
as a matter of fact, if my maths are serving me correctly, if Meekin were to get past Martrovics and Martrovics were to finish second, they would actually be tied on points uh, in second in the championship. Um, don't ask me the exact number. That might be a stretch too far for me. Uh, but I believe they would be tied going into race three in the battle for second in the title fight. Mikey Porter... Of course, watching on from third place in the championship leading car that he shares with Jamie Day. No pit stops, of course, in this race. It's a 30-minute sprint, a dash to the line. And Zach Meekin uh, getting very, very close to the back of uh, Marshavik's there coming out of turn 16 uh, as they cross the line this time. We'll see whether Meekin can challenge Marcel Marshavik's. Less than three tenths in it as they come past turn one once again. Through two and into turn three they go. Bouncing across the curves as they turn in. It's quite easy to get it wrong at turn three as you transition across the curb back onto the tarmac coming out of two into three. Papadopoulos on board there. Once again, we see in the picture in picture, he's still welded to the rear of Emil Yerdrum battle for second in the pro class uh, pro am class but it's the pro lead the overall lead that we focus on as Meekin once again harangues the rear of Marcel Marshavix through the corkscrew for the ninth time in this race We'll see whether Meekin can maybe get himself a good run out of turn 15 that would be critical for a move into the hairpin that follows. Both cars stopped nicely for turn 12. A little bit of a twitch there for Meekin. He's slower through 13. Meekin looking to square up 15. Takes a nice wide berth through the corner. That was a nice run for Meekin. But Marshavix executed the corner nicely as well. Will Meekin be close enough? I somehow doubt it. Uh, but he's once again in the slip of Marcel Marshavix in the Merc. Mikey Porter keeping pace with them as well. He's been about two seconds off for most of the race after his early error. He'll be hoping that they do end up side by side and elbows out at some point in this race so that he can maybe try and get involved in this one too Alex Connor for CV performance still in fourth place just ahead of Ivan Ekelchik that battle continues also once again a spoil of riches as ever in the GT4 winter series when it comes to battling out there on circuit this is the closest fight out on track though between Marshavix and Meekin it's also the one that feels the most like a chess match. Marshavix goes wide at one corner, makes a little bit of an error. Meekin makes an error at another corner. Of course, Zach Meekin is always looking to uh, make that one key play out of turn 15 to try and get a good run towards the hairpin down the huge back straight here at Motorland Aragon. There is the Pro-Am battle between Connor and Ekelchik. Still Ekelchik behind the 84 CV performance car. Emil Yerdrum and Papadopoulos behind them fighting for second in Pro-Am, of course, as well. While their class leader, Ivan Ekelchik, continues to investigate his chances of getting fourth overall. Through turn 12 they go then. Does seem as though these GT cars are slightly less uh, liable to being affected by the uh, by the tailwinds at 12 and 16. That is to be expected. Heavier cars, less aero dependent. Um, however, certainly have seen a couple of errors at the corners, the offending corners during the race. Connor and Ekelchik then, fourth and fifth 
as they head down towards turn 16. Again, Echelchik towards the end of the straight looks very, very strong. It's close between Martrovic and Meekin. Less than two tenths between them as they cross the line. And did you see that corner cut at turn one? Goodness me. Uh, there are some track limits penalties being dished out, incidentally. Uh, car 85 has received a five-second time penalty. So Emil Yerdrum has received a five-second penalty. As it stands, he would need to be five seconds ahead of Papadopoulos to retain second in Pro-Am. So there's one penalty that has been dished out for track limits. Um, there have been a few other instances of warnings thrown out there as well, none of which seem to be affecting most of our front runners, with the exception of car 11. Marcel Martovic does have three warnings hanging over his head. So he has to be very careful to keep it within the designated track space. Marshevik's Meek and Porter now separated by just 1.3 seconds as well. Wasn't the best lap for Marshevik's last time by. He seems to be losing a little bit to both of the cars behind him. But once again, he has the high ground. He is in the position to stave off the advances rather than make the attacks. And that's exactly where everyone wants to be in these situations. Seven minutes and 38 seconds to go. He's withstood the pressure very well to this point in the race and it is very rapidly to my eye becoming a three car battle here if anything Mikey Porter is closer this time to Meekin than Meekin is to Marshevik so Mikey Porter confident building at the wheel of the number 19 car seemed a little bit off the boil in the first couple of laps but he's into the groove now an overall podium is not enough he wants to try and go for this win. Car 10 is the latest to receive a, a track limit slap on the wrist. So AM class leader Max Huber with a little bit of a telling off. Turning into the first corner once again with the leading battle. And it is the second place fight that really the one catching the eye right now as Porter suddenly seems like the driver with the most underneath him. Has he been saving his tyres, perhaps? Has he been taking a little less energy out of his Pirellis versus Martovic and Meekin up ahead? It's certainly possible. If you're interested in the battles further back, in brief, I'll tell you that Alex Connor has started to build a gap over Ivan Ekelchik. So Ekelchik almost a second behind Alex Connor now. He, of course, though, still leads Pro-Am, Ivan Ekelchik. Uh, and, of course, Emil Yerdrum is half a second ahead of Alex Papadopoulos. However, we know that Yerdrum has a five-second penalty for track limit violations. Here is the battle for fourth place once again. Love the sound of that uh, Cayman. Of course, flat six power. It's a little bit... Uh, Flatter sounding than the uh, other Porsche engines we hear. We run towards turn 12 once again. <laughs> a bit of a sideways moment there. A little bit of an over-rotation in 12 for Ekelchik. So Marshavix, Meekin and Porter will be, I think, at the other end of the straight as these guys turn into 15. Wonder just how close Mikey Porter is at this stage to Zach Meekin. Oh goodness, it's all kicking off further back. And is that Emil Yerdrum with some damage? Yes, his uh, diffuser is damaged. And it's side by side for the Cayman Trophy lead. Enrico Ferdera with a good run out of turn 15. Tim Noiser has gotten past Emil Yerdrum, but Yerdrum may have slightly tripped up Noiser because it's Ferdera now with the inside line and the Cayman Trophy lead as they approach turn 16. Does everyone get the cars stopped? The answer is, well, not really, but it's Ferdera that leads the pack and it's Ferdera that now leads in Cayman Trophy. Up to seventh place he goes then, but he's now got to worry about Emil Yerdrum in Pro-Am who may be driving with a bit of red mist. I don't know quite how he got there behind Enrico Ferdera. I don't know quite how his splitter got damaged, but nonetheless, Yerdrum 
with the tide turning against him a little bit at this juncture. Will not be the happiest young man. Through turn three they go, and Yerdrum with a nice little slide there through turn three, as a matter of fact. Carried the speed well. Enrico Ferdera, though, a very talented youngster in his own right, a driver that we've seen some fabulous performances from, of course, successful in the uh, German karting scene. It's previously raced with uh, Jamo Hartling, who we see in the uh, GT Win Series. He's also very, very good friends uh, with uh, Joel Mesh, uh, who, of course, shares the leading car with Marcel Marshavix. It's all very happy families among the SR Motorsport and Schnitzelaum youngsters. Uh, quite the great young group of uh, young German racing talent there. So Ferdera from Jerdrum, from Neuser, from Drexel, the battle there. Papadopoulos just ahead of them through shot in sixth place. Dak Meekin has started to close in again on Marcel Marshavix. It's now kind of reversed again towards Marshavix being attacked by Meekin and Mikey Porter watching on uh, up at the front of the order as Daniel Drexel... Uh, continues to fight the uh, Cayman Trophy car up ahead of him, of course. The Cayman Trophy cars in a different categorization, slightly sub-GT4 spec. So Drexel has a better car underneath him, theoretically. But getting past Tim Neuser may be a challenge. On to the brakes. They go, and Yerdrum went very deep. Neuser went slightly deep, and Drexel got it more or less right. And Yerdrum may prove to be a bit of a rolling roadblock here for uh, Tim Neuser because uh, Ferderer is getting away. That means the Cayman Trophy lead is getting away from Tim Neuser. All the while, Yerdrum, or all the while, Neuser is getting attacked from behind by Daniel Drexel. As we briefly got a shot there from on board with Drexel, uh, Yerdrum certainly seems to be struggling with something. Maybe the tyre is starting to go away from him. This will be, I think, the uh, third last lap of the race. We should have two to go this time. As Drexel continues to seek a route past the 111. But so far, a route is not forthcoming. It's Marshavix from Meekin from Porter at the front of the field. There was less than half a second in it between the top three, or less than half a second in it between the top two last time. Um, Drexel needs to be very careful <laughs> with how he takes turn 10 based on what we saw there just before we cut away. Uh, Zach Meekin then in the slipstream again, flashing those headlights. 55 seconds to go means that this will be the last lap. Of course, no plus one lap in this race. Uh, we've done a lot of plus one lap in the last uh, couple of races. This is going to be the final lap of the race. So Zach Meekin is running out of time, and he will be well too aware of that as they go on to the final lap of the race then. Zach Meekin just two and a half tenths back, a quarter of a second back from Marcel Marshavik. He's clearly got a good car underneath him. However, the Mercedes, with the traction advantage coming out of the slow corners, uh, may well be able to stave off Meekin down the long back straight. Zach Meekin will be looking for any opportunity he can to outscore Marshavik in this race. It would be a seven-point swing either way uh, in the battle for second in the championship uh, if... Marshavix wins if Meekin wins. It'll be a 14 gap between second and third, 14 point gap between second and third in the championship uh, if things finish as they are. If Meekin gets by, and they'll be tied on points with Joel Mesh and Meekin and Leban. Yerdrum continues to be a bit of a spoiler there uh, for Tim Neuser, but it's the lead scrap. Uh, that I think is probably going to be the most interesting going forward. Ivan Ekelchik, we just saw there, has gotten past Alex Connor. So finally, uh, Ekelchik finds his uh, way past for fourth overall. So that's uh, going to further sweeten the pro -am win for Ekelchik. But what can Zach Meekin do uh, about 
the car ahead of him about the race lead. He tries to square off turn 15 as much as possible, but of course, Marshevix does the same. You see the slight torque advantage in living colour there as Marshevix gets a couple of kilometres an hour more coming off the corner, but as they get further down the straight, the sleek McLaren gets quicker and quicker where the Mercedes starts hitting the air. However, I don't think Meekin is close enough. He looks to the inside. He's going to give it a go. He's got a car alongside. He doesn't anymore. I think Marcel Martrovic has just about done enough to secure a full haul of points, most importantly for his co-driver, Joel Mesh, but also for himself. It's 25 points. It's a win for Marcel Martrovic. Uh, a great result for Marcel in that sprint race. He wins it from Meekin from Porter your top three and according to the timing screen it was less than 300 four hundredths of a second 0 0.036 there at the end of the race Marshevik swerved over to go take the checkered flag it could have cost him it was a very very close finish Ivan Ekelchik takes fourth ahead of Alex Connor Papadopoulos coming over the hill now to come second in Pro-Am he takes second in class then. Enrico Ferdera will take seventh. And Emil Yerdrum will cross the line in eighth. But of course, there is a five second penalty hanging over his head. As far as I know, that's the only penalty to consider as well. Tim Neuser, ninth ahead of Daniel Drexel in tenth. Our AM class leader, Max Huber, crosses the line to take 11th overall. Ahead of Richard Wolf, who takes 12th place. Somoshoff and Cohen will round out the finishing order in this race. I know that Christian Cohen has moved to Cayman Trophy, actually. I didn't spot this, but I think the Team Sewer Grand Sport car have wheeled out a spare, hence he's now in Cayman Trophy. I missed that the 94 car has seemingly changed its stripes, perhaps literally. Um, so they've moved down to Cayman Trophy. There's Somoshoff in the 99. He'll come across the line to finish 13th place. Of course, he'll share with Manuel Lauk in the Enduro uh, later on. A formidable pair for the Pro-Am race. And then Christian Cohen will be the last car across the line. And yes, indeed, I think SRS Team Sir Grensport have uh, adopted a car from the SR Motorsport fleet to run in Cayman Trophy for the rest of the weekend. You'll recall uh, that the Team Sir Grensport car seemed to be leaking oil quite badly. Uh, I think an engine detonated towards the end of the race uh, on Saturday. Marcel Marshevix is coasting more so than uh, I think he wants to. I don't think this is celebration. I think this could be a problem for Marcel Marshevix. I was wondering if he might have had an issue because he seemed slow after they crossed the line. And of course, he slowed down rather more than he would have normally done at the finish line. Hence, it was so close between he and Zach Meekin. And it seems that Marcel Marshevix has a problem and he's pushing and whacking the steering wheel going, come on. You could see it there from his cockpit that he is furious at the car. And so while Marshevix has won the race, he is also going to be stranded out on circuit. So, well, I suppose Izzy Browning is going to have to interview someone other than a race winner uh, because Marcel Marshevix doesn't look like he's going any further. And that is a huge concern for Schnitzlaum and for uh, Joel Mesh as well because we've seen that car have issues at Jerez. There was a suspension problem. Uh, at Valencia, the car pulled over halfway through the endurance race. And now, thankfully, after the checkered flag, it seems to have found a gremlin in its system just moments after taking the race victory. And they're pointing there as if to say, right, we'll push you behind the barriers. So it seems Marcel Marshevix has no faith uh, and indeed no power to take the car back to pit lane. So a late drama for Marcel Marshevix. The 11 car stopped out on circuit. Zach Meekin then will be the first of the uh, finishers to uh, arrive under the podium. 
I dare say Marcel Marshevich may get his winner's trophy in the post after this. They might have to send Joel up <laughs> to pick up the uh, pick up the trophy once all is said and done. And I understand Izzy has uh, decided to walk over to Elite Mode Sport instead. So we'll get Zach Meekin's take on the battle for the lead. Yeah, I'm down with our P2 driver, Zach Meekin, from that GT4 race. We've got Marcel Markovic out on the track still, uh, possibly with an issue, as, as Adam Weller said. Zach, I mean, you tried everything, every which way. You didn't quite manage to get past, but that was a that was a good old race for you, wasn't it? It was. Uh, me and him had a very good race. I made a few mistakes. He managed to pull a gap. I caught him, but then it was a bit too late. I should have applied a little bit more pressure, maybe to see if I could get something, but... Uh, it was a good race otherwise, and he did a fantastic job. So you're going to apply more pressure later then? Definitely, I'm going to be up there. And like this track, do you like this track to drive? Does the car feel good around here? It looks like it's been pretty dialed all weekend. Yeah, the car feels good. We struggle a bit on torque, but besides that, we gain through the corners on minimum, so it's, it's all going good. And you're ready for the race later? Yeah, I am. We're definitely winning this time. See if we can get three in a row. Definitely winning. That's confidence. Well done. We'll let you get off to the podium. All right, there's our P2 driver. Hopefully Adam can give us a bit of an update on our P1 driver. As uh, as you can see, the car has not made it down here, but the drivers are going to go up to the podium and we'll head back to Adam. Thanks, Izzy. Um, frankly, I think the update is probably... Um as again, send the trophy in the post. <laughs> I don't think we're going to see him uh, any time soon uh, since he is something like a kilometre away from the uh, from the uh, podium itself. Marcel Marshevich is our race winner then. Zach Meekin in second and Mikey Porter in third place. An all-pro podium ahead of Ivan Ekelchik, the Pro-Am winner. Alex Connor is in fifth place overall. Alex Papadopoulos secures second in Pro-Am with a sixth place finish. Enrico Ferdera taking seventh place ahead of Tim Neuser. Daniel Drexel in ninth. And of course, with a penalty, Emil Yerdrum is dropped down to tenth. Eleventh place for Max Huber, winning in the AM class. Richard Wolf taking twelfth. Jan Nicholas Somachov and Christian Cohen rounding out our 14 car finishing order. Of course, Enrico Ferdera, the first of the Cayman Trophy runners. Christian Cohen now in Cayman Trophy after the original car had an issue yesterday. So then let's take a look back at the highlights of this race. Then it was a good start for Marshevix from the front row of the grid. It was Mikey Porter that followed him in second place in the early stages as everyone worked their way through the first lap of the race. As we went down towards turn 16, Porter went straight on the tailwind again proving to be the rival, the enemy of many this weekend uh, here at Motorland Aragon on Winter Series Sunday. We had some great scrapping further back in the pack as well as Daniel Drexel tried to get past some of the Pro-Am cars uh, on the inside there of Papadopoulos. He would later fall back a little further though, Drexel in the 77 Razoon car, but some great onboard shots there as he tried to fight with the NM Racing Team machine. Ivan Ekelchik spent pretty much the entire race trying to find his way around Alex Connor, one way or the other. Each time we got to turn 16, he looked lively uh, behind the number 84. He would eventually get past, but it would be a lot and lot, a lot of trying to get there. Emil Yerdrum was putting some feet wrong. He lost out to Papadopoulos uh, as the battle for fourth also continued. March fix deep into turn 16. Zach Meekin starting to apply the pressure at that point in the battle for the lead. Enrico Ferdera took his opportunity to get past Tim Neuser as Emil Yerdrum made a mistake in front of them. Yerdrum splitting the two Cayman Trophy cars for a while and that allowed Ferdera to build a couple of seconds over the talented uh, Tim Neuser. Really exciting scrapping further back. A great depth of talent uh, in all of our classes in the GT4 Winter Series. So many promising youngsters from various different camps and uh, great racing as always. Uh, we are treated to uh, win in the closest of circumstances in favour 
of Marcel Martrovic, so I happen to know that being on the wrong side of turn 12 means he's probably about as far away uh, from the podium as humanly possible. So I suspect we might have to do a podium sans one uh, just for the sake of time, but we'll wait and see what the decision is on that front. Of course, the GT4 win series, as Izzy and Zach alluded to, uh, in the interview a few moments ago, we'll race again a 60-minute enduro where there will be a mandatory pit stop from minute 25 to minute 35 of the race. Those that have a driver to swap with will, of course, uh, exit the cockpit and uh, hand over during that pit window. So then all calm on the circuit once again for just a few moments, but we will see... Uh, the GT win series cars out onto the circuit shortly for our next race. And uh, we are once again going all through the day here. If you are joining us here at the circuit or indeed if you're watching on the live stream, there is no stopping this weekend. There is no stopping on win series Sunday. No lunch break, just racing, racing and a little bit more racing with five championships on the bill today. It is a deluxe day of action with our four Giedlik Winter Series Championships sharing a weekend for the first time. And we are, of course, joined by Euro Cup 3 as well. You see the GT Winter Series cars heading out onto the circuit, but we are still uh, looking back at the GT4s, where, of course, we have seen a, a bit of a drama for Marcel Marshevix uh, in the number 11 Schnitzlaum Mercedes, the car coming to a halt at the end of the race. Uh, at turn 13, after winning, uh, the car seemingly starting to limp and uh, Marshevix stranded on the opposite end of the Motorland Aragon site, unfortunately, uh, which is certainly a complication for our podium ceremonies. Uh, Anna Estevez and co. will all be working for solutions to, uh, uh, to that query. I'm sure Lukas Gajewski will be uh, inputting as well to uh, try and figure out how to proceed with the podiums. Of course, there's no lack of podiums uh, in GT4 Winter Series with Pro, Pro-Am, Am and the Cayman Trophy. Um, interesting to see that uh, the Sur Gren Sport team uh, have uh, now moved into Cayman Trophy as well. It did look like the engine was rather bidding us adieu yesterday in the Team Sir Grensport GT4 Cayman, but what I hadn't spotted was the fact that the uh, the car was now marked green on the timing screen and therefore has now become a Cayman Trophy entry. Uh, but I'm sure Schnitzelaum, for a small fee, was benevolent enough to uh, pass a car over to them. So then, we see there... Yesterday's Cup 2 winner, actually, uh, Joachim Bolting putting heat through the tyres. If I were him, I would pin the throttle from turn 15 just to see how bad the wind is into 16, uh, just to uh, to see if it's as bad in the Cup car as it has been for everyone else today. The story of the day has certainly been the tailwind into 12 and 16 here at Motorland Aragon. You saw the effect it had on the Euro Cup 3s, who were the first cars out this morning. Um, hopefully the wind isn't having too much of an effect on Lukas Gajewski's hair. Oh, wait. Let's go down to him at the podium. Thank you very much, Adam Weller. It's a huge bunch of podium procedures to go through in GT4 Winter Series, as always. So let's kick off our celebrations up here on the stage. And we'll start with Pro-Am today, because, of course, we want to give a slight chance to our pro race winner, Marcel Marshevitz, to still get here. So let's welcome in third place in Pro-Am class for CV performance, Emil Gerdrum. In second place for NM Racing, it's Alex Papadopoulos. And your Pro-Am winner for Wimmerweg Motorsport is Ivan Ekalcik. Well done to all our three Pro-Am drivers as we welcome Robin Silbach, Sergio Fonseca from the Gatelich Racing Organization, joined on the podium by Georgie Chapman from our tire partner Pirelli to present the trophies to our three winning 
Pro-Am drivers, which are being gathered on the highest step of the podium by Daniel, our photographer, up here on stage. We're going to give a couple of seconds as well for the photographers downstairs in the pits. And of course, offer a huge round of applause for Emma Gradrum, Alex Papadopoulos and Ivan Ekelcik. Coming up next is the AM-Class podium. Two drivers on the podium coming up next. And in second place in AM-Class for Resume More Than Racing is Richard Wolf. Congratulations. And your winner, just as yesterday for NM Racing, is Max Huber. Well done to Max. Second victory of the weekend as Robin Seelbach and Georgie Chapman present the trophies to our two winning drivers in the AM-Class. First podium of the weekend for Richard Wolf, joined by Max Huber for the second time this weekend. Drivers climbing down for some more podium shots. So let's please have another big round of applause for Max Huber and Richard Wolf. Cayman Trophy podium is next. And as Adam Weller was just pointing out in commentary, we saw a late addition this morning to the Cayman Trophy entry list. So there is a third place on the podium today. And it goes to SRS team Zorg Rennsport and Christian Kuhn. In second place for SR Motorsports, Tim Neuser. And your winner in Cayman Trophy in race number two for SR Motorsport as well is Enrico Förderer. Well done to Enrico. Of course, these two Caymans being present on the podium yesterday already. Michael Zander winning in the car that now finished second with Tim Neuser and Willy Kuhne taking second spot in the now victorious car driven by Enrico Förderer and now joined by Christian Kuhn and the SRS Team Zorg Rennsports squad in third place on the podium. Big round of applause once again, Christian Kuhn, Tim Neuser and Enrico Förderer. And there is one more podium to come. We just need an info if there is someone to come as we are potentially missing Marcel Marshevitz, but I think there is a solution in place. So we can kick off our podium celebration and in third place in Pro-Am class for Fossetti Motorsport, it's Mikey Porter. In second place for Elite Motorsports, Zach Meekin. And your winner, of course, is Marcel Marshevitz, but he doesn't make it in time. So let's welcome again from Schnitzelalm Racing, Tim Neuser. Tim kindly taking the uh, trophies there for Marcel and his team as Robin Sergio and Georgie Chapman from Pirelli are in action once again to present the trophies to our winning three drivers in pro class. And of course, we are going to see all of them once again later on today, this afternoon in race number three, which is going to be the uh, almost hour long enduro competition in GT4 Winter Series. Very much looking forward. But for now, it's a big round of applause to the pro class top three, Mikey Porter, Zach Meekin and Tim Neuser for Marcel Marshevitz. Thank you very much. So that concludes our GT4 Winter Series podium. Coming up next is race number two this weekend. Cars already lined up downstairs on the grid. It's time for the GT Winter Series live from Motorland Aragon. Yes, indeed. And as you can see, the grid is already pretty much cleared. So I think uh, Izzy and Johnny might need to make way post haste uh, for this one as uh, we now uh, see the cars ready to go for the GTWS race. There was a slight delay, of course, while the 11 car uh, was recovered from the GT4 class. Uh, but uh, we see there that... Uh, the GTWS cars are ready to go for their second 30-minute sprint. So then, 
I believe we are briefly going to go down to Izzy's. So let's not waste time on that. It's going to be a very brief grid walk because we've just had the one minute board. So we'll just leave you with a view of the cars. We've got JMO Hartling in the number 11. And we are going to have to go back up to Adam because the race is about to begin. I saw you ready down there. I wasn't sure if we were going to throw to you, Izzy, but uh, uh, there we go. 15 second board about to be displayed as uh, the marshals there giving her a hurry up. Uh, Want to get this one underway quickly, understandably, of course, because there's a lot of races to fit into the schedule today. The last thing we need is any uh, further delay. So then the... All Mercedes front row, as you can see, J-Mo Hartling, Moritz Witzkirchen. I think that is going to be a hell of a battle between two cars that are effectively sister machines. Yes, one is entered under SR Motorsport, the other is entered under Schnitzelam Racing, but these are effectively the same umbrella, and uh, Witzkirchen uh, just as decorated as J-Mo Hartling. Uh, two very, very quick talents, and I'm looking forward to seeing how this race unfold in the GT Wind Series. Martin Kazmarski will be looking to play spoiler as well from Road 2. And I note that we are missing quite a few cars from the grid. So Pierre Elliott's uh, 115 car now in the hands of Christian Hook is there in fourth place. But as we can see in general, there's a, a few less than we were hoping for. I have seen some cars, though, head to the end of pit lane. Jamo Hartling will start from pole position alongside Moritz Viskirchen for this one. Then Martin Kazmarski is next on row two. Dylan Pereira's 911. Uh, the 992 Cup car, Cup 2 leader, is not there. Christian Hook is there, but Hubert, uh, as is Hubert Darmetko. Joachim Bolting is also present, but Pablo Brass, Pedro Lorino, and Leo Willett are all missing. Um, let's hope that some of them, if not all of them, are down there at the uh, pit exit. If we do have eyes on that in the next few moments, that would be good to see because. Uh, I know that I've seen Pablo Brass's car head down the pit lane late. It does seem as though some of our GT Wind Series teams were caught napping a little bit there. Um, but they are going to be uh, taking to the circuit in short order. Hopefully, we'll have a few of them join from pit lane. Because unfortunately, not everyone wanted to brave Motorland Aragon this weekend. So we need all the cars, really that we can get. Jamo Hartling then will be our pole sitter up against Moritz Viskirchen. If you're unfamiliar with Moritz Viskirchen, he has uh, raced in the N24 previously. He moved into car racing from karts in 2021 and has been in GT4 Germany and the NLS uh, in recent times. Two silver cup podiums in the 2022 GT4 European Series and raced a GT3 last year in the GTC category out in Germany, the GTC Race Championship DMV GTC, uh, and also at the GT Masters season finale last year as Schnitzelam Racing made its first appearance in the ADAC GT Masters. So then, Jamo Hartling and Moritz Viskirsch in your front row, two extremely talented young German peddlers set to take the start. Martin Kazmarski from the second row, also in a Mercedes AMG Evo. Of course, he is an AM driver, but a very talented one. And the same can be said as well for Christian Hook as well. So they could maybe play spoiler in the early going. And then, of course, you've got the Porsche Cup cars behind as well. We'll try and catch how many cars are uh, uh, on the pit exit as well as this race gets underway but it is a drag race between Jamo Hartling and Moritz Viskirchen then as the GT Winter Series race number two kicks into life it is Jamo Hartling that leads them you've got two cars down there at pit exit so Pablo Brass and I think Pedro Lorino uh, Pedro Brass as he should be called uh, will rejoin the race from a little further back indeed the two Villico cars do start um, a little bit tardy, a little bit late. But this is actually quite big for the championship 
that Dylan Pereira's number 911 car isn't out there on the track. That makes me wonder if the damage we saw uh, to Dylan Pereira's car yesterday in the hands of its regular pilot, Leandro Martins, was terminal because we saw suspension damage on that car yesterday after he had contact with Hubert Darmetko. And the reason I'm focusing on this is because uh, that car was second in the championship. Leandro Martins was making a bid for title glory here in the GT Wind Series within Cup 2. And if he doesn't score points in this race, along with Dylan Pereira, then Jamo Hartling and Kenneth Heyer take a big step towards winning the GT Winter Series. They will not be able to do it this weekend mathematically, but if that uh, Rakar Motorsport car is out for the weekend, then that is a huge, huge story. Jamo Hartling and Moritz Viskirchen then at the head of the order leading the way. And Viskirchen has lost a couple of seconds on that lap. Kazmarski is closer to him than Viskirchen is to our leader. So it's Jamo Hartling at the front of the pack. We've got a car off circuit. That's going to be one of the OTM, or one of the uh, Villico cars. It's the 951. It is Pablo Brass who has been caught out potentially by the tailwind. It doesn't look like the car has been damaged at all. Our top three come through shots for the first time. I suspect, though, that they will soon be interrupted by a safety car because of the uh, car beached in the gravel unless uh, something can be sorted in short order. Through turn two... And three, now into four, goes the battle for second place between Viskirchen and Kazmarski. There's Christian Hook in fourth place as Jamo continues on at the front of the order. Of course, he had a brilliant scrap back at Portimao uh, with Finn Wiebelhaus, a battle that he won in what was Wiebelhaus's first ever GT3 race. Uh, Wiebelhaus finished second then and has won every subsequent race that he's entered in GT Winter Series. And I understand we'll see him back uh, at Barcelona in a week's time. But for now, Jamo Hartling is building a gap over Viskirchen and Kazmarski. There is the 951 car still just beached uh, in the gravel at turn 11. I wonder if maybe... It'll be judged that the car is far enough away uh, from the racing surface to not be a liability from a safety perspective. That could be the case. Um, we'll see whether that is um, what the protocol is. But uh, for now, we continue on. We continue racing. Um, Pedro Brass uh, came across the line a minute behind the leader. So Pedro was very slow to get underway, but he has now done so. There goes your top three, the three Mercedes AMG GT3s. And now the safety car is out. So the safety car has been put out to rescue uh, Pablo Brass, who on the very first lap of the race reversed it seemingly into turn 12 and into the gravel trap. There you see the 115 car, the... Porsche 991.2 GT3R. We'll see, I understand, the Ferrari 296 back out for the first time since Portimao uh, in the season finale at Barcelona. I also understand that uh, potentially we're looking at bare minimum high 20s in terms of uh, GT cars for next weekend in Barcelona, of course, provisionally. So very exciting that maybe uh, we are going to have a deluxe grid, let's say, uh, before the season is through. But for now, we have a field isolated by the safety car as J-Mo Hartling uh, will lose the 1.7 seconds he had gained over Moritz Witzkirchen. And actually, the previous lap, Witzkirchen was slightly quicker uh, than, Kazma, uh, than Hartling. So I do actually think that uh, despite a, a bit of a, a steady start, Viskirchen has the pace to challenge uh, Jamo Hartling for the race win across this distance. Uh, in Cup 2, Hubert Darmetko is certainly 
at least based on the result sheets, the strongest of our three drivers in uh, Cup 2. I uh, would not put it past Joachim Bolting, though, to give him a big challenge. And I wouldn't past it, put it past the marshals to get the broomsticks out, looking at the uh, state of turn 12. There's a lot of gravel down there. That rather suggests to me that um, that Pablo Brass may have gone over the grass and the gravel on the inside of 12 before ending up on the outside of the corner because that's a lot, a lot, a lot of gravel to be down there. Right on board with Moritz Viskirchen course is sharing the car with uh, Schnitzlaum regular at the N24 David Thelinius does some uh, pro driving driver coaching development work for various OEMs um, major manufacturers over in the United States and uh, Meanwhile, Viskirchen is uh, very much a racer's racer, a great youngster who's made very quick strides through the GT racing ranks in Europe and in Germany. We've heard uh, Jamo Hartling referred to as a, as a rocket man, as, uh, uh, as Kenneth Heyer put it, and I would say that uh, if he's a rocket man, perhaps uh, Viskirchen is the other rocket booster uh, on the other side of the main vessel uh, as these, this team takes off into the summer season. Two very young talents uh, with a very big future ahead of them. Same can as well be said, of course, for the likes of Joel Mesh, Enrico Ferdera. There's a lot of driving talent within that Schnitzlaum SR Motorsport garage. Martin Kazmarski um, in third place, of course, as we've alluded to, um, making his first steps in GT3 racing here with us in GT Winter Series. And he's uh, he's been pretty uh, impressive in his performances so far, even if he's seemingly loath to admit it on the air. Um, taking a win, of course, earlier on up against Kenneth Heyer on Saturday evening. Uh, a feat that he also achieved in race number two of uh, the weekend in Jerez, his first ever weekend at the helm of the GT3 car. Of course, that Mercedes-AMG GT3 Evo is a car that's been uh, quite heavily worked on by uh, Kenneth Heyer, who has had a, a big role in developing GT3 cars and Mercedes-AMG customer racing cars in general. He was telling me in Valencia about the uh, thousands of kilometers he's done of that track specifically uh, in aid of development of the Mercedes uh, AMG fleet of GTs, dating back to the uh, development cycle of the SLS, the first Mercedes GT3 car, all the way back in 2010. So then the lights are out on the safety car. And the blend of Mercedes and Porsches will take off once again we do have seven cars out there on circuit but only six in the queue as Pedro Brass uh, is away off the pack Jamar Hartling stacks up the field behind him looks for a good place to go and he found one a wonder way again then as this race continues, 30-minute sprint race at one-third distance. We return to green flag racing, and it's J-Mo Hartling from Moritz Viskirchen from Martin Kazmarski, your top three. Of course, Christian Hook there in the fourth of the GT3 spec cars, the Porsche 991.2 GT3. It's good to see uh, the 991.2 still out there. Of course, it has been superseded now by the... 992 GT3R. That is a slippery surface flag down at turn 12 uh, because of the gravel that is on there from the Pablo Brass incident. 
So I have to be careful of that. It's not only um, Tailwind now, but also a lot of Shingle down at the apex of turn 12. So um, brace as they approach turn 12, just in case someone gets it wrong. There are a lot of obstacles at play uh, down at the wall at the moment. You can see there the gravel uh, clear as day on the apex of the corner. Here comes Jamo. He's first one through. A little bit of a twitch, and you see a puff as the uh, gravel dissipates beneath his tyres. And one car did go wide. That was Joachim Balting who uh, went wide there. So Balting had a little bit of a moment, but everybody threw safely. Balting, who'll be looking to challenge Hubert Darmetko, has lost some time there in the Cup 2 fight. Our three Mercedes AMG GT3 Evos run down to turn 16 once again. Of course, despite the uh, road car being powered by a, a four litre turbo engine, these cars are still powered uh, by the original recipe big engine from Mercedes AMG, the 6.2 litre V8, which has been present in these cars since the uh, SLS debuted at the tail end of 2010. The best sounds in modern motorsport is that of the uh, Mercedes AMG GT3. A car that's been in service since 2016. I think it's on the verge of a refresh uh, at this juncture. Maybe going into 2026, I think, is the, is the plan. And there's a concern that maybe we might have to wave the 6.2 goodbye. Uh, at that point. Of course, we saw Jules Gounon uh, rather magnificently in an unrestricted and DRS-applied um, version of this car. Set a stonking lapper, 156, I think it was, uh, at, the, uh, at the Bathurst 12 hour on a private session, an unofficial lap record that was then broken a week later by the Ford Supervan, of all things, in the hands of uh, Romain Dumas. But... Uh, there is a lot of potential in a GT3 car if you run restricted. It's got a shade over 500 brake horsepower in the spec we see on screen, but there's there's a lot more than that to be extracted from the engine if you uh, take the air restrictors out. We have seen GT3 cars run sans air restriction uh, in GT Winter Series in the past, and the, uh, the difference in a straight line is stark. Martin Kazmarski then, uh, again, seems to be Chloe closer to Moritz Viskirchen than uh, Viskirchen is to Hartling. So Hartling doing his job nicely, just uh, extending his advantage, building his cushion over, J -Mo, uh, over Moritz Viskirchen. Hartling was a second clear last time by. The gap now is 1.8 seconds, whereas Martin Kazmarski, just two and a half uh, back from the lead, means he's just seven tenths away from Viskirchen. Kazmarski could be in a scrap here this this time around with Moritz Viskirchen. He's previously had to fight Kenneth Heyer. And now he'll go up against another professional in the form of Viskirchen. Viskirchen, I think it's fair to say, is in the infancy of his career, while I think the prognosis Kenneth Heyer gave me was final fifth of his career. Um, but... Uh, Two very good yardsticks for Kazmarski to go up against in the form of the two talented Germans from the, uh, the Schnitzelaum stable. And Kazmarski really putting a good account of himself out there into the world. A Polish racer with a diverse background of off-road racing before converting to the world of GTs with the help of his team, PTT Racing. Of course, PTT have run a huge fleet of Porsches at times this year in the GT Win Series. Um, I know that one of them was actually sold. The car that we saw in the hands of Matthias Lizowski in the first four rounds of the season has uh, actually been picked up and sold subsequently uh, over the last two weeks. There's still a lot of uh, Porsche Cup machinery uh, in the PTT awning, and we're expecting to see the full quota of metal from uh, 
from PTT out in Barcelona, I believe. Deep into the corner goes Viskirchen and Kazmarski. Even the GT3s are being uh, adversely affected by the tailwinds into turn 16. If it was headwind, it wouldn't be a problem. If anything, you could probably be a bit later on the brakes. But uh, when the wind is pushing you towards the corner, as, as it does, then uh, it's rather a bigger problem. When I walked the circuit on, on Wednesday, along with... Uh, our broadcast colleague Izzy, as well as uh, the series photographer Danny, uh, it was uh, very blowy indeed. Uh, the circuit seems to have been uh, built on what would actually be quite a good site for a wind farm. Um, it's blowy conditions here all the time. Jamo Hartling lost some time on that last lap. His previous lap, a 158.803, so he actually lost some seven tenths. Uh, to Moritz Viskirchen, but more importantly, Martin Kazmarski set the fastest lap of the race last time. So Kazmarski, the first driver to dip below a 158. I tell you what, if Martin Kazmarski getting to grips with GT3s is already able to uh, hold accountable the pace of someone like Jamo Hartling, this development curve could become seriously impressive as the weekends go on. See there, Viskirchen having to catch a slide there mid-corner. And missing the apex, I think, a bit at 14 as well. Where is the white and yellow Mercedes in his mirrors? The answer is very close indeed. Now, I don't think Kazmarski is close enough, but maybe he'll have a go as they approach turn 16. Let's wait and see uh, whether Kazmarski has it in him. He looks to the inside at 16 speculatively, and then he holds it just in case Viskirchen goes wide, and he does, but Kazmarski isn't quite able to get through on that occasion. Good racing then from Martin Kazmarski as he continues to pursue Viskirchen. He looks like the form man out there on circuit, albeit Jamo Hartling has just set a fastest lap of the race of 57.682 at the front. So the gap is out over two seconds for the first time in the race, whereas the battle for second is alive and kicking between Viskirchen and Kazmarski. We've heard Kazmarski be very self-critical in the interviews uh, with Chris at Jerez, with Izzy here at, at uh, Aragon. And, well, his critical nature is also matched by a very quick learning curve, seemingly, because he's a lot closer to JMO here than he was a few weeks ago in Jerez in terms of pace. Struggled a little bit at Valencia, where, of course, we had uh, a real smorgasbord of GT3 machinery driven by the likes of Finn Wiebelhaus and, of course, Nicky Team, uh, double World Endurance Championship GTE champion. But uh, that is the beauty of GT Winter Series. If you're a, a driver getting to grips with a GT car for the first time, the depth of talent sometimes on this grid is... Uh, Rather extraordinary. There is Christian Hook in fourth position. He's just ahead of Hubert Darmetko, who's another, I would say, GT Wind Series success story. He uh, made his racing debut uh, in the GT Wind Series at Estoril at the start of the season. Won a race in Cup 2 that weekend, if I remember correctly. Indeed, he did. Uh, won the second race of the weekend, came second overall uh, and won Cup 2 on his first ever weekend of racing and has got closer and closer to people like Leandro Martins and even Leandro's driver coach, Dieter Swepes, uh, over the course of the season. Darmetko, I'm sure he must have a lot of track mileage under his belt uh, because of the uh, the speed in which he has gotten to grips with the car but uh, it's very impressive nonetheless and whatever he's doing in the summer I expect that the experiences he's had here in GT Winter Series are going to serve him well Christian Hook is a driver with experience of the World Endurance Championship of 
the uh, Blanc Pan GT, as it used to be called, the GT World Challenge Europe, has done just about every major GT race out there, albeit, of course, as a bronze driver. But the fact that Darmetko so soon is able to chase Christian Hook in a full-fat GT3 car tells you all you need to know about the potential of Hubert Darmetko. You can see with these two cars the spec differences. It's not the, not just that one is a 991 and one is a 992. The uh, Porsche GT3 car much broader uh, in the fenders, much more aerodynamically focused versus the 992, which looks a lot more like a, a 992 GT3 road car, much more standard. Uh, than the GT3, more suspension, travel, less aero, but also in some instances a little bit more straight line speed. 992 GT3 Cup entering, I believe, its fourth year of competition. So then Viskirchen and Kazmarski still within a second of each other in the battle for P2 in this race. It is... Viskirchen versus Kazmarski, Schnitzlaum versus PTT in that battle for P2 as Chemo Hartling takes a slightly exaggerated line through uh, turn five of the lap. Uh, Martin Kazmarski does have to be a little bit careful, incidentally, about the, uh, the millstone that is track limits. He's had three warnings thus far. He could do without any further. Hopefully he remembered his sunglasses today, of course. He, he said he forgot them <laughs> in race two. I'm oh, sorry, in race one. I doubt that in the current conditions, as we uh, just gone past 12 o'clock, that he actually needs them, but he might need them for race three later on as the sun dips further down into the sky. Oh, Kazmarski, very deep into turn 12 manages to gather it up but uh, that might just be in such an evenly matched battle the cushion that Viskirchen needs in fact this will now be a good test for oh well it would be Kazmarski with another error there I think trying to overcorrect trying to uh, get back to Viskirchen as quickly as possible there and making a subsequent error but uh, this is a good test now for Kazmarski to see whether he'd be quicker than Viskirchen in cleaner air. With six minutes and 25 seconds of the race left to go, though, I do wonder if uh, Kazmarski has the time to close back in on Moritz Viskirchen. I think, I think the clock might be uh, against him from here on out with a three-second gap, more or less, between himself and, Kaz and uh, second place car. It's also about three and a half seconds between the leader and second place as well. Jamo Hartling has been on a roll in this race. In the Cup 2 scrap, Hubert Darmetko is some... Um, Seven seconds clear of Joachim Bolting. Bolting of the Plus Line Racing team. And is the team that also ran uh, the likes of Demir Hot back in Portugal in uh, GT Winter Series. Bolting, um, rather fascinatingly, chose his first ever race to be the Brit car 24 hours back in 2015 in a Marcos Mantis of all things powered by Chevrolet LS7 yes the engine out of the big Corvette um, so if that's how you start I suppose uh, from there everything's a little bit more simple uh, has done a lot of GT4 racing since then made his first appearance in a 992 Cup car uh, with us in Estoril had a failure at the rear brakes in, I think it was race two at Estoril, that led him to spin twice, three times even. But on his appearances in GTWS, he has been strong. 
Dalting raced in uh, GT4 Germany for a while back in 21-22. Uh, Jamo Hartling. Meanwhile, I believe his programme for the summer will be in the uh, GTC race category, the DMV GTC. The uh, kind of third tier of German GT3 racing after DTM and ADAC GT Masters. Right on board then with Moritz Viskirchen as he goes through four and five. More than likely trail breaking into that corner. Fighting a bit with the wheel coming out of five into six. Kind of similar profiles to four and five and six and seven. You reach the highest point on the circuit here before uh, dropping down through the corkscrew at eight and nine. It is quite a mighty drop as well, as you can see there, even if the picture doesn't quite do it justice through turn 10. There is technically a kink at turn 11, which is basically where the crest of this uh, rise is. But I don't count it as a corner. <laughs> it is one, though, officially speaking. Turn 12 into this kind of bus stop section through 12 and then 13. 13, the fastest of the corners in this section. The prototypes are more or less doing it flat out from what I saw trackside on Friday night. Turn 15, 90 degree corner, very important to get that right. This Kershaw did do it very well indeed there. Onto the straight that never ends towards turn 16, towards the town of Alcanes. A town steeped in racing history itself. Deep onto the brakes there. Pretty much nailed that, getting used potentially to the conditions then. Over the kerb at 17. Turn 18 completes the lap for Viskirchen. To circle back around, though, to our race leader as he starts the penultimate lap. Hartling uh, won a shootout back in October. Uh, an officially sanctioned shootout from the GTC race team. And uh, that means he's going to have two free years of uh, GT3 racing in the GTC race category. And for someone like J-Mo, who doesn't have reams of personal budget to his name, that could be a real lifeline for his fledgling career. There's Viskirchen, 4.6 seconds back from him. And Kazmarski. Further 3.3 back from Viskirchen. I think that maybe without that moment for Martin Kazmarski, he could have been challenging for second place by the end, but we saw him make those two errors in quick succession. There's Pedro Brass in the 952 car, the brother, of course, on the graphics is Pedro Lorino, but uh, he is Pedro Lorino Brass, and uh, his brother is, of course, Pablo Brass, who we saw only very briefly in this race after he ended up in the gravel. Pablo is, uh, I think it's fair to say, the slightly quicker of the two and uh, is a Spanish GT champion from last year. We saw Pablo fighting with the likes of Hubert Darmetko uh, in Portimao and he'll be looking to do the same in race three here at Motorland Aragon, but... Uh, Race two did not go to plan, it's safe to say. We've got 30 seconds of the race left to run, so it will be the final lap this time by. Hubert Darmetko has still not lost touch with uh, Christian Hook in uh, fourth and fifth place, respectively. Christian Hook, who has been associated with the Rinaldi team since... 2016, a lot of history there between he and Rinaldi. Pierre Eret is uh, teammate. You see there the Eret logos on the car, referring to uh, the Eret family vineyards in uh, in California. Well, uh, Eret is a, a German driver. The, uh, the wine business is based out in the United States, where he spends quite a lot of time. 
That's for Christian Hook. He has been uh, racing now for eight years. <laughs> Jurkin bolting with the uh, almost sarcastic corner cut at turn one. Uh, very amusing to see how much uh, leeway some are using here. Jamo Hartling through turn 15 for the final time. Puts the power down to go down the back straight once more. Of course, in the hour-long enduro, he'll do it all again along with Kenneth Hyatt. But uh, for Jamo, it is definitely all systems a go. Has once again shown his cards, shown his potential in this race. Has gotten away from Moritz Viskirchen quite handily. And as he comes around turn 18, it will be a race win for Jamo Hartling. Jamo Hartling secures yet another win in the GT Winter Series. That will be race win number three in a solo race for him this year. Moritz Viskirchen takes second and Martin Kazmarski takes third place. And of course, with this win, Hartling and Haya will further extend their championship lead over the non-starting Rakar Motorsport machine of Pereira uh, and Martins. And hopefully we'll see that car out in race number three. But I do wonder if the suspension damage from yesterday is uh, not fixable here at the circuit. We'll have to see. Uh, Christian Hook then will cross the line for fourth overall ahead of Hubert Darmetko in P5. Darmetko wide at the last turn there, but he will take the Cup 2 win. And Joachim Bolting will be our last man across the line as Pedro Lorino is a lap down. Joachim Bolting takes sixth overall and second in the Cup 2 class. So it's another win for Jamo Hartling uh, for the team. For the team as a whole, it's race win number five of the season. But it's the third solo win for Jamo. He took wins in Portimao and Jerez on his own and uh, has won a couple of races with the assist from Kenneth Heyer as well. And they'll be looking to. Uh, claim another enduro win uh, in the race later on the uh, 55 minute endurance race pit window will open in that one with 25 minutes complete and close with 35 minutes complete so when we're 30 minutes to go in the race the window will open and of course we'll see some interesting dynamics as in some cases a quicker driver hops into the car for the second phase of the race Jamo Hartling <laughs> giving a thumbs up and a wave there to our cameraman. <laughs> he is uh, happy with that effort. Back in Jerez, it was very, very warm indeed, touching 20 degrees. And I remember that uh, by the end of the race, he did look, even though it was only the sprint, he did look pretty uh, spent. Uh, I'll be interested to see with the lower ambient temperatures today quite how he's holding up. Uh, after this one. It's certainly never a cool place to be a race car because even if it's cold outside, that big engine out front certainly uh, certainly uh, heats things up a bit. Jamo Hartling will get out of the car to celebrate another win in the GT Win Series. Tim Noiser and the rest of the Slam crew down there to celebrate the win. Of course, this car entered under SR Motorsport. And it's handshakes and backpacks all round. Or backpats, I should say. And I don't know what Martin just said, but clearly it got a, it got a reaction uh, in race number three. I can't recall an issue for the 128 car that would be so bad that uh, that it would no longer take part in the weekend but I did also get reports from our videographer Emilio that the car was particularly um, flamethrower-ish and uh, also I think cut out a couple of times so he was wondering if the engine was having issues and, and maybe he was right uh, well hopefully 
see the 128 car back out there. But uh, I do understand again that when we get to Barcelona, the GT Winter Series is going to be uh, numerous in nature. Some very exciting cars being whispered about uh, in my ears uh, by some of our uh, Gidlik Racing insiders over the last couple of days. Of course, as we've said, we are going to hear from our race winner. And I understand that Izzy Browning has caught up with Jamo Hartling. So let's go down there now. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm down with our race winner, Jamo Hartling. Jamo, that looked like a very nice drive. How was that? And uh, after the driver change, we look. Congratulations. Well done. Go enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs> There's our race two winner, Jamo Hartling. We're going to head back up to Adam for all the replays of that race. Thank you very much, Izzy. We'll just quickly run through the results. Uh, SR Motorsports, Jamo Hartling, your race winner across the 15 laps. Moritz Viskirchen, 6.6 seconds back in second place. Kazmarski in P3. Christian Hook uh, rounding out the GT3 order in fourth place. Hubert Darmetko in P5. Joachim Bolting in sixth position. And Pedro Lorino. Uh, Pedro Brass, if you will, taking seventh position in that race. So then the drivers will now be herded up to uh, the podium with uh, Anna and the rest of the Giedlich Racing crew. Of course, the, the Giedlich Racing crew received some support uh, on this weekend um, from the Race Ready organization who are behind the fabulous Iberian Supercars series here in the uh, the Iberian region. Uh, Anna Estevez, uh, Sergio Fonseca, Diogo and, Cro and the crew are all uh, a big part of uh, the nuts and bolts aspect of making these GT Wind Series races and uh, Wind Series events happen. We do have an unfortunate update from Lukas Gajewski, who has uh, used his journalistic prowess to uh, uh, to glean an update from Rakar Motorsports. Unfortunately, uh, damage to the 911 car is not fixable here. So Leandro Martins, with his error uh, in contact with Hubert Darmetko yesterday, damaged the car beyond repair for this weekend. So that means that he and Dylan Pereira are out of the racing for this weekend. And it also means that uh, Hartling and Hire will score points where they will not. Further to that, the damage is um, a question mark as to whether it can be fixed going into the season finale weekend in Barcelona as well. Uh, so that is going to be a big twist in the tail uh, of the 2020 for GT Winter Series and is going to bring Hubert Darmetko up into second in the points. In fact, he already will have taken uh, second in the points with his result uh, here in this race. But uh, for Hartling and Higher, it means that things are only getting better uh, for their championship prospect here at Motorland Aragon going into Barcelona, of course, uh, we know that Haupt Racing Team are bringing Juan de Mocoena and Finn Wiebelhaus back uh, to Barcelona. So they're going to have a lot more competition to contend with uh, within the races uh, in the, uh, the GT3 class. And they may not have to worry quite so much uh, about the points deficit because our current championship leader's closest competition will not take any further part in this weekend here at Motorland Aragon. That is a big twist in the tail and another unfortunate chapter in the season for uh, Leandro Martins who you may recall had a big smash in uh, race two uh, back at Estoril a smash so severe that the original car had to be consigned to the scrap heap and uh, the chassis that they race now it was purchased from the the Capfinger family uh, last year's GT winner to series winning chassis as a matter of fact it will not repeat that feat, uh, potentially, with uh, with Leandro Martins, or at least if it does, it's going to be from much further back in the points than we would have anticipated. The rumble of LMP3 cars is uh, starting to shake my commentary box. That's because our next race is the prototype winter series. 
And uh, you see there the mountains in the distance here in northeastern Spain. Real gorgeous region surrounding Motorland Aragon. One of my favorite circuits that I've visited uh, so far. Not quite the arduous walk that Spa-Francorchamps proved to be, but it's uh, not far behind from a track walk perspective, and it's uh, certainly a layout that uh, I think is, is really quite spectacular. I've said it a couple of times throughout the weekend. I think it's a track that's rather underutilized on the four-wheeled side of things. We've seen that a few... Uh, entries dropped for this weekend, which is which is a shame. I wish they weren't so scared of this track. It's such a wonderful place to be, and uh, no doubt if it returns to the calendar next year, uh, we'll see some more cars take to this venue. Because why wouldn't you? Look at this, the corkscrew section here, a little bit of a Laguna Seca homage, and uh, you do see traces of all of the finest racing circuits uh, in the world in this layout. There is one update uh, to quickly mention, uh, and that is the Eco Segre in ANS Motorsport Ligier JSP4 in the prototypes will no longer be in that car. So Eco uh, is going to be in another Nova NP02 as the Ligier, of course, retired yesterday with a mechanical issue. Meanwhile, we can head up to Lukas Gajewski to switch focus back to the GT Wind Series and their podiums. Thank you very much, Adam Weller. Here we go with the uh, second podium of the weekend for the GT Winter Series brought to you from Motorland, Aragon. On a, and of course, we start our podium procedures with the ceremony for the GT3 class. And in third place, it's yesterday's winner for PTT Racing, Martin Kaczmarski. Well done to Martin. In second place, for Schnitzel Arm Racing, Moritz Wischkirchen. And your winner in race number two for SR Motorsports is J-Mo Hatling. Well done to J-Mo, just as well as we welcome our Gietlich Racing GT Winter Series organization, Jan Jürgen, Stefan Lena, and Sergio Fonseca presenting the trophy to our top three finishers. Yesterday's winner, Martin. Then, of course, we've got Moritz in second place with David Thelanius, his teammate, being on the podium yesterday in third. And, of course, JMO's teammate, Kenneth Heyer, scoring second place yesterday with some very important points for the championship, especially with the uh, unfortunate news of Raka Motorsport. As we gather our top three finishers, for a couple of more pictures. Big round of applause for Martin Kaczmarski in third, Moritz Wiskirchen in second, and your winner, Jamo Hertling. One more class podium coming up in GT Winter Series, and that's for the Porsche 911 Cup machinery in class Cup 2. And in third place, for the first time on the podium, for Vineco Motorsport is Pedro Lourinho. In second place for Plus Line Racing Team, Joachim Belting. Second podium of the weekend for yesterday's winner. And on the top spot today for PTT Racing is Hubert Dametko. Well done to Hubert, scoring third place yesterday. And today it's another victory for Hubert Dametko as Jan Jürgen, Stefan Lena, and Sergio Fonseca are presenting the trophies once again to our three Cup 2 drivers on today's Race 2 podium. And of course, we are very happy to see them later on in the endurance competition and the third race of the weekend just as well as some more pictures and photos are being collected. One more huge round of applause, please. Your Cup 2 podium, Pedro Lourinho, Joachim Bölting and Hubert Dametko.
And it's a busy, busy schedule today in Motorland, Aragon, as Adam Muller, Adam Muller has just been mentioning. The prototypes are lining up, up on the grid just as well, and it's their last one of the week. And they've been racing in the night yesterday. Now it's their daylight race number two coming up. So let's head down to the prototype winter series grid. As you say, Lucas, the Prototype Winter Series is up next with their second 50-minute race. The cars are pulling up down there on the grid at the moment. Uh, Werner Eichinger is down there uh, talking to the drivers. Uh, and I understand that Izzy Browning is also down there with the drivers. Let's go down to her. I am down here. I uh, thought it was going to be less windy, but it's just got more windy as we've just come down. So our pole sitter has just pulled in. As Luca said, this is the last race of the weekend for the Prototype Winter Series. 50 minutes plus one lap endurance race, our first endurance race of the weekend. So we're going to see some pit stops and my gosh, it is getting very, very windy. So on our first position, we've got the number 66 of Daniel Kaivitz. He'll be starting in the car. They've had a best finish of third so far this season. So we're going to see if we can jump in. Thank you very much. How are we feeling? We're starting in a pretty good position for this race, aren't we? Yeah, it's always good to be in pole position for sure. <laughs> One um, second, please. One second, please. All right, we're just going to let the race director jump in there instead. They've got to tell the drivers just before we start. So then we've also got the number three of Lawrence Herr. He's got a, had a best finish of second for this race for the prototype winter series so far. They've got that all black car. And as Lucas did mention, or Adam did mention in commentary, we have got a change of car. So yesterday the JSP4 was the only entry for the class four and now we have changed that car as Eco Segre is going to be in the Nova instead. We're going to take you on a bit of a further walk down the grid. We've got the number seven. Glenn Van Bello is going to be in that car first today. Obviously, they were the race winners yesterday. And then he will hand over to Danny Sufi. Glenn, we've got a race in the race in the light today. So how's this one going to be for you? Well, um, conditions are slightly different than yesterday. A lot of wind today. Um, so let's see how that turns out with regards to, yeah, we have a lot of headwind on the straight, but tailwind on, on the back straight. So let's see how the balance feels in these conditions, uh, starting from third. So still in for, uh, yeah, for a good race. So looking forward to it. And we saw you guys yesterday had the, um, the sign for Franz, obviously. He's uh, not with us this weekend, a little under the weather. So going to be hoping to make it two for two for Franz, I'm sure. Absolutely. I, I'm sure Franz is watching now. So uh, I would say enjoy it from, uh, from the bad Franz. We're going to make it a, a good race. Best of luck. Thank you for speaking to us. Right, we're going to carry on down the grid. On the right here, we've got the number 71, the o one of the only Novas on the grid. We've now obviously got that second Nova on the grid with Eco Sore switching the cars. That's the number 71 of Kevin Rabin. And then if we just come over, just finally, we're going to highlight this number 80 car. This is possibly my fav favorite livery that I've seen all day. I mean, this is absolutely beautiful, Johnny. If you just get in there, we've got a little bit of a pop art livery there. So that, to me, is the perfect place for us to end this grid walk. Enjoy this race. We're going to go back to Adam. Thank you very much. Yeah, a little bit of pop art, a little bit of spatter art on that uh, livery. Very, very cool car from Gebhardt Motorsport, the number 80 machine of Valentino Catalano. Uh, row, row, whoop, lining up, <laughs> got there eventually, on row three of the grid. Uh, that first row, though, that's a real... Um, that's a real assassin's row, that is. Daniel Karlwitz and Lawrence Herr, two gold-rated drivers, two very quick drivers indeed. And uh, Glenn Van Berlo there as well with Kevin Rabin on the second row as well. I think there's going to be some very rapid stuff in the early going of this prototype wind series race. A reminder, this race is held over 50 minutes plus one lap. And there is a pit stop window from minute 20 to minute 30 of the race. And there are no subclasses here. There is no pro, pro-am, am. What there is instead is a pit stop handicap system. 
Uh, so that will be something we'll talk you through in just a minute, because for now, we'll go to the grid. Daniel Kalvitz is our pole sitter for this race, the Rinaldi Racing number 66 car, alongside Lawrence Herr of DKR Engineering. Glenn Van Berlo is third on the grid in the uh, Ligier from Conrad Motorsport, and Kevin Rabin is in the ANS Motorsport Nova NP02. Valentino Catalano starts fifth on the grid in the number 80 car alongside Clement Moreno in the ANS Motorsport car. Will Stowell will start from seventh on the grid for Molnar Motorsport in their Duquesne. And uh, the ANS Motorsport car number six of Eco Segre is now a uh, Nova MP02 as well. And I'm actually interested to see uh, how Eco's pace fares in that Nova, because he looked quite handy uh, in the JSP4, albeit it is a much slower car on paper uh, than the LMP3s he was fighting. So let's see how he does in the rather stronger Nova NP02. Pit stop handicaps then. It's 148 seconds worth of pit stop for Ecos de Grey, for Sufi and Van Berlo, for Juan Pablo Veja and Will Stowell, for Maxim Dirks and Valentino Catalano, and for Kevin Rabin. Uh, so five cars to have 148 seconds, two minutes and 28 seconds in the pits. That's because they've got silver, silver, or, uh, well, all silver lineups in some fashion. Uh, for John Brownson and Lawrence Herr in the DKR engineering car, it's 119 seconds worth of pit stops. For Steve Paro and Daniel Karlwitz, it's also 119 seconds worth of pit stops. And for Clement Moreno and Julian Lemoyne is the only all bronze layout on the grid, or all bronze lineup on the grid. They have an 86 second delta from pit in to pit out. So pit handicaps will have a significant effect on this motor race. Two formation laps, as has been the protocol for the prototype winter series. Then Daniel Kalvitz will continue to try and get some heat into those tyres. Lawrence Herr, Glenn Van Berlo behind also getting the heat cycles in. Of course, the two dominant manufacturers in LMP3 represented Ligier and Duquesne. There are a total of four tenders out in the world for uh, LMP3 chassis, the other two being Ginetta and Ades. And uh, the next cycle of LMP3 regulations, I understand, kicks into force next year. And uh, that will see quite a significant change. And that will also, of course, see uh, Adess and Ginetta uh, trying to get themselves onto the market once again. Both cars are a little way out of favour with uh, the teams by and large. There were both Gebhardt and Conrad uh, were Ginetta teams, as a matter of fact, but uh, have recently moved on to Ligier and Duquesne, respectively. Daniel Karlwitz, of course, for Rinaldi Racing in one of the Ligier JSP 320s. The Ligier was the uh, the second LMP3 car to appear in the world after the uh, after the Ginetta was the initial LMP3 car uh, in the debut season of the category in 2015. Norma, now Duquesne, followed that. The Duquesne D08 is, uh, I think, largely the car of the second generation. Uh, in LMP3, but there's not much in it between the Ligier and the Duquesnes. They have different strengths and weaknesses. I understand that in the, in the Duquesne, the quickest way is to have the traction control on, uh, quite a low setting, but on, and most of the Ligier drivers do not use traction control, so there's uh, a bit of a, a difference on that front. The Duquesne's slightly less... Uh, sure-footed without the traction control than the Ligier. The uh, electronics on these cars is all standard, so uh, they all are uh, off-the-shelf parts. You see there Eco Segre trying to uh, build some temp in the back of the grid. The second 
of the Nova NP02s. It's going to be very interesting to see how Eco performs in that car. I think he might be quite handy, actually. Kevin Rabin might have his work cut out in the Nova class. He's been uncontested uh, all season in the Novas, but uh, he's now got a bit of competition to deal with in the form of the, uh, the third ANS Motorsport entry. So this time, the cars will go into two by two formation and we are going to have a very exciting fight here between Rinaldi Racing's Daniel Karlwitz and DKR Engineering's Lawrence Ur. Those two are gold rated drivers, very, very fast drivers indeed. And the same goes for Glenn Van Berlo from row two, Kevin Rabin as well on row two could well challenge. The red lights are on. And the lights are off. We go racing, and it's a very good start, actually, from Danny, uh, from Glenn Van Berlo, I should say. Danny Sufi's teammate, but he still sits in third place. Kevin Rabin falls behind Clement Moreno as uh, the DKR engineering car gets the Solano there. And now he's going to have to worry about the other Nova behind him in the form of Eco Segre. Daniel Kalvitz in the slipstream of Lawrence Hurt as they go through the hairpin for the first time. And of course, the tailwind explored for the first time by our drivers. Lawrence Hurt goes wide. Daniel Kalvitz moves into the race lead then. At the completion of lap number one, it's Kalvitz from Hurt, from Van Berlo. Your top three, Van Berlo. Looking to the inside there momentarily into turn one, but decided he wasn't quite close enough yet. Glenn Van Berlo bouncing across the curbs at two and three, right there with Lawrence Hurt. There is so little between silver and gold drivers in the current uh, categorization setup. A quick silver uh, can often outpace a gold. And guys like Glenn Van Berlo and Danny Sufi are living proof of that. Sufi was quicker than both her and Kalvitz at times at Estoril when they went head-to-head -head in the season opener of the prototype winter series. Catalano, Rabin and Segre in fourth, fifth and sixth are pretty close together as well. So we've got battles developing out on the circuit. The top three surging through turn 11 there, as you can see. Kevin Rabin uh, recovering, of course, from his uh, moment on the first lap. There's your leader, Kalvitz. <laughs> a little bit sideways there, all of them getting caught out a little bit. Um, again, the prototype's more aero-dependent, a little bit lighter than the GTs, so uh, the tailwind having a greater effect on on the cars, perhaps uh, stalling the rear wing a little bit, and that was very aggressive there from Kevin Rabin, a very, very tight angle with which he took turn 15. He must have got loose at 14, which I've seen him do before, actually. I was watching him in free practice. He was uh, often having the car step out on him a little bit uh, through turn 15 or through turn 14, I should say. Maybe that's continued on into the race. Car in general looks a little bit unbalanced at the rear through some corners with the current setup. Uh, a big story developing in the pit lane, well spotted by Lucas Gajewski. Apologies that I didn't pick up on this, but Clement Moreno is in the pit lane and uh, is now being lapped by the field. The car had a puncture, so the car spun with a puncture. Now, whether that was then therefore contact or whether the tyre just went down of its own accord, I don't know. But nonetheless, uh, certainly there is uh, something to be said for Clement Moreno's chances, and the chances, unfortunately, are pretty much nil now in the race with him a lap down. So our top three through the corkscrew as we go on to lap three of the motor race. There is Eco Segre getting to grips with this, uh, this Nova MP02. And make no mistake, this is a huge task for Eco Segre, the number six car, to get used to a Nova uh, MP02. It's not a car that uh, has that much familiarity beyond being a prototype. Uh, versus the Ligia GSP4. Different engine, different manufacturer, different just about everything. We saw Van Berlo there getting very squirrely through 13. Losing a bit of time, therefore, to Lawrence Hurt. 
as the top three continue on. Kevin Rabin in the slipstream now of Valentino Catalano in the battle for fourth place. The Nova, oh, and the other Nova of Ico Segre uh, does almost exactly what Kevin Rabin did on the opening lap. Goes wide, goes off the circuit. And so, uh, unfortunately, uh, Ico Segre getting to grips with this car in real time. I don't think he's ever driven it before. He's uh, having some issues there. Is fairly experienced in prototypes in general. Was wait, r was racing a a Norma, an open top Norma CN car uh, in Ultimate Cup last year. Eco Segre, but uh, getting to grips with an entirely new car for the first time in a race environment is is no small ask. Catalana and Rabin still having that scrap, of course, for fourth overall. Kevin Rabin trying to make amends for his uh, earlier issue right there on the back of Catalano in the number 80 car. First, second, third. Run through the corkscrew once again. I hear underneath me Clement Moreno's 42 car firing back into life at long last. So uh, potentially the car will be back out there, yes. But Moreno and Lemoyne are not going to be able to fight for a podium in this race. They'll continue on, I'm sure, but uh, going to have some... Uh, we're going to have uh, quite a lonely race, I think, ultimately. The top three, Snake through 14 and 15 once again. Van Berlo a little bit closer this time for my money. Uh, to Lawrence Herr, of course, not close enough for a move down into turn 16, but still closer as Kevin Rabin is also right there on the back of Va uh, Valentino Catalano. The problem that Rabin has is that uh, with the Nova slightly uh, restricted in this series, uh, it's a bit slower in the straight line than an LMP3 car. So Rabin has a kilometre long straight to contend with before getting to the main overtaking point on the circuit in a car with uh, a lower straight line speed. So it's going to be very tricky uh, for Rabin to find an opportunity to come past Catalano because I don't think the opportunity is ever going to come his way uh, going through turn 16. And in fact, Rabin is coming through the pits. Kevin Rabin is coming through the pit lane. Contact... Uh, between cars 71 and 42 is under investigation at turn five. So that refers to the first lap of the race. And apparently it was Kevin Rabin and Clement Moreno that collided then. And now Rabin is in the pit lane, which would rather suggest to me that much like Clement Moreno, he has some after effects from that battle. And unfortunately... That means that all of our ANS cars have had a bit of a trouble so far in this race. It also means uh, that that battle for fourth place has come to an end. Uh, front bodywork was loose on Kevin Rabin's car, I'm being told by Lucas Gajewski. And you can see the rear bodywork uh, on uh, the LMP3 of Moreno is missing as well. So ANS Motorsport friendly fire, I think, uh, potentially. Uh, that contact will be in under investigation. As the top three continue to fight there, Glenn Van Berlo loose coming out of turn 15. You heard Glenn referring to uh, Franz Conrad. We hope you're watching along, Franz. We hope you're doing nicely, uh, recovering from your accident. We hope to see you in the paddock again soon. Daniel Karlwitz, our race leader then for Rinaldi. DKR Engineering second, Conrad Motorsport in third. Two Ligiers and a Duquesne. Uh, in the top three. Two Germans and a Dutchman in the top three. Kalvitz and Lawrence Herr, Glenn Van Berlo is the Dutch racer. Coming into this weekend, Van Berlo's co-pilot, Danny Sufi, who's of course been here all year. Well, this is uh, Van Berlo's first weekend. Sufi was second in the championship. He is now our championship leader after yesterday with uh, Sandra Holtzum not present this weekend.
Just over 10 minutes of the race in the books. And Sufi will be watching on uh, down there in the pit lane. And as Glenn Van Berlo continues on his way, he will have been watching the races earlier on. He will be afoot of the uh, challenges regarding this tailwind down the back end of the circuit. By the way, if you are consuming a beverage every time I say tailwind, your doctor would advise you to stop. It is something that's going to come up a few more times before the end of the broadcast. Calvitt, Her, and Van Berlo out onto turn 15. This straight is so spectacular. If you I'll actually dip out of it if I can, see if you can hear them approaching. Don't quite get the full effect there because of the wind, but um, on a clear day in particular, you can hear every uh, every moment, every mechanical part, every movement of the car all the way down from 15 to 16, down that long straight. It's an incredible place to watch these cars. Of course, the prototypes in particular are uh, sonorous beasts. We've had an issue there for Will Stowell, potentially. I think just going wide rather than having a, a full-blown spin. Remains in fifth place to Stowell. Of course, Mulner Motorsport have been shuffling up their, their lineup from weekend to weekend as they continue their driver shootouts to determine who gets a free seat in their uh, summer campaign in Prototype Cup Germany. Will Stowell is one of the contenders. Eco Segre in sixth position, preparing for a season in the Ligier European Series in the JSP4. Sadly, he's not in the JSP4 anymore, of course, uh, courtesy of the issues that the Ligier faced yesterday. He's now in that Nova MP02, and at the end of the race, you might want to race that one instead. I've heard the Novas are pretty cool cars to drive. I also heard Kevin Rabin's engine firing up below me. And yes, indeed, Rabin exits back out onto the circuit, as we saw there. So Kevin Rabin is back on the track. Here come our race leaders as well. Daniel, uh, rather, no, sorry, here comes Clement Moreno across the line too. Here's our race leaders. Uh, the battle for the lead still very, very close indeed. Just over a second in it between the top three. And I understand that Rabin and Moreno have actually come out on the same lap. So uh, funny enough, uh, Rabin and Moreno, the two cars that make contact with each other, may yet go wheel to wheel again, uh, which could be interesting. Calvitz, Her and Van Berlo into turn one then. A little more conservative with the uh, cut of the corner at turn one than some of our GT drivers were earlier on. Of course, these prototypes with a lot less give uh, than the GTs. A, a much stiffer chassis, of course, carbon tub and less suspension travel as well. So if you're uh, taking bites out of the curb, you are definitely feeling it. Which is good business if you're a physiotherapist, but not good business if you're a racing driver who uh, needs your back to last. 1.4 seconds was the gap last time by, as I think someone was going for a jog there. The top three running towards turn 11 at the moment. And onwards to turn 12. Bit of a slide there from Lawrence Hurt of DKR Engineering. Straight on there from Carl Witz. Almost. Didn't get a good run through 14 and 15. But then again, Lawrence Hur struggled to get the power down as well. These LMP3 cars are a knife-edge car, I think. Potentially even more so than the LMP2s above them in the prototype hierarchy. Oh, very challenging cars indeed. We've seen a few drivers hop into them directly 
as their first step into motorsport over the years because, of course, well, they're a prototype. They look like they could race at the Le Mans 24 hours. Of course, they do race uh, in the Le Mans 24 hours on the road to Le Mans race, the kind of uh, precursor event to the LM24 itself. And so drivers will hop in as their first step in major racing and uh, often find themselves maybe slightly under-equipped uh, for the task at, uh, task at hand. The MP3 cars are feisty beasts. Just 1.7 seconds between our top three at the line. It's fluctuating really between uh, Karlwitz and Van Berlo. Lawrence here is almost like a ping pong ball being pushed between the two of them. Sometimes he's closer to Karlwitz, sometimes Van Berlo is closer to him. have just three minutes and 40 seconds until the pit window opens here so not long until we'll start to see the face of the race change although uh, one would expect that Karlwitz and her will certainly be out there um, till almost the end of the pit window because of course they are the gold drivers of a gold bronze lineup and typically the bronze driver will uh, let their man stay out there to give themselves as good of a cushion as they can. And of course, that's going to be the big thing as well with this lead battle is that uh, while the pit stop length for the top two cars is 1 minute 59 seconds because they've got a, a slightly less pacey driver getting into the car after this, in the case of... Uh, case of Glenn Van Berlo and Danny Sufi, they're going to be in for 2 minutes and 28 seconds. So there's a, a 29 second gap that is going to form in theory uh, between Sufi and the two cars currently ahead of his number 7 Conrad car. But we've seen Sufi uh, fight back to the lead up against the bronzes before with the handicap system. He's going to have to perform a similar trick this time. Really interesting to see the combination of Van Berlo and Sufi. Not a combination I'd ever considered, but certainly one that works well. And uh, you heard Danny Sufi mention it in one of his interviews this weekend. He's uh, raced this car. Or rather, Glenn Van Berlo has raced this car, or raced a LMP3 car at this circuit before which is, of course, very useful information for, uh, for Danny to lean on. But, Lanny, uh, but Danny has uh, really been getting to grips with Motorland Aragon quickly. Will be a force to be reckoned with in the second phase of the race. Ken Van Berlo there with a bit of a four-wheel drift through Turn 12. Lawrence Herr a lot closer this time to the back of Daniel Karlwitz. I think Calvert's got a slightly better run out of turn 15. Of course, DKR Engineering have had a slightly different driver lineup in all three rounds of Prototype Wind Series so far. Gebhardt Motorsport, it's of course their debut in the Prototype Wind Series with Valentino Catalano at the wheel of their new Duquesne. I think this is, if I'm not mistaken, the first appearance of the Duquesne with Gebhardt Motorsport. Good to see the long-standing Gebhardt team with us in the prototype winter series. Kevin Rabin has come back into pit lane, so evidently Rabin feels there's something rather more sinister than just loose bodywork going on with the car after his collision with Clement Moreno. So we'll see uh, whether Rabin heads back out onto the circuit. He's already a good couple of laps down, so I just wonder whether or not they'll make him continue or not. Of course, he is actually a factor in the championship battle as well. When you 
are driving alone in your class, if you're the only car in your class, you're still scoring some points, not as many as people with more competition in the class, but with the way the championship is structured, he has been consistently scoring some points. So he might well be wanting to continue, but it doesn't look like the car is wanting to continue. I think ANS Motorsports are calling it a weekend for Kevin Rabin this particular Nova Proto. Our top three then down the main straight. It is pit window open for the first time. I don't suspect we'll see the top two in. Will we see Glenn Van Berlo? I suspect he'll stay out there for a little while longer. Sure enough, he does stay out there for a little while longer. Lawrence Hur is a lot closer now to Daniel Kalvitz. It was 0.8 of a second at the line between Kalvitz and her. It's now probably three tenths. So what's going on with Kalvitz? Does he have a problem because that car is slowing? Lawrence Her dived up the inside. Are both cars still there? Yes, but uh, Kalvitz lost a lot of time in the first corner or so of the lap. I didn't notice him make an obvious mistake, but uh, I must admit I was looking at three different screens at once at the time. <laughs> One car is into the pit lane for a scheduled stop, and that's Eco Segre in the Nova MP02. Uh, the car that was originally entered as a Ligier JSP4, they've taken out the spare Nova. It's now the only Nova remaining in the race, so Eco Segre, as long as he gets the flag, should secure a class win. There's Van Berlo through 13 hear the sound of these LMP3 cars reverberating off that wall at uh, uh, 12 and 13. There is Eco Segre's car. Eco, as a silver driver on his own, has to stop for full two minutes and 28 seconds. Be a, a small stop for him. Top three come past our pit lane again. And all three cars do go by, so no pit stops made on this occasion. Eco in discussion there with the ANS team, the activity Nicolas Schatz. Motorsport team. Quite a leisurely pit stop, this, and it's one that's been going on for a minute and 45 seconds, so he's still got another 30 seconds or so before he has to get out of the pit lane. Two minutes and 29, two minutes and 28 is the total time of this pit stop for him. Our videographer Emilio primed and ready to get some tyres spinning, I think, uh, in the back of shots as well. If you followed the Instagrams of the various winter series, you'll have seen his handiwork throughout. And Danny Bier again, also there as well. Our, our compact but very efficient uh, winter series media team. What's the other leg of that media team? Would be Alpha Live, We're bringing these live pictures here this weekend and all throughout the season. There goes Eco Segre in the ANS Motorsport car. I do love the sound of that uh, Ford V8 five litre motor. You see there the missing bodywork on the 42. Clement Moreno from the collision that we understand took place with Kevin Rabin. This car running a good couple of laps off the uh, off the boil at this point, unfortunately, for Moreno and Lemoyne. So, unless lightning strikes in a most peculiar fashion, we will not see a repeat of the uh, race victory at Portimao. 
course, we've spoken before about the uh, about the effect of the safety car at Portimao on the pit handicap system. Of course, uniquely to this series, the prototype wind series, there is a, uh, a full course yellow option as well. Our other categories, there isn't the option for race control to throw a full course yellow, uh, but there is a full course yellow code 60 option with this category. So for future reference, if there is another situation with a car off track that could hinder the pit window, there is also the option of a full course yellow if a safety car isn't absolutely necessary. Uh, so that could preserve uh, races for the future on that front. There goes Moreno. Meanwhile, our leading cars are just behind, going through... Uh, same section of 12, 13, 14, 15 as we speak. Molna Motorsport have the 18 car in. Juan Pablo Vega will take over. In the number 18 car, the Colombian racer who has a background in some uh, radical uh, competition in South America. He was racing a, an SR3 for a while in a, I think it was a Colombian Endurance Series that he was racing in with uh, saloon cars and sports cars on the same grid. A spectacular mix of TCR machinery and prototypes. Our top three have crossed the line yet again, so once more, no one is electing to pit just yet. However, they will all have to next time by. So our top three cars are all going to be in this time. And I note that Eco, is this Kevin Rabin actually, or is it Eco Segre? But the Nova is heading back out there. Okay, so Kevin Rabin rejoins the race in the 71 car. Bean will head back out there onto the circuit and uh, try and salvage some points out of the race if he can. You see that the uh, Catalano car is in as well, the Gebhardt Motorsport machine, which will now be handed over to Maxime Dirix, the Belgian racer. And meanwhile, our top three will all be coming in this time as Clement Moreno exits pit lane, our top three will all pit this time. You hear them heading down the back straight as we speak and uh, Carl Vitzer and Van Berlo will hand over to Steve Paro, John Brownson and Danny Sufi respectively. Conrad Motorsport have to stop the car for they have to uh, take 148 seconds from pit in to pit out. Meanwhile, Carlbitz and her handing over to Brownson and Paro only have to take a minute and 59 from pit in to pit out. So there is certainly a disparity there. And see if you will have some work to do. An interesting note there, you heard from the onboard, the timer doesn't work. I don't see anything on the timer, says Maxime Dirix. Well, they're two minutes into the stop right now, so they've got another 29 seconds before they need to go. Our top three are all into the pit lane as anticipated. There's also a yellow flag at turn 11, and it's for the 42 car. Julian Lemoyne has come a cropper at, well, it says turn 11, but I think that's turn 12 in the gravel. Unfortunately, the number 42 car is beached. Now, as I alluded to, there is the option of a full course yellow to preserve the pit stop handicaps. We'll see if that gets utilized. Okay. Uh, the top three are 
all into pit lane. Danny Sufi installing himself as we speak. Ben Van Berlo already out of the car. In the next few seconds, Lawrence Hurt and Daniel Kalvitz's cars now in the hands of Paro and Brownson will exit the pit lane. In fact, we'll see it here. As uh, well, actually, it'll be very interesting to see this whether or not uh, Paro comes out ahead of Brownson, who's rolling down the pits as we speak. Where is Brownson? Brownson has just exited, and his stop was exactly two minutes. Meanwhile, Steve Paro comes out two minutes and five seconds. So. Steve Paro has been cost about five seconds there. He has to now go and pursue John Brownson. Oh, get the car going, Danny. Danny Sufi gets underway as well. His stop needs to be 2.29 as he rolls down there. I think he'll be within that margin quite nicely. Uh, the stall obviously will add a couple of seconds and sure enough, he crosses the time delta at 2.33. So yes, he was four seconds over what he needed to be, which means that he's got a, a slightly higher mountain to climb now. He'll be something in the region of 35 seconds off John Brownson, but he will be several seconds per lap faster. So this is where it becomes a handicap race. This is where Sufi has to try and work some magic. Kevin Rabin does his mandatory pit stop as well. He was already uh, in the pits a good couple of times. They're trying to push the 42 car back onto the circuit under local yellows, but I have my doubts about the, uh, the chances of that happening. We'll see whether the full course yellow is utilised then to neutralise the race without the requirement of a safety car. whether they will determine that it needs a safety car. And uh, Julian Lemoyne now being spoken to by the marshal down there at turn 12. Let's see the gap then between John Brownson and Steve Paro. They'll be coming across the line momentarily. It will be Brownson, our race leader. He crosses the line now. In fact, Steve Paro has come out ahead of John Brownson. Okay, Brownson had a slow, slow first lap, and he's already lost out to Steve Paro. So Steve Paro is your race leader. 3.2 seconds clear at the front of the order. Paro was momentarily behind John Brownson out there on the circuit, but our race leaders, the 66 and the 3 car, have swapped out there on circuit. This, therefore, is your leader, Steve Paro. Brownson seems to be struggling in the early stages in the DKR Engineering Duquesne. Through 10 and 11 he goes. And the gap between Paro and Sufi is 24 seconds. That is not a particularly massive hunk of time, it must be said. Paro through 14 and 15. I know that, of course, on paper, 24 seconds is a lot. But uh, Sufi is very, very fast. And we'll have to see what the relative lap times are between Paro and Sufi to work out uh, how possible this is. Paro will be laser focused. Full course yellow in 10 seconds. Full course yellow. is now active out on the circuit. We are under full course yellow. However, I think Paro just caught the message because uh, he is now slowed down. However, that was a very long 10 seconds. So whether or not it took slightly longer for the FCY to be declared or whether 
Para was late to, to hit the limiter. I'm not quite certain, but uh, Para definitely continued on for a little while there. And FCY was already on the board, so I have to see whether that gets looked into. But Paro continues on as our race leader then. The race is neutralized with everyone on their limiters. And you saw Kevin Rabin coasting, or is that Eco Sacre? I can't actually tell uh, which of the two Novas that is. Very similar liveries. That's Eco Sacre. in the number six car. Funny enough, they were testing this car earlier in the week. I don't think they're expecting to press it into race service though. So the car is craned onto the tarmac and will then continue on. Le Moyne and Moreno may well press on anyway to try and get some points in the championship. But certainly a significant delay. They're telling him to go, but that hinges on the fact that the car is still fired. Thankfully it is. It can be very difficult sometimes to get these cars fired back up in LMP3, but thankfully fired up it now is and that means that probably within the next hmm, 30 seconds or so we should have the full course yellow lifted of course the gaps on screen aren't representative with the cars coasting in this manner end of full course yellow in 10 seconds so they will return to racing speed and as they cross the line this time we'll get a a look at the deltas and the telling te the telling thing will be the gap between Paro and Sufi which was 24 seconds on the previous lap of course Sufi is a quicker driver and would have probably narrowed it down something like 20 seconds maybe 21 uh, before full course yellow was put out there and if Paro has suddenly got a bigger lead that maybe suggests that he was uh, it was a bit slow to hit the full course yellow limiter. We'll see. Steve Parrow passes uh, the recovering Julian Lemoyne, who I thought was limping back to the pits, but I think he actually just didn't get the memo that FCY had ended. Parrow then presses on as Lemoyne enters the pits. That might be a definitive visit to the pit lane then for Lemoyne. Steve Parrow has crossed the line then as our leader. John Brownson of DKR Engineering will be next across the line. 15 seconds back from our leader. Now, where is Danny Sufi? Something tells me Sufi is a long way further back. And again, that would tell me that perhaps Steve Paro was a bit slow to serve his FCY. And sure enough, Sufi's gap is now 32 seconds to Steve Paro, which is probably about 10 seconds more than it was before full course yellow. So then, they're looking over the 42 car. Perhaps the driver is suggesting that uh, something went wrong with the car, more so than himself. It certainly seem to be running some diagnostics, uh, at least doing some checks on the car. But they also seem to think it will get back out there. You see the lollipop man at the front of the car, and sure enough, the engine cover is going back on. The number 41, number 42, Ligier, GSP320 will head back out onto the circuit. A turbulent race for all of the ANS Motorsport entries. Meanwhile, 
Danny Sufi will be closing in fairly quickly on John Brownson. Be interested to see how quickly Sufi is closing in on Brownson. I don't think it'll be too long at all before uh, John is under threat. Uh, Sufi was 16 seconds back. He is now 10 seconds back, so Sufi gaining at a rate of knots in the battle for second place. Meanwhile, drive-through penalties are being handed out. One to this car, the number 18 of Juan Pablo Vega for mandatory pit stop infringement. That usually means a short stop, and it does indeed mean a short stop here as well. Two minutes, 25 seconds was the length of their stop, so they were three seconds shy of uh, the correct stop length, and that means a drive-through penalty for them. There's also a drive-through penalty for the car behind, the 71 of Kevin Rabin. Uh, Rabin for causing a collision with the 42 car, the sister ANS motorsport machine, the Ligier, of uh, Clement Moreno, as it was at the time on lap number one of the race. So a few drive-throughs have been dished out. Meanwhile, Danny Sufi, at a rate of knots, is closing in on John Brownson in the battle for second place. The number three, DKR Engineering Duquesne. is the car in uh, second place right now. I love that it spent the season in plain carbon fibre with a little orange tip on the nose. It's a very uh, pre-season testing livery. I hope they keep it on the car forever because uh, a bare carbon race car is just a very cool thing. There is the number three. A bit deep into turn 16 and Danny Sufi who had a 10 second gap on Brownson moments ago. We'll cross the line this time. I reckon something like three and a half, four seconds behind. You heard him just behind. Yes, there's Danny Sufi right behind Brownson. And that will be a battle before the end of the lap because six seconds a lap is the rate of close between Brownson and Sufi. So Sufi is very soon going to be taking second place so long as John Brownson uh, gives him a way by, which he has no obligation to do, he can fight Danny Sufi, but we'll see how easy it is made by the driver of the number three car. There is Brownson, the 70-year-old American racer. And the much younger American racer, Danny Sufi, is right there with him as they approach the Corks group. As they go down through 9 and 10, I suspect we may already have a move on. Yes, indeed, Sufi to the inside at turn 10. And he will be passed by the time they come over the crest of the hill at turn 11. There goes Sufi then up into second place. Sufi now has something in the realm of 20 seconds to make up on Steve Parrow. He's got six minutes. Oh, Parrow, as we speak, has a spin. He gets the car going again very quickly, but that is going to be a six or seven seconds that he cannot afford to lose. I was just going to say that it's going to be tight margins as to whether Sufi can close in on Steve Parrow in time. And that makes the task significantly easier for Danny Sufi. It's still a big mountain to climb. It's going to be something in the realm of 15, 16 seconds. It is 14.6. The timing screen now confirms as Sufi crosses the line. However... That is doable for someone as quick as Danny. Steve Parrow's times have been around two minutes. Meanwhile, the times for Danny Sufi have been in the 54s, the 55s. It's going to be close run, but Sufi has the potential to do it. Of course, it's five minutes plus one lap critically as well. Brownson has now dropped down to third place then, and he won't be 
liable to challenge much from there. We've got side by side, albeit not for position, between Juan Pablo Vega and Kevin Rabin. And interestingly, Vega there allows Rabin through. I think Rabin passed him rather than the opposite way round. Rabin, the quicker of the two, albeit as you can see on screen, some eight laps down after the various issues for the ANS car. There's Sufi. Once again, performing the task he's had to do on numerous other occasions, and that is pursue a bronze driver with a cushion. And Juan Pablo Vega actually must have had an issue because he's come into... Ah, no, he's serving his uh, drive-through penalty. So Juan Pablo Vega in the Molda Motorsports 18 car is serving his drive-through at present as Steve Bar Harrow powers out of 17 and 18. With 3 minutes 55 on the clock, I think there will be three laps to go in this one. So three laps for Paro to hold off Danny Sufi. And the gap is just 9.1 seconds. Again, it's going to be close run, but I think Sufi can do that. The last lap for Paro was a 2 minute point two. The last lap for Sufi, a 154.7. Sufi going great guns then in the number seven. Paro in the 66 doing a solid job, but has he, has Daniel Karlwitz done enough? Will that spin towards the end of the race prove to be the undoing of the Rinaldi Racing Team's bid for a win? Nico Segre down into turn number 16, running fifth overall. Again, I'm pretty impressed by how quickly he's uh, figured out this uh, Nova NP02. He's on course for a winning class, and his pace is actually about equivalent to what we were seeing out of uh, Kevin Rabin as well, actually. The best lap for... Uh, Rabin is a 55-1. He's been driving that car all year. The best lap for Eco Segre, a 55-4, which is actually just set. Um, so Eco is really quite on it. Um, I imagine that Nicolas Schatz is going to pull him over for a word later on, the team boss of ANS Motorsport, and say, do you not want to race one of these things again? <laughs> there is Julian Lemoyne in seventh place. Right on board with him as they approach the final corner. That's John Brownson ahead of him, I think. Yes, it is. So Lemoyne is closing in on Brownson, but of course it's eight laps between them. Danny Sufi, meanwhile, is going to be on Steve Paro any minute. The lead is going to change within the next few moments, I suspect, because Danny Sufi is now just three and a half seconds back from Steve Paro. The gap has shrunk massively yet again, and by the end of the lap, I would suspect, Steve Paro is going to be right there with Danny Sufi. Or rather, well, yes, Danny Sufi will be right there with Steve Paro, is what I should probably say. The gap that was three and a half seconds is now tenths as they go through the corkscrew. And for Sufi and Van Berlo, that took the overall win yesterday, they could be moments away from securing it yet again. Turn 12 awaits, and who will be there first? It's Danny Sufi. Danny Sufi is up into the lead in the number seven Conrad Motorsport car. Powers out of turn 15 as the race leader just needs to manage it from here. The clock will hit zero before he crosses the line, so we will enter the final lap next time by. We are on the penultimate lap of the motor race. Sufi locks up a little bit there into turn 16, just to make sure Franz is still awake at home. <laughs> Danny Sufi coming on to the final lap of the race then. 
with an advantage over Steve Paro. Valiant effort from Paro, but uh, that last bit of lost time with the spin may have cost him a chance at fighting. We do have a fight going on between John Brownson and Julian Lemoyne. Not for position, no, but uh, seems like they're really getting into it with each other. Lemoyne has been hounding the back of Brownson for the last couple of laps. Of course, Brownson running third overall. Lemoyne having a look to the inside. I suppose Julian's attitude is, I paid for this. <laughs> I'm paid for my track time. I'm going to use it, and I'm going to have some fun while I'm at it. Through three and four, they go. Brownson seems to be taking part in this as well. I don't know if Brownson is aware that he's not fighting for position, but uh, certainly fighting they are. I saw Lemoyne there just having a speculative look to the inside. Good fun to see the cars running in close quarters, even if it's not for position. Interesting to see the comparison between our series regular Lemoyne and series debutant John Brownson as well. Series regular and championship leader Danny Sufi heads down the back straight for the final time then. Conrad Motorsport team. Oh dear, as John Brownson has a moment there. So in the battle for pride, Julian Lemoyne will come out on top, but John Brownson will still secure an overall podium. But for Danny Sufi and the Conrad Motorsport team, for the first time, it's a 100% record in the weekend. Two wins from two. Danny Sufi stamps his authority on the prototype winter series and puts a hand and four fingers on the championship trophy with a race win here at Motorland Aragon. He secures it by 10 seconds over Steve Paro. Paro finishes in second place. John Brownson will cross the line in third in the number three car, rather apropos. Good job is the verdict from uh, the Conrad Motorsport wall. As Glenn Van Berlo gets his embraces from the team. Brownson has crossed the line in third place. Fourth place will go to Maxime Dirix then. There is Maxime in the number 80, just 45 seconds off by the end. Of course, he was struggling with the uh, pit stop timer not working during the stop. Ika Segre in fifth place. Juan Pablo Vega will take sixth as well. And there is uh, Kevin Rabin across the line to round out the order after his uh, numerous dramas. There's Ika Segre to take fifth place. The driver that expected to drive a Ligier JSP4 today instead wins in the Nova category, which is a, a jolly good showing from him. Juan Pablo Vega will be the last man across the line to round out the prototype winter series element of this weekend. I think we're expecting some more interesting entries into the uh, Barcelona finale. Grand finale weekend here at uh, the Winter Series paddock. It'll be our final road trip together as, as a paddock, all running down to Barcelona, running southeast back to the coast for exciting racing action at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia. <laughs> Sufi has to light up the tyres at least once on the inlap. <laughs> and uh, he and Glenn Van Berlo will no doubt spray the champagne and have some fun at the end of a very exciting race weekend. Pulls in to the pit lane, does the number seven. He's being told to come a little further forward. does so now. And 
Another result then for Conrad Motorsport and Sufi. I don't think they've mathematically won the championship just yet uh, with Kevin Rabin, Lemoyne and Moreno both scoring solid points across the weekend. But um, certainly things are very much in the young Americans' favour when it comes to the title. Conrad Motorsport haven't put a foot wrong this weekend in the prototype winter series. About as good as it gets. Glenn Van Berlo performed very well in the opening stint against Kalvitz and Lawrence Hurt. And then despite the handicap, Danny Sufi dragged the race back into their clutches and secured a race victory. Sufi will be getting himself shaken up and uh, take the helmet off and then we'll likely hear from him with Izzy Browning who I saw stationed there ready to interview our race winners and uh, again a perfect weekend from Conrad Motorsport and I'm sure uh, Franz is uh, as we heard in bed watching along and we hope to see him again in a paddock very soon as uh, he recovers and uh, our well wishes to him and our congratulations once more to Sufi and Van Berlo. Also as well to Paro and Calvitz. They put in a very good performance as well. But let's pop down to Izzy Browning with our winner. Yeah, I'm down here with Danny Sufi and Glenn Van Berlo, our winners once again. It's been a good weekend for you guys. I spoke to you before the race and you said it was possible, but that was mighty impressive. You must be really happy with that. No, thank you very much. Yeah, it was, it was a fun race. Glenn uh, absolutely killed it in the first stint. Uh, it was a bit tricky with the wind, but yeah, he was still rapid. Uh, handed the car over to me and, you know, the goal was, you know, keep pushing, but no mistakes. So, yeah, clean racing and uh, try and chase down the front too, and we managed to do it. So you have a little moment in the pit lane with your heart kind of uh, in your mouth a little bit. Yeah, I was like, ah, oh, this doesn't help. This doesn't help. I was like, this is amateur hour. But no, it's uh, uh, we made it up. This wasn't a big deal, even with the full course yellow. I was a bit worried about that. Um, but luckily it was it was swift. You know, the marshals uh, got it clean and yeah, we got it done. Didn't matter in the end then. Glenn, just coming to you. I mean, your first weekend in the Winter Series paddock. So been a pretty good one, it's fair to say. How was your stint out there? Yeah, it was a tricky one, especially because of the wind that uh, was quite heavy. Um, in addition to that, we couldn't use the quality tires, so we had to use quite old tires from free practice uh, because the quality tires had a big flat spot. Uh, so that made it a bit more complicated, but nevertheless, uh, yeah, Danny did a really good job to uh, overtake the others uh, into P1. Um, car was good and yeah, I think couldn't be a better weekend. So big thanks to, uh, to everyone from Conrad. And are we going to see you in Barcelona as well? Not in Barcelona, fortunately. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, no, in uh, Barcelona, the job will be uh, for, uh, for Danny only. So uh, yeah, hopefully he does uh, the same as this weekend. You're on your own next weekend then? No, I'm going to miss it. I was great working with him. Yeah, you yeah. guys have been great today and yesterday, actually, all weekend. You've been absolutely fantastic. We'll let you get off to the podium. Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our race one and race two winners, Glenn Van Berlo and Danny Sufi. It's been a perfect weekend. As Adam said, Conrad Motorsport haven't put a foot wrong. They're going to head up to the podium and we're going to see all the replays from that race once again from Adam Weller. Thank you very much, Izzy. Let's run through the results quickly then. Danny Sufi for Conrad Motorsport, claiming the win by 10 seconds ultimately over Steve Paro and Daniel Karlwitz. Lawrence Herr and John Brownson taking third place. Maxime Dirichs taking fourth position. Eco Segre in fifth place uh, on his own. Juan Pablo Vega and Will Stoll taking sixth place. Lemoyne and Moreno seventh after their contact with the eighth place finisher, Kevin Rabin. So then that was the prototype Winter Series race. We now take a little bit of a look back at some of the moments from that one. It was Lawrence Hur uh, around the outside for the lead in the early stages. But very quickly, we saw uh, one car in a spin. That was uh, Clement Moreno. Contact, as we found out, with Kevin Rabin. Rabin in a spin early on as well, or in a sideways moment earlier on. In fact, no, sorry, that is uh, Segre's sideways moment too. Very similar moments at turn 15 for the two Novas. Uh, Lemoyne ended up in the gravel at one point once he took over the 42 car. 
And uh, Steve Paro from the race lead had a bit of a spin with about a quarter of an hour left to go. And that was the... Uh, the last piece of the puzzle for Danny Sufi. He would have more than likely got to the rear of Steve Parrow regardless. Uh, but Sufi, on the charge, managed to get past the 66 and took the Conrad Motorsport Ligier home to another victory in the Prototype Winter Series. So double delight across the weekend for Conrad Motorsport. Glenn Van Berlo will step aside once more now and uh, watch on from home next weekend as Danny Sufi races solo uh, to try and secure his championship, something which I he could well do in the first race of the weekend if all things go well. He's uh, mathematically a long way clear of everybody else. I don't think he will have quite secured the title this time, but he will be... As I said, as he crossed the line at the end, one hand and four fingers on the title. He just needs to wrap that thumb around the handle and he will be champion. And Sufi and Van Berlo will be on the top step in a few moments, of course, with the inimitable Lukas Gajewski as uh, we get ready for the next race as well, which is going to be Euro Cup 3. And I think... Based on what we've seen from these from these races so far today, the wind seems to have only gotten worse. And of course, it was the Euro Cups that went out there this morning as the kind of guinea pigs of it all and uh, found out just how blowy it was out there and just how much of an effect it was having in 12 and 16. Um, so we'll have to see if it's more of the same uh, in the race to come. Here at Motorland Aragon, certainly if you look at those, uh, if you look at those flags around the paddock, they are um, uh, flapping rather freely, rather uncontrollably. It's 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 gone from that majestic flapping in the breeze to the uncontrolled, um, looks like it's about to fall off its flagpole kind of thing. Uh, unfortunately, today here at Motorland Aragon. But. Uh, Another successful weekend of the Prototype Wind Series. Of course, one of two new series this year in the Giedlik Paddock, along with the GT4s, which have separated away uh, from the main GT Winter Series. And uh, it has meant a greater focus on the classes, on the different specs of car can be paid to in each race. And that is... Uh, that is brilliant to see because there were so many great battles in GT4 last year in the GT Wind Series. And frankly, we never saw them on the couple of live streams that we did. We've now got full season live streaming and we have the ability to focus on the fabulous racing that we get each and every weekend in at the GT4 class. And then, of course, with the prototypes, we saw the occasional LMP3 entered into GT Winter Series, but they've now got their own home. Uh, the cooperation with the ACO means that we don't clash with the Asian Le Mans Series, which has its uh, season close in February. It means that uh, teams can conceivably race in both. Drivers can conceivably race in both, which is definitely a big boost going forward. Lucas Gajewski is down there with a the full quota of drivers. So let's waste no more time and go down to the podium. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Adam Weller. It's time for the last podium for this weekend as far as the prototype Winter Series is concerned, ahead of the big season finale next weekend in Barcelona. So I'm going to clear the balcony and call our LMP3 winners onto the stage first of all. And in third place in LMP3 for DKR Engineering, it's Laurence and John Brownson. In second place for Rinaldi Racing, Daniel Keilwitz and Steve Paro. And your winners for Konrad Motorsports, Glenn van Berlo and Danny Sufi. And of course, because it's the last race of the weekend, it's time for the champagne.
Great stuff. Thank you very much to all the crews in Prototype Winter Series and in the LMP3 class. Of course, we are very excited for the uh, big, big showdown next weekend in Barcelona. However, of course, before we do that, we have plenty of more racing coming and another podium because, as always in Prototype Winter Series, it's multi-class racing. Fabulous machinery running in there next to the LMP3 car class with Class N and the Nova cars. Two cars starting and we are very happy to welcome one driver onto the highest step of the podium who wasn't even supposed to race in Class N switched the car after yesterday's race one. So please welcome your Class N winner onto the highest step of the podium for ANS Motorsport, Iko Segre. And just in time, Kevin Rubin is here to finish second on the podium just as well. So big round of applause for Kevin just as well. <laughs> we had to find him downstairs in the pit lane, but he just made it in time. So thank you very much to Jan from the Gatelich Racing Organization as they are presenting the trophies to our top two finishers in Class N. With the uh, photos being collected from Daniel Bergen, our championship photographer, and some more photographers downstairs in the pits as well. And I can see the uh, Euro Cup three cars not yet. Guys, give me a second before you do the champagne. Let's have a word on the podium. Uh, Iko, what an interesting story. You weren't even supposed to race in the class N car and now you're on the highest step of the podium. How was your experience today? Yeah, exactly. I don't know what to say. I mean, yesterday had pretty bad day with a problem in the LMP4. Last minute, we decided to uh, change the car. It was possible, so with no practice, I still managed to do quite a good time. But uh, yeah, good day. Better than yesterday. That's great to hear. Thank you very much, Iko. And of course, uh, Kevin, I can imagine not the best day for, for you, I would be guessing. But still, it's a podium, it's a bottle of champagne. So uh, I hope you're still quite happy with your weekend. Yeah, of course. Uh, the first race was uh, really good. But uh, this, uh, this race, I had a crash with my teammates. I'm not really uh, happy about it. And uh, it's all my fault. And uh, I have the responsibilities to uh, assume it. But uh, very uh, congratulations to Eco because it's not uh, it's not easy to go into another car in one day. So yeah, really congratulations to him. But yeah, thank you very much, Kevin. There's your champagne. I'm gonna clear the podium in a hurry. So thank you very much and big round of applause. Your class and top two finishers, Kevin Rabin and Eco Zegre. Thank you very much. And. <laughs> As the two are leaving the podium, it's time. Oh, there we go. There is the champagne bottle being opened from Kevin. So thank you very much to our class and guys just as well. And it's another set of races coming up this afternoon. The single seaters are back on the circuit. Euro Cup 3 is next. So let's head down to the grid. Thank you very much, Lucas. Yes, the Euro Cup three cars are already down there. I'm sure in the next few moments we will hop down to Izzy and uh, get some insight from the pre-grid, but it is going to be a very compelling continuation of the earlier Euro Cup three race. Valeria Rinchella, the race winner from earlier, is on pole, and Izzy Browning is there nearby. Uh, just some audio issues there. We'll try to go back to Izzy in a moment. But as you could see there, the wind is only worsening. And uh, she will no doubt be as chilly as some of the drivers are as well. I can't imagine it's a pleasant experience to even just sit in the cockpit of a race car uh, down there uh, at the moment with things as they are. Uh, the, I think, three-minute board has just been put out there uh, on the circuit. So uh, they will be out there shortly. One car has just come out of a pit lane spot. I think that could have been Theodore Jensen uh, in the number 30 car that just came past my commentary position. So we've got at least one car starting from the grid, uh, from the grid, from the pits by the seams of it. 
And we'll see whether we do end up going back down to the grid or not. But uh, for now, uh, Valerio Rinicella, as uh, I mentioned, is our race winner from earlier. He is also our pole sitter from this race. He'll be alongside Christian Ho, of course, was our pole sitter in race number one. So Christian uh, will be lining up for Campos Racing from second and hoping for a slightly better run of things this time. Segrera in third place uh, for MP Motorsport uh, is there as well, the 25 car. Segrera, who of course led for a while uh, in race one, he'll be looking to try and lead and win on this occasion. And Noah Lyle will be looking to not get taken out at turn 16. That's the fate that befell him uh, as drivers got to grips with the headwind issues. Uh, Izzy is back down there, so let's uh, try and go back there now. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. I think it's even windier than a few seconds ago. We are very, very, very close to uh, getting started. I can see the one minute board about to come up. But as Adam said, we've got our race one winner on Paul Valerio Rinicella. And also starting in P3, we've got Javier Segrera. He was P2 this morning and he had those battles. I can imagine he's probably a little bit frustrated wanting something a bit more this afternoon. We are about to get going, but it's getting windier and windier. Yeah, the cars actually took an extra warm-up lap. I think Johnny and I need a warm-up lap because we're uh, feeling pretty chilly down here. We'll take your walk down the grid anyway as we head off the grid. So the number 23 of Christian Ho starts on P2 for the second race. Obviously, they are going to have this race and we are going to go to it right now. So we will head back up to Adam Weller. I think they're going to start needing sails more so than front and rear wings if we're not careful here. Uh, it might actually help. Uh, Valerio Rinicella then from pole position, as we have said in this race. He'll be looking to secure another race win, but uh, I think we're going to have a slightly different shade to the race in general. Uh, the likes of Tanga Velu, I think he could be one to watch given he was on the podium earlier on. Of course, it was an all MP Motorsport uh, top three earlier on with Tanga Angavelu as the third part of that. You have to consider the drivers that uh, had misfortunes in race one as well. Noah Lyle, for instance. Michael Shin as well uh, in the number 16. <coughs> and then also uh, Valentin Klus, who uh, starts from 12th place. He made his way all the way up to fifth. Uh, from the back of the grid earlier on before his car seemed to start suffering from some sort of gremlin, be it gear selection, be it maybe electrical, something of that nature. Uh, nonetheless, let's move on to our grid for this one. Valerio Rinicella is going to be our pole position sitter for this one. He was just two hundredths of a second quicker in second qualifying than Christian Ho. Javier Seguera in third place alongside Noah Lyle. Owen Tangavelu in fifth place alongside Huyen Shin, otherwise known as Michael Shin. Solomon Zanfari is in seventh place alongside Garrett Berry. Emerson Fittipaldi Jr. in ninth position alongside Georgi Saravsky, Victoria Blockina and Valentin Klus in 11th and 12th place. Then on the back row of the grid, it will be Legale in row number seven alongside Theodore Jensen, but I did, I think, see Theodore Jensen uh, pull up for a pit lane start. Gaspard Le Gale, uh I think, is out there on circuit, however. In fact, no, the back row in its entirety is starting from the pit lane. Okay, so then 12 cars to take the standing start, two cars to start from the pit lane. One from Drive X, one from Palo. Valeria Rinicella, this is a great opportunity uh, to try and start off the season with something I don't think he's ever done before, which is a brace of race victories on the race weekend. And there's quite a few strong names on this grid. So if he does secure that, uh, that result, that is a huge buoyancy aid for his confidence going into the season. But I'm talking about it as if it's easily done, and it's anything but easily done. At the best of times, in these weather conditions, it is going to be an immense challenge. 
for the driver of the number 55, Valerio Rinicella. With uh, Christian Ho with a point to prove. You may remember at the start of the uh, broadcast when our first Euro Cup 3 race took place, Christian Ho was on pole position, but he was also just a little bit pessimistic about his own chances of managing the race, as he put it. Um, but he's got a race of experience in the car under his belt now. Let's see what he can do in race number two. If you are joining us for the first time, a reminder that this is a non-championship round of Euro Cup 3 before they head to Spa next month for the official season opener. And uh, you've seen names getting announced for Euro Cup 3 already this year. Quite a few of them are here this weekend. There's also a couple of names that haven't been formally announced for Euro Cup 3 and whether they, they do in fact take part in this series or whether they go elsewhere is, is up for debate. Valerio Rinicella, the first to arrive over the crest of the hill then and will roll down to his grid slot alongside Christian Ho. Javier Segrera will line up third place, fourth place will be Noah Lyle. Tangavelu and Shin rounding out that third row for Campos, all Campos row three and all MP and Campos top six, three from each team uh, in the top six. And then it's the first of the, the Polo cars on row four, uh, eighth place starter Garrett Berry. So then the last car comes into position. That's Valentin Klus. Le Gallet and Theodore Jensen will start from the pit lane. Will the tailwind play its dangerous games again? We'll find out as we go racing once more in Euro Cup 3. It's a very good start from Christian Ho. He will have the inside line into turn one. He will lead into turn one. Christian Ho for Campos Racing is our leader. Second place then is our pole sitter, Rinicella, and he's got Sagrera sandwiching him from behind as well. The Drivex car of Zaravsky there going out wide as he tries to go side by side with one of the Campos machines. Legale and Jensen have gone out of the pit lane and onto the circuit. They will be trying to claw up some space, trying to get back up the order. Round the outside there goes Noah Lyle, the other Campos car there of, uh, I think that was either Shin or Klus, going very, very wide too as everyone picks their way through. The corkscrew for the first time, side by side between two of the Campos cars, I think Zanfari and Shin. As you hear them popping and banging through the gears. Here come our leading cars. A bit of a sideways moment there from Christian Hull, but he is our race leader. You see there. The last of the MP cars, the 24, Fittipaldi Jr. Just behind Zaravsky. So Zaravsky in the Drivex car has gotten ahead of him. And now we see the zigzag down the back straight towards the thus far very tricky turn 16. We've seen a lot of drama here so far this weekend. Now has everyone learnt their lesson? Let's find out. does seem as though we've largely worked it out at this juncture. Everyone through cleanly. And Campos Racing's Christian Ho continues to lead the race from Rinicella, from Sagrera, from Noah Lyle. Noah would love to get a podium out of this. Fittipaldi Jr. going defensive there with Garrett Berry just behind him. Uh, Mo Junior coming here after a season in Formula Regional European. And there's Galay trying to get some temperature into his tyres as down the inside of Berry goes Valentin Klus. So Valentin Klus just made up a position. That's 10th place to Valentin, or at least I think it is. I don't know if he got the move completed. We'll see as they come by. Oh, it's still side by side as they come out of turn. Number seven, Klus has gotten through as they go through the corkscrew. So Valentin Klus in the white and red and black, the Q 
Campos machine gets through. Next target, Emerson Fittipaldi Jr. Christian Ho into turn 12. Will be all too aware that Rinicella is still very much within striking distance. And I think it's going to take a mighty effort from Christian to get out of range over the course of this 30 minutes plus one lap. In the slipstream is Rinicella once again. Of course, there is a push-to-pass system available as well. I think I just saw Valentin Klus slowing again in the back of shot as well. We'll check on that in a moment, but it's side-by-side -side for the lead as Rinicella is to the outside of Christian Ho, takes it around the outside, but can't carry the momentum through the corner apex. It is Christian Ho that continues to lead the way. But it is still almost side by side between them. Now we've seen moves around the outside before. Can Rinicella do it this time? He's on the outside into turn one, but Christian O manages to uh, just prevent him from turning in at the time required to, uh, to go around the outside. But now to the inside comes Rinicella. He's got half a car there. Didn't quite do it, pulled out at the last minute. And now Javier Segrera will see his opportunity to maybe lunge on his teammate doesn't do it at turn five. They approach six and seven. It is Christian Ho. Still remains in the lead. It was a bit of a heart stopper there as Rinicella came up on him. And look at that top five. All very close together, separated by two seconds as Zanfari and Shin continue to scrap further back there. Zanfari... Uh, Sink's still ahead in that battle, but he's under a lot of pressure uh, from his Campos Racing cohort. The 23 car continues to lead the way, also leads the rookie standings ahead of Rinicella. Javier Segrera follows in third place. That top five, a sea of white and orange, building their gap over Zanfari and Shin, which I have no doubt is in no small part down to the fact that uh, uh, Shin and Zanfari are uh, taking swings at each other there in the battle for sixth place. Bit wide there for Christian Ho, still very difficult to properly sight the braking zone as the wind pushes them away. Although I must say, I do think the wind in the last few minutes has died down just looking at some of the uh, previously flapping awnings around the main grandstand i do think it is calming down a little bit perhaps uh, lucas or uh, or izzy could confirm that from down in the pit lane but it is looking a little more still around the circuit from my limited reference points in the commentary box christian ho Leads Rinicella through turn six and seven once again. I've been told that the camera ops, who of course are also exposed out there uh, to the, uh, the realities of the conditions, they're telling me uh, it is indeed still as windy as it has been previously. So it's not so much that conditions are improving, it's more the drivers are getting to grips with the conditions more so than they were this morning. Of course, this morning the Euro Cup 3 race was the guinea pig and actually look at the shrubbery. That tells you the story, doesn't it? Okay, fair enough. Disregard my previous thoughts. Again, like I said, very limited frame of reference from outside my commentary box window. Uh, but yes, it is, uh, it is still just as bad as it has been. It has been uh, pretty bad. I understand that maybe it's slightly easier now on the uh, slightly easing on the pit straight, but the rest of the circuit is not. Is he saying that? Yeah, pit lane maybe it's calmed down a bit, but it's obvious that around the circuit it is still just as bad as it has been. Rinicella in the toe then of Christian Ho and dives to the inside for the lead. Very nicely done by Rinicella, but Christian's going to fight back around the outside. Is he going to be afforded the space? No, he's not. Is he going to have the inside for turn 18? Yes, he is. It's a drag race then towards turn one as we 
have Christian Ho on the inside, Valerio Ridicella on the outside. Can Christian hold on? Yes, he can. What about Javier Segrera? Can he get in on this as well? Great scrap between these two, between these three, I suspect, any moment now. Christian Ho doing a great job defending this race right now. Again, every time they go side by side through a corner, of course, it brings Segrera back into it. It brings Noah Lyle closer to the battle as well. It is a great scrap that we have here for the race lead between the MP and the Campos cars. Campos are slightly outnumbered unless uh, Zanfari and Shin can close in. Of course, in junior single-seater racing, I think potentially more so than any other breed of uh, competition, uh, being a teammate is... Um, almost completely insignificant at the end of the day you're fighting for your career yes if you get it wrong um, you will still get told off by the team manager you want to avoid contact with your teammate but your teammates are your rivals just like anyone else and look at that from Rinicella that was a massive move going from 14 to 15 I wasn't anticipating that he'd do it there but do it there he has done a move at 15 then does that leave him open to an attack now at turn 16 from Christian Ho well certainly Christian is looking to the outside line he's got a nose ahead but Rinicella has the high ground on the inside line they both go deep into the corner and Javier Segrera is now side by side with Rinicella both of them go wide through 17 Christian Ho is still in this as well then but it is Javier Segrera that just about has the lead. It's side by side for second place now between Rinicella and Ho. And around the outside again, almost a carbon copy of what we saw from him in the first race. Rinicella goes to the head of the order. Brilliant racing once again from Euro Cup 3. Brilliant racing once again from Valerio Rinicella. And once again, Christian Ho, unfortunately, doesn't quite get the opportunity that he would have liked there. He was doing a great job of holding off the MP Motorsport cars. But eventually, the opportunity presented itself for Rinicella. Uh, unexpectedly at turn 15, I think caught uh, Christian by surprise as well there. Carried a lot more speed through turn 14. And now is our race leader. Javier Segrera briefly led, of course, across the line. His teammate had something to say about that. Look at the, listen to the wind. You can even hear it in the back of some of these shots. It's, uh, it's bad around the back of the circuits, I think more so than anywhere else at the moment. The kind of corkscrew section. It's been a very, very tricky day for all parties concerned uh, here at Motorland Aragon because of the wind. Exactly a warm day either, which isn't helping matters. Christian Ho and Noah Lyle nose to nose as they head towards turn 16. Noah Lyle fancies a go at the podium here. And is now attacking his Campos Racing teammate as the MP Motorsport duo fight it out for the lead up front. It's almost side by side as they go through turn 18 between both the first and second and third and fourth place battles. To the outside goes Javier Segrera for the lead. He can't get it done there. Noah Lyle, though, around the outside for third place. He might well get it done there. He's used a bit of runoff on the way, but through into third place he goes at the expense of Christian Hull. So Noah Lyle up to P2. who raced in the Formula Regional Middle East already this year. So he's already got one full championship in his uh, resume for the season. And he wants to try and uh, make his mark on Euro Cup 3 early doors. And he's currently in the position to do so. Third place for Noah Lyle. Rinicella and Segrera will once again most likely be at uh, Lockhorns as they come through 
12, 13, 14 and 15 again between the push to pass system, between the slipstream and the trickiness of getting the car stopped into turn 16. I suspect we're once again going to see some potential shuffling for the lead and indeed for third place. I wouldn't put it past uh, Owen Tangavelu to get involved in the third place scrap before long as well. I don't think Segrera is close enough for a move for the lead, but here comes Christian Ho trying to recover his third position. Around the outside of Noah Lyle, who locks up slightly. Tangavelu had a little chat with him uh, earlier in the week, and uh, he seemed pretty excited to get underway and get on with it uh, this weekend. And Oh, that was a big defensive move there from Noah Lyle at the last possible moment, claiming the inside line. And now it's a reverse of what we saw a lap ago. Uh, bouncing across the exit curve goes Christian Ho back into third position. A tennis match between the two then. And for now, there's Christian Ho back in that third place. Sanfari and Wu Yun Shin in the battle for sixth place, also still at very close quarters. So if you're a, a Campos <laughs> staff member right now, you're watching this race through your fingers because not one but two pairs of your cars are scrapping for overall position. Your order as we approach half distance in this race is Rinicella from Segrera for MP Motorsport. Christian Ho and Noah Lyle representing Campos in third and fourth. Owen Tagavelu, also an MP car in fifth place, had a Zamfari, Shin and Fittipaldi, your top eight entirely formed of MP and Campos cars. Zaravski in ninth for DriveX, Valentin Klus in tenth place in the Campos car, recovering uh, after starting from the back of the grid. Garrett Berry in eleventh place ahead of Theodore Jensen, who started from the pits. Victoria Blockina and uh, Gaspard Legale, of course it was Blockina and Legale, the two uh, DriveX cars that collided with each other on lap one uh, in the first race. And so as I say that, Blockina has had a moment out there on circuit and Noah Lyle is under pressure from Owen Tanga and Tangavelu, so it's all kicking off at once. Tangavelu not quite able to get past Noah Lyle. Rinicella and Segrera have a two-second buffer over the Campos cars behind. And in their mind, that is the permission required to uh, battle it out among themselves. I'm sure the team are okay with it too, just so long as it doesn't affect their chances of getting a big trophy in general. Valentin Klus, unfortunately, is back into the pit lane, so I just wonder if the gremlins we saw for him in race one have uh, shown themselves once more. Either way, he is in the pit lane. Yeah, the popping and banging through the gears. It sounds a little bit like a firing range um, when these cars are out on circuit. do look absolutely fabulous as well kind of more closer more in line with what we're seeing from the F1 and the current F2 car as well the new F2 car kind of aerodynamic concept in general is more in keeping with those than most of the other F3 F4 level machines there's the 52 car of Zamfari still just ahead of Wu Yun Shin in the battle for sixth place. They're the closest pair as they run down the back straight, although uh, it's pretty even Stevens among quite a few of the drivers. To the inside line comes uh, Michael Shin then, and he manages to make that look quite easy, no doubt with the help of the push to pass. Through into sixth position then goes Shin for the time being. Can he now break away from Zanfari? Shin has looked like he's got some good pace across the weekend, so Zanfari might need to fire back ASAP, and he tried to do so there at turn one. But no 
luck on that occasion. Minicella and Segrero were separated by half a second at the line. Christian Ho has managed to drop Noah Lyle a little bit, and that's largely because Lyle is having to focus more on Owen Tangavelu behind him in the battle for fourth position. You just saw them go through shot momentarily as we see Shin and Zanfari through turn seven. It does seem as though Zanfari has the slight pace advantage, or rather, sorry, that Shin has the slight pace advantage now that he's gotten past his teammate. Perhaps Zanfari will be trying his best to use the uh, push to pass to try and get back through on the back straight, but I somehow doubt uh, he's going to be close enough based on the margin as they go through turn 11. There are our leaders, Rinicella and Segrera then. There you see Owen Tangavelu. That's what I was talking about previously, uh, that Tangavelu is making life a little bit difficult for Noah Lyle in the battle for fourth position. As they head out onto the back straight, there is the second of the Campos cars with Tangavelu in the slipstream. Tangavelu is not going to be close enough this time unless Noah Lyle has a bit of a slip up. Through turn 16 they go and you can see the rate of close between Tangavelu and Lyle there. We are approaching two-thirds time in this race. Of course, once the clock hits zero, we do have plus one lap, as you can see, indicated on the screen. But Owen Tangavelu. We would love to have a uh, good start to his 2024 here in the Euro Cup 3 pre-season event. Uh, came 14th in the standings in the Formula Regional European Championship over the summer of 2023. And uh, certainly looking for some good results here in this weekend. But I think a podium right now is going to be a long stretch unless he can get past Noah and Lyle pretty sharpish. Right now, it's not looking particularly likely. Let's watch these cars then bounce over the kerbs. You can see some of them still running deep into the corner. Uh, notably there, Lyle ran quite deep into turn uh, turn 12, and that means that Tangavelu is a lot closer this time. Tangavelu gets a good run as well by the looks of it. Out of 15, or did he? I think there was a bit of a squirm there towards the corner exit as he put the power down, but still he's in the slipstream. I don't think he's going to be close enough by the time they get to the hairpin, but he's certainly still keeping Noah Lyle very much on his toes. Lyle, or rather Tangavelu, set himself up very nicely for a, a good run out of 15, but I think he just caught a little bit of a torque spike there coming out of the corner, had to uh, lift out of the throttle a bit, make a bit of an adjustment at the wheel, and that cost him his momentum out of turn 15. Rinicella and Segrera continue to be separated by just under a second at the sharp end. There's the Valentin Klus car in the pit lane, and uh, looks like they might be looking at the gearbox specifically. I did wonder if it was gear selection issues earlier on. And sure enough, it does appear that they are looking at the gearbox there, situated just behind the engine, so... Perhaps that is the problem for Valentin Plus. Either way, it's been a bit of a day to forget uh, for the youngster. Hopefully he will have a better run of form in his summer campaign. Rinicella and Segrera then through the first couple of corners, or rather through the turn 12 and 13 I should say uh, oh no a Lyle there with a lot of oversteer through 13 rear end uh, causing him some grief 13 looks like a particularly tricky corner 
in these conditions. I think the uh, the wind kind of hits halfway through the corner. They're sheltered from the wall and then uh, by the wall a little bit. And then suddenly halfway through the corner, the wind kind of picks you up. And that is why you're seeing it uh, become an increasingly twitchy part of the circuit for some of our drivers. Noah Lyle with serious pressure this time from Owen Tangavelu. Tangavelu, I think, uh, had to lift out of it a little bit there through 17 to make sure he didn't collide with Noah Lyle. Lyle doesn't seem to quite have the pace in the second phase of the race. He was looking quicker than his teammate Christian Ho earlier on, and now Lyle is gradually falling back from Christian and gradually falling into the clutches of Owen Tangavelu, and I think the car just dropping off from underneath him a little bit. Of course, the driver of that number two car Took uh, three wins and six podiums in Bridge F4 last year, so we know exactly what the young Aussie Noah Lyle is capable of. Such an <laughs> incredible wind down at the far end of the circuit. I think in particular that corkscrew section is where the, uh, the gusts are most obvious. through turn 13 we go then on lap 13 of this race Rinicella is just controlling things right now at the sharp end of the order but Noah Lyle doesn't have much control over the situation at all in the battle for fourth position Tangavelu this time is the closest I think he's been to the rear of Noah he'll no doubt be using that push to pass which Noah Lyle might also be using defensively he defends the inside line then as we run towards the 16th corner the hairpin a bit of a lock up from Lyle wide berth from Owen Tangavelu no move made but Tangavelu has more pace through 17 and indeed turn 18 and is right on the gearbox of Noah Lyle Lyle knows he needs to go defensive takes the inside line at the earliest possible opportunity so now Tangavelu will try to go around the outside like others before him but uh, decides not to do that instead Cuts the inside, tries to carry some momentum through turn two. Has to be careful not to lose his front downforce there from the dirty air of the uh, rear wing of Noah Lyle. Tangavelu thought briefly was looking to the inside there at turn five, but not to be just yet. However, Noah Lyle is going to have to fight every last moment of the next four minutes plus one lap if he is to retain this fourth place because... Tangavelu has been stating his intent loud and clear all race long in this battle. The previous laps for these two were uh, mid-55s and Shin behind is going fractionally quicker, but I don't think Shin is going to close in in time to, uh, to be a factor in the scrap. Christian Ho a bit sideways there through turn 12, but nicely held and Dear. Again, scrubbing his speed through 13, Noah Lyle. You can see how Tangavelu closes up on him through turn 14. But I think actually he goes a bit too deep into 14. Javier Segrera is slowing. Javier Segrera is slowing on the circuit. What has happened to Javier Segrera? While that's happening, we've got side by side now for third place as Noah Lyle has the inside line. Tangavelu has the outside line. And Noah Lyle defending that third position that he's now inherited. But Tangavelu around the outside at 17. He's going to clutch on to the inside line of the final corner. It's still side by side as they come across the line. Is Lyle going to be able to hold on around the outside or is it Tangavelu's position at this point? We'll see as they come through the corner. Around the outside and holding it is Noah Lyle. Third place remains his for the time being. Noah Lyle now fighting for something a lot more significant, a piece of silverware. It's no longer a battle for fourth, it's a battle for third as Javier Segrera has come into the pit lane with a problem. 
So Segreira in the pit lane. Meanwhile, there's a five second penalty for car 20. Track limits, that is of course Le Galais in the DriveX car. That's the only track limits penalty of this race so far. It's the only track limits related bulletin on my screen so far in this race. So a five second penalty for Le Galais would, as it stands, put him back behind Victoria Blochina. So from 12th to 13th place. Our battle for third place emerges from turn 12 and 13. And because they were fighting side by side, Michael Shin is now very much an active participant in this scrap as well. So it's a three car fight for third place. Nice sideways moment there for Shin. That won't do him any favours in the uh, department of getting out of the corner well, but it was certainly stylish. Tangavelu in the slipstream of Noah Lyle. He's not close enough this time. It's very impressed that Noah Lyle held on to that. I felt that Tangavelu had done enough to move into third place a lap ago, but he couldn't quite do it. Rinicella will have seen his cohort, his teammate, slow down in his rear view mirrors and he can now focus on just limping his own car home. We start the penultimate lap then with 50 seconds left on the clock and the battle for third place may well come down to the very last braking zone. Two to go as they circulate through three, four and five at Motorland Aragon once again. 10 kilometers of racing left for this battle for third place. Tangavello, of course, took the podium earlier on in the day, finished third. He could match it again here. It's not going to be an all MP top three this time around. Of course, Rinicella, as the clock ticks down to zero. He's on the verge of making it a perfect weekend. There's Javier Segreira out of the car. Unfortunately for him, this has not been a particularly uh, successful second race. Of course, came second place in race number one. Race two has unfortunately not quite gone his way. Battle for third place then heads towards our camera at turn 16 once again. This time Lyle is a little bit further ahead of Tangavelu. I don't think Tangavelu will, will be close enough, but Noah Lyle needs to get this corner right. I think he's going straight on. Oh, he locks up a bit, but he continues to make the apex regardless. About as late as he could possibly break there. Rinicella starts the final lap as your race leader. The driver who took two wins in last year's Spanish F4 Championship is about to make it two wins in one weekend here at Motorland Aragon. He's one lap away from his win. He can feel fairly cemented in that position. Noah Lyle isn't so much cemented. He is uh, third place but it's a loose grip on the position for him. Owen Tangavelu will be studying, or will have been studying over the last few laps to see any opportunity he can have to move by Noah Lyle. It's gonna come down though to turn 16. That said, Tangavelu not that close as they ran through the first sector of the lap unless he has a particularly special run through 12 to 15. I think Noah Lyle may have just about done enough. Rinicella approaches turn 14 and 15 for the final time. It's been a real showcase for Valerio Rinicella. These two non-championship races to kick off Euro Cup 3's 2024. Valeria Rinicella heads down the back straight as our leader. What's the situation between Lyle and Tanga Velu, though? Rinicella approaches turn 16. And will power out of the last couple of corners as our race leader. 
he comes over the crest of the hill to take the race win. Valeria Ridicella has won it. Christian Ho will take second and Noah Lyle did have enough of a buffer to secure third place. He crosses the line just a couple of tenths clear of Owen Tangavelu. Noah Lyle rounds out our podium then. Michael Shin takes fifth place. Sanfari in sixth. Fittipaldi taking seventh place. The first of the Drivex cars home is Georgi uh, Zaravsky. Garrett Berry takes ninth. Theodore Jensen rounds out the top ten after starting in pit lane. And then the battle for 11th place between the two Drivex cars is probably at the hairpin as we speak. Legale and Blockina. And uh, while they collided together in race number one, uh, Drivex will be happy to know they come both across the line. Or do they? <laughs> uh, Blockina was right there behind him. Yes, thankfully, Blockina is still there. And by virtue of Legale's penalty, he falls behind Victoria Blockina uh, eventually. There were penalties, or a singular penalty applied during the race, and that was to uh, Legale in the number 20 car. So unfortunately for Gaspard, he drops down to 12th place. Segrera and Valentin Klus, of course, both in the pit lane. They are non-finishers. Valerio Rinchella, though. Valerio Rinicella is your race winner here at Motorland Aragon Euro Cup 3 with their pre-season run here at Motorland Aragon. An event that uh, doesn't contribute to the championship, but certainly contributes nicely to the confidence of those who have done well and no one has done better than Valeria Rinicella in this race or indeed this weekend pole position in second place a win and a win pole position in second in quali a win and a win in the races it doesn't get much better than that for Valeria Rinicella I'm sure the MP Motorsport crew are encouraging him through the radio telling him well done mate just bring it home <laughs> don't like how they're all clustering on the back straight <laughs> uh, let's be careful now uh, but uh, everybody driving home in a pack to conclude the day for the Euro Cup 3 classes of course we've still got a lot of racing to come our uh, formulas our gt4s and our gts are all still to come before the end of the racing action here at motorland aragon valeria rinicella has done his day's work and he's done his day's work to perfection christian ho pulls up for a well-deserved second place he finishes where he started of course, he started on pole position in race one, didn't get on the podium in race one, so he'll be happy to make a podium for race two. Rinicella was very much in a celebratory mood as he got out of the car in race one. Let's see if he's doing it again in race number two. Out he comes. He reinstalls his steering wheel. He climbs to the top of his car. And it's a big celebration for Valeria Rinicella. The MP Motorsport team greets him with a smile and a hug. A good weekend of work for him. So our Euro Cup 3 cars with that are done for the weekend. We will, of course, hear uh, from Valerio Rinicella in the next few moments. Uh, Rinicella, in fact, I believe is already confirmed for the uh, Formula Regional European season with MP Motorsport rather than Euro Cup 3. So uh, he's driving a slightly different specification of car this weekend. Uh, than he will in his summer season. The Euro Cup car versus the uh, versus the Freca car, albeit, of course, both regional spec machines, albeit with slightly different aero packages. 
And uh, yeah, Valeria Rinicella then not in Euro Cup 3, but in Formula Regional Europe. And uh, he'll come into that season with a lot of momentum in his favour. So we'll see how Rinicella will perform at the highest level. Upper, upper, upper level as you were. FR 3.5 or well, Formula 3.5 as I sometimes call it. The Formula Regional cars. Uh, let's go down to Valerio Rinicella though. He will be beaming I'm sure. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm down here with our race two and a Valerio Rinicella. Valerio, you've done the double. You must feel good about that. Yeah, thank you. It was a fantastic weekend. The space was always fast and I'm really happy with the work did with the engineer, mechanics and the team. I'm really happy of the car. We did a good strategy. So yeah, double here and happy. And you, uh, you had a good start, but you also made some good moves and then uh, managed to pull a gap at the end. So pretty good race from your perspective. Yeah, thank you. And how does this bode for your season ahead? So yeah, now it's going to be Freca this year, so let's push for it. Wish you the best of luck. Congratulations. Thank you. There's our race one and race two winner in the Euro Cup pre-season event. That's it for Euro Cup. And now we're going to head up back to Adam for the replays of that final race in Euro Cup for the weekend. Let's quickly run through the uh, results of that one before we do that. Valerio Rinicella. Uh, winning the race by 5.8 seconds over Christian Ho. Noah Lyle just holding off Owen Tangavelu at the end. Michael Sheen in fifth place ahead of Solomon Zanfari. Emerson Fittipaldi Jr. taking seventh. Jorgi Zaravski in eighth place. Garrett Berry in ninth. And Theodore Jensen in tenth place. Victoria Blochina in eleventh place ahead of Gaspard Legale. Sagrera and Klus failing to finish our second Euro Cup 3 race of the day. So then, highlights of that race. It was a good start, I think, in particular from Christian Ho. He got a slightly better start, and sure enough, he converted it into an early lead. A very, very good getaway from the 23 driver, and he would lead the MP Motorsport cars in the early going as everyone fought for track space. Noah Lyle rather rudely pushed out wide, and I think, uh, I think that was uh, Zanfari also suffering a similar fate. Christian Ho would defend hard uh, against the 55 car, against our eventual race winner, but Lerio Rinicella managed to dive through and squeeze Christian Ho out wide. It was drag racing side by side towards the first corner, and then in what was a carbon copy, frankly, of his race winning move from race number one, he held on to the outside line. But that would come a bit later on as uh, the defensive driving continued on. In fact, of course, initially a dive to the inside at turn 15 allowed Rinicella into the lead. But uh, digging his claws in, trying to hold on, uh, was Christian Ho. It was then side by side between the two MP Motorsport cars as uh, Javier tried to hold on. Sagrera had the lead momentarily, uh, but eventually fell to Valerio and once he had that lead it, he wasn't going anywhere. Noah Lyle moved up into third position with this move getting past Christian Ho but then they would get into Lockhorn scrapping and of course sat behind them as well was Tangavelu who would continue to make life difficult for, over, for Lyle long after this move for Christian Ho which would cement him in third place Little did he know that would soon become P2. Victoria Blockina had a bit of a moment further back as we uh, watched the battle unfold for what was at the time at fourth position between Tangavelu and Lyle. Lyle having to defend almost every lap at the hairpin from Tangavelu. Some brilliant side-by-side -side racing between the pair. Unfortunately, though, Javier Segrera's race would come to a close a little earlier than scheduled. He brought the car back home with a mechanical woe. Uh, not a perfect day for Segrera, but still he'll be happy with the podium in race number two. Meanwhile, uh, Tangavelu now fighting for third place with Noah Lyle with renewed vigor. Tried to go around the outside at turn 17, had the inside line for turn 18 and briefly 
briefly got himself up into that third position. Noah Lyle, though, had the outside line. And he'd carry that momentum to try and defend the position and defend the position he did. From there, there was no better opportunity than that for Tangavelu. Our race winner then was indeed uh, Valerio Rinicella. Second place going to Christian Ho and Noah Lyle just pipping his competitors to the line to round out our podium. But it's as good as good as it can get for Valerio Rinicella. A subtle race suit, but anything but a subtle weekend. Some great overtaking moves, some great defending, and two big trophies at the end of this Euro Cup 3 guest appearance, as it were, in the non-championship round for Valerio Rinicella. So then the Euro Cup 3 portion of our weekend is complete, but we still have the final races uh, from the Formula Win Series from the GTs and the GT4s to contend with. The wind on the main straight is picking up once again, it must be said. It's almost uh, lifting uh, the canvas beneath the main grandstand. Uh, which is quite spectacular. Lucas Gajewski is down there, though, on the podium with a full quota of drivers. So let's go down there now. Thank you very much, Adam Weller. Here we are with the podium after the second and last race for the Euro Cup three drivers. And what a great competition it was. So let's call our winners onto the stage. And we start our podium ceremony with the rookie class in Euro Cup three. So please welcome, in third place of the rookie class podium, for Campos, Georgi Zorowski. Oh, that's Rybex, apologies, but still, it's uh, Georgi Zorowski, there he is. Thank you very much, your third place driver. In second place, for Campos, it's Christian Ho. And your rookie winner, for MP Motorsport is Valerio Rinicella. Congratulations. Andres Mendres from the Euro Cup 3 and the Spanish Formula 4 organization is presenting the trophies to our three winning rookie drivers. Of course, we are going to see some of them on the second podium coming up in a bit. But of course, we are happy for all the uh, rookie drivers on top of the podium. If you don't mind, guys, please share the highest spot of the podium as well for our pictures. And then, of course, we will give it a moment for some photos being taken down there in the pits. And once everything is done and dusted, let's please have another big round of applause for Georgi Zorowski in third, Christian Ho in second, and your winner is Valerio Rinicella. Thank you very much. <laughs> Georgi there celebrating with the bottle of water as we don't have champagne for this one. Well done to Georgi. Right, one more podium coming up. This is our overall podium and we start with the best team and the representative. Congratulations to Juan Pablo and to MP Motorsports. In third place. For Campos, it's Noah Lyle. Congratulations. Well done to Noah. His first podium of the weekend. In second place, for Campos, Christian Ho. And your winner for the second time this weekend for MP Motorsport is Valerio Rinicella. Well done to Valerio once again. And here is for your race winner, Valerio Rinicella, the Italian national anthem.
Well done. Big round of applause and thank you very much to our winning drivers as Andres Mendres is heading out once again with the trophies. Congrats once again to Juan Pablo and MP Motorsport. Very successful day here in Motorland, Aragon, as the trophies are also being presented to our drivers on the top steps of the podium. Uh, please get together on the highest one once again for some pictures being taken from the pits and uh, as Formula Winter Series cars are still heading out onto the grid, I think we've got a moment or two to uh, speak to our drivers. Of course, we heard from Valero. Guys, just give me a second. Let's get back to the podium, please. I yeah, we need to speak to each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we spoke downstairs again, so you can, uh, you can go if you want, but you don't have to. Guys, let's get back on the podium, please, because we got our camera downstairs so that we have it nicely aligned in sound and vision. <laughs> right, okay. I, I think our drivers aren't too happy with any interviews, so um, you're off to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. So, that's uh, it done and dusted. That leaves uh, more time than for Easy Browning downstairs on the grid for Formula Winter Series, which uh, isn't there yet, I'm afraid, but... Um, I think drivers are off to the uh, celebrations, whatever. Thank you very much. That's it for the uh, Euro Cup 3 podium after race two this weekend here in Motorland, Aragon. One more race coming up for Formula Winter Series and cars are heading down the pits onto a second sighting lap into the grid. And of course, this is the race where we will form the basis for next week championship and title decider at Barcelona with a fabulous grid of almost 40 cars this weekend here in Aragon and next weekend, of course, just as well. So next up, the grid for Formula Winter Series race number two here in Aragon. And we kick off with a sight I was not expecting. Gianmarco Prodel, I think at turn 15, is beached in the gravel. Uh, so he's had an issue on his first sighting lap, and they're trying to push the car away. Uh, the marshals, though, are uh, having to back away from the car there in order to uh, stay safe as others go past. And... They're now going to have to vacate away. And, uh, well, for Gianmarco Pradel, this is an unfortunate added twist to his tail uh, for the driver who is set to be starting from seventh on the grid. Uh, so we get a good shot at a top five in this one. Um, hopefully he'll be able to take his starting position. You see there the marshals springing into action. It is indeed on the exit of turn 15 where that car has come to a unexpected halt. Cars arriving down towards the grid uh, with Izzy Browning at the moment. And uh, hopefully she will uh, bring us uh, into some of the pre-grid atmosphere in a few moments time because there won't be too long before the cars are rolling even on the formation laps uh, but uh, the, we should just briefly mention uh, the grid for this one Egozi on pole position for the first time in his Formula Winter Series tenure he will certainly be one to watch he will certainly be looking to avenge um, his uh, mistakes in the previous race of course remember he and Cardenas came together, unfortunately, in race number two. There we see the cars now making their way down, as we uh, should also highlight the fact that Drivex have all three cars in the top ten in this one as well. Juan Cota, uh, Mikel Pedersen in uh, ninth place and Macedo all the way up in fifth as well. So Macedo will be closer to the front than ever before. At the very front, though, is Izzy Browning. Hello, everyone. Welcome back down to the grid for the final Formula Winter Series race of the weekend. As Adam said, we have uh, had Gianmarco Pradel in the uh, gravel somewhere around the lap. So we'll see if he makes it to the grid. We're still waiting for some of our cars to come down. But as Adam also said, James Agosi on pole for the first time in the Formula Winter Series. He had a DNF this morning, so he'll definitely be hoping for a better race or 
to end the race for this time. That would be good for him. So we have got the number 87 car of Keanu Alazari that's pulled in. And I'm just now seeing right on time, we have got our pole sitter. I can imagine the engineers are probably going to want to talk to him quickly, but we'll just get towards him and just try and get... James, can we get a quick word? First pole position for the Formula Winter Series. Final race of the day. What's your plan going into turn one? Well, to do my best and just get off the line as fast as I can and hopefully not have to deal with anybody else and just get away. And it's still pretty windy down here, so do you see that being an issue during the race? Can you repeat that? It's a little hard with the air. It's still pretty windy. Do you see it being an issue during the way race? Yeah, well, thank thankfully it's a very short run to turn one, so hopefully the headwind doesn't hurt and then tailwind down the back straight should be helpful. All right, best of luck. Thanks for speaking to us. He is right, it's very windy, but we're just gonna carry on up the grid. There's a car stopped in the middle of the grid that we've just seen, uh, being looks like being rolled off by the mechanics. Just trying to see if I can see which number it is. is is one of the MP Motorsport cars. So, oh, and they just clunked it into the barrier. So definitely not a good start for that car. Um, as we're starting to clear off the grid, it is the number 46 car, one of the MP Motorsport cars. And as we continue down the grid, just quickly, before the one minute, we've got Akshay Boris starting here. He had a best finish last weekend of fourth in Valencia, so we'll see what he can do from there. We are just about to get the one minute board, but this is hopefully going to be a fantastic race like the race was this morning. And we're ready to hand back up to Adam Weller as the one minute board is just about to come out for the final race of the Formula Winter Series race this weekend in Aragon. And the important thing for those supporting uh, some uh, some Aussie contingents is that Jan Marco Pradell was there just behind Izzy Browning at the end of uh, that grid walk. So uh, Jan Marco did get the car out of the gravel and did get to his grid slot. So he won't be too adversely affected uh, by whatever happened there at turn 15 to lead him uh, into a spin. The car that we saw being pushed back into uh, the pit lane uh, was Bazinelos in the number 46. So unfortunately uh, for him, the race is possibly quite possibly over before it started and being pushed into the pit wall will not help on that front but uh, Peter Bazinolos uh, is unfortunately possibly a non-starter at the very least a pit lane starter he was due to start from uh, not too far down the order he was meant to be Oh, he was actually in 36th place. I thought he was a bit further up than that in this one. James Agosi, though, couldn't be any further up. He will start the race as our pole sitter in the number 48 car, but he will have quite a lot of uh, strong competition for company chief among them. The race one winner, of course, Keanu Alazari, sharing the front row of the grid with him. We will go through the grid in full right now. James Agosi, Keanu Alazari on the front row. Juan Cota for Drivex starting from third place. He's had a mixed weekend. He'd like to end this one on a high. Jack Beaton starting from P4. In a fifth place it is Francisco Macedo and he's alongside Akshay Bora in the second of the US racing cars after of course Beaton. Gianmarco Pradell starting from seventh in another US racing machine alongside Lucas Flusha. Mikel Pedersen and Griffin Peebles round out the overall top ten. Machai Guadish is in 11th place alongside Ernesto Rivera on row six. Row seven of the grid is Thomas Strauven, the winner from earlier on. He starts alongside Rene Lammers on row seven. Andres Cardenas starts from 15th alongside Dower de Decker. Flavio Olivieri is 17th alongside Adam Hideg. Row 10 of the grid is Enzo Tarnvenichkel alongside Filippo Fiorentino. Bianca Bustamante starts 21st on an all, or what would have been an all F1 Academy 11th row, but Carrie Schreiner will not be taking the start. Alexander Savinkov and Finn Harrison are on row 12. Row 13 is Lynn Hedinius alongside Ella Lloyd. Enya Frey is next alongside Lenny Reed, Lambert and Borneo on row 15. Row 16 of the grid is Castillo and Dobzanski. Nathaniel Berabee on row 17 alongside Leah Block. 
Kabir Anarag and Maxime Reem scheduled for row 18. The Zinlos possibly not taking the start from row 19. And Arthur de Rizon is meant to be at the back. So then we won't quite have our full quota of 38 cars, but we still have a massive grid of F4 machinery for the Formula Winter Series, the collaborative project between the organizers of the Spanish F4 Championship and, of course, Giedlik Racing. It has been a thrill ride so far this year. It's a thrill ride with a championship leader in the form of Griffin Peebles, but a championship leader by just the one point. Uh, he scored one singular point so far this weekend, and that came in race one. 109 points to Peebles, 108 points to Cardenas. That's the championship situation as it stands. And unfortunately, uh, courtesy of their very difficult weekend so far, they are, uh, they are both starting quite a way down the order. Peebles in 10th, Cardenas set to start from 15th. Uh, so they will both be in the wars a little bit. This grid formed on the basis of the qualifying two results. Uh, two qualifying sessions on the Saturday morning. And uh, this is the quali two results forming this grid. So James Agosi had a really good uh, quali two. In fact, I think it might have been the fastest lap of the weekend that he set. Certainly in competitive sessions, the fastest lap of the weekend to get this pole position. What about his start, though? How will it compare to Keanu Alizari's on the front row of the grid? What can Kota and Beaton do from row two? Kota, of course, already a race winner this year, as is Alizari. The fifth light is on, the fifth light is off, and we go racing. It's a good start indeed from James Agosi. He leads then into the first corner. Alizari with a little bit of a look to the inside as they go through the first corner. Everybody else two, three wide. A bit closer comfort there between some of the Monlau and uh, uh, Yenza cars further back in the pack, but everybody else streams on through. Enzo Tarnvinichkel there very distinctively in those Red Bull colours in the midfield on his first weekend in a single-seater racing car. James Agosi, though, is our leader from Alazari, from Kota, from Beaton. Interestingly, for the first time, really, uh, the top seven is all uh, not rookies, all pre-experienced F4 drivers, as I think one of the DriveX cars there went out wide. It all may have been one of the Campos cars, but someone finding the gravel there at turn seven rather unusually. Continues on his way, though. Griffin Peebles was trying to go around the outside of Lucas Flusher, which means either Flusher has dropped a couple of places or Peebles has gained a couple. Flusher was in eighth, uh, Peebles was in ninth, so that was for eighth place. Uh, Peebles trying to go around the outside of Lucas Flusher. I don't know if he managed to succeed at that or not. Uh, they're still both there, which is the important thing. But once again, we're seeing drivers struggle at turn 12, which means we're more than likely going to see drivers struggle again also at turn 16 because of those tailwinds. Down at the back straight they go for the first time, and there's the snake as they all try and follow the slipstream. Tom Vinichkel has lost a few places by the looks of it further back in the pack, some side by side between the Campos cars further back. Does everybody get the car stopped this time? That's the big question. Machai Gwadish up the inside there, I think, of Cardenas, but it looks like just about everybody at the sharp end has got it right on this occasion, despite the tailwind. Tom Vinichkel, though, definitely dropping through the order. It is James Agosi that leads then from Alazari, from Juan Cota. Rene Lammers getting into it there with Gwadish and also with Andres Cardenas. Gwadish around the outside of Andres to hold on to P11. In fact, hold, take P10, I should say, rather than hold on to P11. So, Gwadish is up to P10. Rene Lammers on the verge of the top 10 as well, as is Dawa Dedeka in 13th place. Macedo lost a few places there. He's dropped down to 14th, possibly even 15th, because Flavio Olivieri was just going up the inside of him. I think it was potentially Macedo uh, that went out wide through turn seven. Meanwhile, the car's at the front end of the order, snake through once again, and Enzo Tarnvinichkel 
has taken a visit to the pit lane. So Tom Vinichkel was indeed struggling out there, unfortunately, as Cardenas, I think that was, uh, was getting pushed out there around the exit of turn 10. Or was that potentially uh, Ernesto Rivera? Uh, might have been Rivera, actually. That would make more sense as he was alongside Adam Hideg. Indeed, Hideg just behind Rivera there. Around the outside there goes Finn Harrison. That was all the way off track as he's side by side there with Filippo Fiorentino for 19th place. Harrison holds the inside through 15 but gets a poor run out of the corner. So that's not going to work out for him. Igozi, Al Alazari and Kota, your top three. Once again, we have three different teams in the top three, four different teams in the top four. Keanu Alazari up the inside. James Igozi saw it happening in his mirrors and locked up. And uh, continues on his way. The starting procedure will be investigated after the race, I'm told, on my timing screen. So that's something that uh, we'll find out about in the postscript. But James Agozi, for the time being in the here and now, is our race leader. Alazari and Kota, second and third place. I'm being told that Enzo Tarnvinichkel had to have a tyre change. So I think he might have found himself with a puncture on that first lap. Agozi, or rather Rivera, I should say, has uh, gotten himself past the number 24 of Adam Hideg. So that's uh, a move for 17th position in favour of Rivera. Just ahead of them is the race winner from earlier on, Thomas Strauven. We've got one car with the front wing dislodged as well. I think that could be Ella Lloyd, unfortunately. If that is Ella Lloyd, that means she will be on front wing number four of the weekend or of the day even. Uh, we'll confirm that uh, in due course, but it looked like either a Rodin or a us racing car. I suspect it was a Rodin car. Agozi will arrive here to turn 12 in a minute, just hearing my ears from the director and the camera ops that it was the 77, therefore it would be Ella Lloyd. So Ella's weekend continues to be a bit difficult for her. Griffin Peebles, meanwhile, to the inside of Mikel Pedersen, and he dives and bounces through into seventh place. Lucas Flusher trying to find a way through as well. Peter Bazinelos, who, uh, of course, had the uh, uh, issue on the pre-grid, is back in there, and they're checking something under the engine cover. So clearly things are not quite going to plan down at MP Motorsport. Juan Cota dives to the inside for second place and he gets past Keanu Alazari, but Jack Beaton sees his opportunity to side through into third place. Juan Cota, though, has managed to move up to second place. A bit of a block pass there from Juan Cota, and now he's under fire from Beaton and Alazari. Juan Cota then fighting for the honour of Drivex in second place. Alazari diving to the inside in the MP car, but it is beaten that goes all the way around the outside to move into P2. Fourth to second in a matter of about 25 seconds for the 45. Juan Cota then with Keanu Alazari in his wake. All of this, of course, is working out fabulously for James Agozi as Alazari now goes around the outside of Juan Cota. And Alazari has gotten through around the outside at turn five. I don't think we've seen that one so far this weekend. And now Juan Cota tries to pull the same trick at turn seven. He's got to be careful, though, because Akshay Bora is on the back of him as well. Ella Lloyd is in to get a new nose cone. So it was indeed Ella Lloyd, unfortunately, with a dislodged nose in the pack. As we alluded to, the starting procedure is due to be investigated after the race. As we have side by side once again, as Alazari and Kota continue to knock uh, all kinds of things out of each other. Juan Kota to the inside once more. Oh, but the inside line is with Keanu Alazari. Caesar going to part for Akshay Bora. He's the only one that gets an even halfway decent run uh, down the back straight. And Gianmarco Pradell from being off the track at turn 15 on the installation lap is now fighting out of turn 15 for a top five position. Juan Kota is basically off the track completely as he tries to claim the inside line. He goes for it. He locks up and he's into Keanu Alazari. That was a big moment between the two. 
Alazari thankfully keeps going. And wow, that was a big moment. Juan Cota bouncing on the halo even of the 87 car. He'll continue on his way. And oh, was that Griffin Peebles? Was that Peebles? No, it was Lucas Flusher. But the MP car that was running in the top 10 with Peebles is in a spin. Gianmarco Pradel now in sixth position with uh, Mikael, uh, fifth position, sorry, with Mikael Pedersen just behind him. So Pradel has moved up to the top five. Unsurprisingly, both Juan Cota and Keanu Alazari are in the pit lane. Machai Guadish to the inside there of Andres Cardenas for seventh position. Your order then, after all of that shuffling, is a gozi from Beaton at the front as Alazari calls it a race. Akshay Bora in third position. Griffin Peebles all the way up to fourth. Griffin Peebles is up into fourth place from 10th on the grid. Pradel fifth, Pedersen sixth, Cardenas from 15th to 7th, Gwadish eighth, Lammers ninth, Dawe Dideka tenth as the race goes to safety car. Let's take a replay then while this race is neutralized. Juan Cota was doing everything he could to get to the inside line against Keanu Alazari and indeed Akshay Bora, who is now running in third place as a result of all of this. Cota under rotates the wheel. The uh, front left locked up, the front right locked up, and Keanu Alazari was unfortunately the driver who... Uh, Juan Cota bumped into there. You can see the front suspension damage on Juan Cota. You can see a lot of damage uh, to the 87 car. Another one of those instances, I think, where uh, one is suddenly very, very grateful for the halo as well. And uh, the safety car is out because of that. Lucas Flusher could not get the car back to the pit lane. So the number 21 MP motorsport car needs to be pulled back to the service road. But you can see that there's a gap in the Armco just a few metres away. So this should be a fairly straightforward recovery job. Juan Cota rather incredibly has exited the pits again. I thought that car looked like it had some suspension damage. But uh, he is apparently back out of the circuit. So Juan Cota is going to go and give it another shot of course for a few of our drivers this is a bit of a, a second chance we uh, we for example saw Enzo Tam Vinichkel in for uh, a, a new tyre after a puncture on the first lap we saw Ella Lloyd in for a new front nose cone and I understand from Lucas Gajewski that she actually spun going into the final corner uh, on her way into the pits so uh, not a, an optimal lap there losing her nose cone and having a bit of a moment at the last corner before getting some new carbon fibre on the car but both Ella and Enzo will get the opportunity to uh, close back in on the field as will Juan Cota who just went past my commentary position uh, in 34th position however uh, we'll have to see whether there's any investigation in relation to the uh, moment between uh, Cota and Alazari. Safety car then is out on the circuit for the first time in this race. James Agosi for the first time in this race will have to deal with a safety car restart in due course. Whether or not we have already removed Lucas Fluge's car, I'm not sure. It didn't look like progress was uh, Mucho Rapido down at turn 17 a few moments ago. Let's run through your top 20 then at this juncture. It is James Agosi, your race leader, ahead of Jack Beaton in second place. Akshay Bora runs third ahead of Griffin Peebles, your championship leader in fourth place. Gianmarco Pradell in fifth. Mikhail, uh, Mikhail Yada Pedersen in sixth place. Andres Cardenas in seventh. Machai Guadish is your first rookie in eighth place in the hastily repaired number seven car from MP Motorsport. Rene Lammers in the number nine sits in ninth. Dawid Decker rounds out your top ten. 
11th place for Francisco Macedo, Kiko Macedo in 11th place. Thomas Strauven, the winner from earlier on, is in 12th place. 13th place for Ernesto Rivera, as you see the recovery, uh, recovery process ongoing, which quite clearly tells you that we've got one more lap under safety car. Uh, 14th place, Flavio Olivieri. Uh, 15th place for Adam Hideg, Finn Harrison in 16th, Filippo Fiorentino in 17th, Enya Fry in 18th, Hedenius and Bianca Bustamante rounding out our overall top 20. Uh, Alexander Savinkov, Preston Lambert and uh, Lenny Reed in 21st, 22nd and 23rd. And then the second of the female drivers in the order after Bustamante is Leah Block uh, in 24th position. And you can see Leah just going into the first corner in the 57 car with the Blockhouse Racing uh, colours or logos on her GRS car. It is a, a happy accident that uh, black and green, a colour scheme associated with the Block family for so many years, happens to be GRS's signature scheme as well. So great to see Leah Block making her steps in junior single-seaters and... I think the progress across the uh, the F1 Academy tests across our events as well uh, has definitely been evident. And uh, after a season or a full year of uh, F4 running between our championship and F1 Academy, I suspect that Leah might be quite a competitive single-seater driver. He already is. And that progression curve is surely only going to continue as we go into 2024 in the summer. Ngozi, Beat and Bora, your top three then. Lights are still on on the safety car. And let's see whether or not the safety car is in this lap. It is in this lap. So the safety car uh, will be withdrawn, which is certainly good news for us because that means that as we just cross over half distance, the race will resume in earnest and the battles will resume in earnest as well. We've had some great fighting thus far this weekend at Motorland Aragon. And the continuation begins now then. James Agozi is the driver in control. He will obviously wait until after turn 16 to make his move on the throttle. But uh, we'll see when he pulls that trigger. He wants to try and get a car length or two over Jack Beaton. Something of a safety net into the first corner. Oh, and he actually pulls the trigger before the corner. That is uh, the first time we've seen that across any of our categories this weekend. Of course, they can't do an overtake before the safety car line. I hope everyone is cognizant of that. It does look like they're all single file through the hairpin. Agozi then pulls a fast one and goes early. Beaton and Bora not too far behind, though, in second and third place as this race resumes once again, with four teams in the top six, James Agozi for Campos Racing, the first of them. One car into the pit lane in the back of shot. That was Juan Cota, I think, back into the pits. Kabir Anarag and Maxime Ream, we saw there further back for us racing. Both of them have had a slightly bad run of it so far. Agozi, Beaton and Bori are top three, though. Two us racing cars in amongst that, along with a third in the form of Pradell in third. So, no, in fifth, sorry. So us racing having mixed fortunes across their five cars. With Reem and Anarag running 27th and 29th. There's Juan Cota into the pit lane for the second and the final time in this race. Started out with the race win, of course, at uh, Jerez in race three, did Juan Cota, but uh, neither Aragon nor Valencia before it have particularly gone to plan for him. Oh, Pradell very, very deep into turn 12 once again. Drivers just still being caught out by those tailwinds. 
And a dive up the inside there from Machai Gwadish on Andres Cardenas for seventh place. Cardenas now fighting back as they're side by side for P7. Igozi well out of range of Beaton. Bora, I think, safe from Pradell, but look at that scrap for P7. Wadish and Cardenas, who's going to be ahead in that one? It's three wide with Rene Lammers involved as well, but Cardenas is in that P7. Side by side as well between uh, Hideg and Olivieri further back. I think Nathaniel Berabi locking up there as well, potentially, or it may have been one of the Campos cars. It might have been Finn Harrison, actually. Uh, Cardenas and Gwadish side by side. Gwadish on the outside line. And Gwadish retaining seventh position after exchanging it several times with Andres Cardenas over the last few corners. Dawid Decker fancies a go at ninth place as well. He's up into the top ten for the first time in the race. Has to worry about... Uh, Kiko Macedo behind him as well. Rene Lammers taking the defensive line at turn seven. Certainly didn't feel confident that he wasn't going to get uh, lunged on there. Dawa de Decker. He's had his dancing shoes on between Valencia and this weekend, but uh, he's now back in the, uh, the racing numbers. Whether he's got those nice Alpine Stars racing shoes, I don't know, but he's using them to great effect at the moment from 10th place. Oh, a bit of a sideways moment there from Beaton as he tries his best to get within slipstream range of James Agosi. Griffin Peebles, I think, is looking likely for third place, or third place on Akshay Bora. And keep half an eye on that as they go down the main straight, uh, down the back straight, I should say. Peebles in the slipstream for sure on Akshay, and it's a very, very long straight. I don't think he's close enough for a move, but uh, Peebles certainly podium hunting, a recovery job from a poor start to his weekend. Qualifying didn't go to plan. Will this move go to plan? He dives up the inside. He takes third place. Does he carry the speed well enough through the apex? Yes, he does. Textbook, but Akshay Bora trying to get the inside if he possibly can. Griffin Peebles has to allow him that inside line, and it is side by side as they come across the line. Bora on the inside, Peebles on the outside, Pradell keeping a watching brief. Gwadish and Cardenas also side by side as they continue to fight over seventh position. I think Cardenas may end up with the better of that one as they come out of the corner. Can't quite tell from that camera shot, but uh, Pradell uh, now behind Griffin Peebles, so Peebles ultimately has ended up not just still in fourth place, but also under pressure from Gianmarco Pradell. And it was Machai Gwadish who got the better of the exchange with Cardenas. He remains in seventh. We have less than 10 minutes of this race left to go. And as is tradition in Formula Winter Series, it has been a turbulent affair. And I'm not just talking about the wind. Thomas Strauben there trying to find his way past Macedo to get back into the top 10, get back into the points after winning earlier on. Macedo wide around turn 10. The incident between cars 4 and 87 will be investigated after the race. That is Cota uh, and Alazari, of course, the moment that caused the safety car earlier on. Cars 5 and 14 are to be investigated at the end of the race for a jump start. Five is Castillo, 14 is Dobzanski. Cars 19 and 71 will be investigated at the end of the race for starting procedure, uh, the grid boxes specifically. So that's Anorag uh, and Ream. So no one at the front end of the order, but some investigations have been declared by our stewards. Machai Gwadish still ahead of Cardenas. Meanwhile, uh, Finn Harrison a little further back there. Sorry, Nesta Rivera a little further back there under some pressure. There goes Gwadish once again defensive as Cardenas and Lammers sit on his gearbox. And Nesta Rivera on the... Oh, and we've lost quite a lot of the Technicar machine. 
uh, belonging to Lorenzo Castillo. Now, I can't believe that's imploded all on its own, as windy as it is. I just wonder if there's another car involved at all. That will have gone straight in the pit lane, of course, and there's a lot. You can see the wind is actually blowing the side pod. So significant are the uh, gusts around the Motorland Aragon circuit. Now, that might need a safety car or a particularly brave marshal to go and collect it, but the question is, did the rear wing and the bodywork come off on its own, or was there another party involved? Regardless, Castillo is in, and Castillo thinks he's done for the day. Angles for the garage. Enzo Tarnvinichkel is back up into 26th place after having to uh, bring the car in to resolve a puncture earlier on. Less than six minutes remain of this race, and James Agosi is in control. One and a half seconds to the good over Jack Beaton. Akshay Bora is in third place ahead of Griffin Peebles. Peebles is certainly a big threat to him. Don't know where the side pod has gone. It doesn't seem to be where it was last time we saw it, but Agosi and Beaton are one, two out there. Bora and Peebles third and fourth, and Peebles is again closing in in that number three. Lorenzo Castillo, I'm hearing, did collide with another party. We're not sure quite whom, but uh, Lorenzo Castillo has had a moment there. Meanwhile, Cardenas and Lammers side by side for P8. Lammers was just ahead coming over the crest of the hill, but Andres Cardenas gets back through into eighth position. So Rene Lammers uh, giving Machai Gwadish some reprieve there in seventh place as uh, the pack is really forming around Thomas Strauven. Strauven, who at one time was fighting for 10th place has fallen back through the order somewhat and is now under pressure from both of the cram cars from both Olivieri and Fiorentino as well as Finn Harrison Adam Hedeg is working well up into uh, 12th place he's uh, slowly edging back towards the top 10 Macedo has uh, some track limits warnings to contend with as well he needs to be careful in fact uh, we already have a, a track limits penalty and it is for Finn Harrison so Finn Harrison who's in the midst of battle in that uh, mid-pack vortex around 15th place uh, unfortunately he's gonna have a five second penalty applied to his race Griffin Peebles wants his p3 he's got car number three and the driver who celebrated his birthday on Thursday would dearly love to try and get a trophy out of this weekend and extend his championship lead over Andres Cardenas. Cardenas with Peebles, uh, sorry, uh, Peebles with Pradell right on his gearbox as well. This is a three-way battle now for third place. Tom Vinichkel and Leah Block have had a moment together. Meanwhile, Akshay Bora has pressure from the rear, pressure from the side as Peebles there loses out to Gianmarco Pradell. Pradell is through into fourth place and now senses an opportunity to try and get past his own teammate, Akshay Bora. Uh, it is us racing side by side then. Can Pradell go around the outside at turn one? I don't think he's got enough of the corner. Akshay Bora covers it off and remains in third place for now. But unfortunately, Leah Block and Enzo Tarnvinichkel have come together. The continuation of a rough weekend. Uh, for Leah Block, who of course uh, had contact earlier on as well at turn three on the first lap. James Agosi home free though at the front as the safety car has been declared. Safety car is out on the circuit. And with two minutes and 35 plus one lap to go, unless they're very confident that this safety car is going to be a quick one, that might be the race. Safety car is out on the circuit then. Leah Block and Enzo Tarnvinichkel still both in their cars. See that Leah's moving about, so is Enzo Tarnvinichkel. It seems they're both all right. Leah, I 
think, instructed to get out of the car there by the marshals. Unfortunately, a sad end to her Formula Win Series campaign before she goes off to uh, compete in F1 Academy in Jeddah. And a disappointing end as well to Enzo Tarnvinichkel's first weekend as a car racing driver. The Red Bull Junior, former world karting champion. And uh, not the weekend he would have liked. Crane will help Leah's car out of the gravel then. Now, if they can perform something of a miracle recovery, we could get a one-lap dash at the end of this race with 90 seconds less than on the clock. Uh, we will start the penultimate lap of the race this time. Clock will hit zero in the first sector of the lap and we will then be on the penultimate lap. Um, could just about get it done in time for a one lap dash if they're quick and efficient. However, <laughs> if you're James Agosi, I don't think you want that personally. Uh, Jack Beaton has been knocking around the podium all weekend and I think he'll be very, very hungry uh, for an opportunity to move up the order. We do have an important bulletin on the screen though. Cars 25 and 19 are both getting five second penalties. 19, Kabir Anarag, 25, Arthur de Rizon, both for track limits. Uh, so that is uh, 24th and 25th place cars. They will free fall through the order, particularly because, of course, the safety car is out and that bunches everyone together. Finn Harrison, de Rizon and Anarag have all received penalties then. Let's recap the order as the clock ticks down to zero. Ngozi, your race leader, beaten second, Bora third, Pradell in fourth, a trio of us racing cars behind the Campos machine in the hand of our leader. Griffin Peebles is in fifth, Mikel, uh, Mikel Yada Pedersen is in sixth place, Machai Guadish is the first rookie still in seventh place. He'll more than likely continue his forever war with Cardenas and Lammers if this race does resume. Ernesto Rivera is in 10th place. Kiko Macedo in 11th. Hideg in 12th. The Decker, Strauven and Fiorentino round out your top 15. Not had a bulletin yet to declare the situation with the safety car. We'll see whether or not the uh, recovery is complete. I am hearing now that the recovery is complete. Uh, Igozi then may well face a one lap dash. The recovery is complete in the eyes of our camera ops. We'll hopefully see that in just a few seconds for ourselves. If we uh, rotate over, we didn't get a look at it, but the safety car light is out so it is indeed going to be a one lap dash the clock has hit zero but that dastardly plus one l on the graphics means that we've got one last lap of racing here in the formula winter series we've got one last dash for james agozi to withstand the pressure from beaton from bora from pradell and griffin peebles i wouldn't want to guess in what order that top five will be by the end of this final lap because if there's one thing uh, more unpredictable than Formula 4 racing, it's Formula 4 racing when everyone knows they've got one last lap and they're all together on the same piece of tarmac. Egozi, does he wait until after the turn this time for the safety car restart? Yes he does. Coasting, coasting and going. James Egozi launches away once again then. Doesn't have a massive advantage over Beaton, but he should have enough that he won't face pressure into the first corner. Nonetheless, he still tries to break the toe as best he can. A buck and a weave. Into turn one we go then. A one lap dash to determine our final winner in the Formula Winter Series for this weekend. We saw Preston Lambert there on the defensive for 23rd against Kabir Anorag. They'll be doing that all throughout the order on this final lap, but it's going to be the front end where it matters the most. James Agosi will be looking to hold on with everything he has in this battle. 
48 car has been in the front, at the front, from the word go, of course, our pole sitter, James Agosi. Beaton, Bohr and Pradell, though, will all be looking to try and set themselves up nicely for 12, 13, 14 and 15. If you're Jack Beaton, you're hoping that Bohr and Pradell don't uh, try and do anything behind you, as Lenny Reed there, in fact, uh, sorry, Hedenius, tries to get up the inside, I think, of Bianca Bustamante there. Everyone heads towards turn 12 then. This is the critical final few corners of the lap. A few cars locking up. Macedo there going deep into the corner. And he loses it. Macedo will lose 11th place then to Adam Hedeg. Overcooks it. Loses control of the car. And an auspicious end to a difficult weekend for Macedo. Mikel Pedersen trying to break the slip for sixth position. He looks like he's under the most threat of all with Gwadish and Cardenas behind him. I think the top five should stay approximately as they are unless there's a big dive. What's going on though for sixth place is almost three wide. Cardenas tries to go deep. He can't do it. Pedersen should have covered off the threat. Dedeka and Hideg fighting it out for 11th position. But our winner coming across the line now is James Egozi. He has done it. He beats Jack Beaton to the line by two tenths in a spectacular race here at Motorland Aragon. Akshay Bora and Gianmarco Pradell third and fourth. Griffin Peebles in a fifth position. Peebles is uh, still going pretty quickly, but he has taken the flag. Mikel Pedersen takes sixth. Guadish takes seventh and Cardenas ends up in eighth place. Rene Lammers in P9. Ernesto Rivera rounds out your overall top 10 in a very dramatic race here at Motorland. And there's Kiko Macedo on his final lap. Having a moment all of his own there. The tailwind pushed him wide. And then as he tried to catch the car, he ended up in a tank slapper. Macedo will be classified 28th regardless of whether he takes the flag or not. But an unfortunate end to his day. James Agosi, though, your race winner. Griffin Peebles will fractionally extend his championship lead then with fifth place. He will score 10 points and Cardenas will score four if I'm doing that maths correctly. Uh, so that would mean, uh, I think, a seven point advantage uh, for Andres Cardenas. I'm uh, oh, sorry, for Griffin Peebles over Andres Cardenas. Gozi and uh, Griffin Peebles want to get out of the cold pretty quickly, don't they? It's one of the faster cool-down laps I've seen this weekend. Um, they want to get a hot cup of uh, coffee and uh, a chat with Izzy, and that'll do. <laughs> Just uh, get the trophy and, and, and get a jumper, I think, is probably the plan. Gozi heads into pit lane then. As the race winner, a great result for the newly minted Red Bull Junior driver. I don't think it's been formally announced, if I'm being completely honest, but you'll see why I have to acknowledge it in a minute when he gets out the car. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. Uh, the 48 car pulls up to the grid then, or pulls up to the, uh, to the number one spot then. There is Egozi, showing why he's been signed that particular race suit. Campos team delighted with his efforts there. Of course, we'll see him in the Spanish series as well. Continuing that set. Uh, Run a form with Campos, and is that Tom Vanichkel? Yeah, Enzo Tom Vanichkel there having a chat with James Agosi. And uh, James with a race victory, one that he will surely savour, his uh, best finish prior to today, or prior to this weekend, uh, was a fourth place at Jerez, so uh, 
James Zagosi on the podium for the first time. And it happens to be the top step that awaits him. Beaton and Bora making it to us racing cars, of course, on the podium as well. Machai Gwadish, the first of the rookies home in P7 as well. So he'll be up there on the top step once again. A testament to MP Motorsport's efforts uh, to get that car repaired again. I understand they were out there until something like 2 a.m. in the garage trying to uh, get the car sorted. They already had a new gearbox and engine in the thing by the time I left the circuit at about half nine last night. MP Motorsport, of course, a major operation, real big team in the world of Formula 4 and junior single-seater racing. You'd expect them to be slick, but no one slicker in this race than James Agosi. Let's go down to Izzy now. We'll go back down there in a minute to Izzy. I think we have to do a quick switch up down there and hopefully we'll get to hear from him before he disappears off for the podium. Uh, we'll hopefully get that in just a moment but uh, he will be delighted uh, with that result. Just two tenths in it. Jack Beaton wasn't going to make it easy for him and we can now go back down there to the podium. Welcome back down to the pit lane for the second time with our race three winner of the final race of the Formula Winter Series, James Agosi. James, first pole position, first win. That's a pretty good way to do it. Yeah, um, also leading the, the race start to finish, which was a nice way to close out the weekend. Uh, big thanks to everybody who's put in the effort. It's not a one-man show, it's a team effort, and I'm really happy to be able to stand on the top step to close off the weekend here in Aragon. But they didn't make it easy for you, and uh, you did have quite an interrupted race with quite a few safety cars. So was that a lot of pressure for you inside the car? Not so much pressure. It's just realizing that the others were going to get another chance and I'd have to do my thing again. But, uh, yeah, that's not always amazing when you have a gap and then, you know, you're going to lose it all to a safety car. But uh, I just believed in the pace that the team would provide me for today, and uh, Jack couldn't get around me. So I led the entire race, and I'm just happy to have closed it out on top. And I believe Adam said in commentary you are a newly appointed Red Bull driver, as we can see from your Red Bull gear. So I'm sure you uh, want to say thank you to the Red Bull team as well. Of course, it's no secret now with the suit. But uh, yeah, big thanks to everybody in Milton Keynes who's helped. And uh, just big thanks to everybody. It's a team effort. And then heading into Barcelona, does this boost your confidence for the final round? I'm not doing Barcelona, but I'm sure whoever's going to get my car will have a boost of confidence oh. and believe in the material. What a shame. Well, congratulations anyway. What a way to end your time in the Winter Series paddock then. Congratulations. Thank you very much. We'll let him get off up to the podium. That's our final race. Brings an end to our Formula Winter Series action this weekend. James won't be in Barcelona, but the Formula Winter Series will be. So we're going to head back up to Adam and we'll see the Formula Winter Series next week in Barcelona. There we go then. I wasn't sure whether James would be there or not. Uh, he didn't do Valencia, so he uh, is only doing the two rounds. Anyway, let's go to the results of that one. Speed run time. James Agosi, your race winner. We'll hopefully get the graphics up in just a moment. But uh, Agosi winning from Jack Beaton in that one. Akshay Bora in third. Pradel fourth. And Griffin Peebles, championship leader, slightly further up now in fifth place. Sixth place for Mikael Pedersen, seventh for Machai Guadish, Cardenas Lemmers and Riviera in, uh, or Anessa Rivera, I should say, in 10th place. Hideg in 11th, Strauven in 12th, Dedeca and Fiorentino 13th and 14th. 15th place to Flavio Olivieri, Enya Fry in 16th place. Alexander Savinkov in 17th, in 18th place. Hedenius Bianca Bustamante, the first of the female drivers home in 19th position. Um, Reed in 20th, Preston Lambert in 21st, and Finn Harrison after his uh, penalty down to 22nd. Ella Lloyd in 23rd place, Victor Dobzanski in 24th, Edouard Borgna in 25th, Kabir Anarag and Arthur de Rizon in 26th and 27th. Macedo, despite his spin, will be classified 28th. Berebi, 29th. Block uh, in 30th, of course. Uh, with that collision with Tom Vinichkel not reaching the flag, 
And then the rest of your names there, all of course having various trials and tribulations, not making it to the chequered flag in a dramatic third race for the Formula Winter Series. It got very overcast during that race, didn't it? Looks like a completely different day as the race got started. James Agosi with a very, very good start to the race. He led into the first turn and to lead he would not let go of, as he said in the interview there. Agosi, beaten, Bora, your top three as we go running through the first few corners. And uh, well, there you go, Savinkov also making some good positions up in the early stages as everyone is in a scrum in the early stages of the race. Uh, starting from 10th place, Griffin Peebles did a good job of working his way up the order, of course, would ultimately end up uh, in the top five. Juan Cota with a big move there on Keanu Alazari, and unfortunately, it wouldn't be the only time those two went wheel to wheel, uh, and maybe even a bit more than wheel to wheel as well. Bit of a hip check there through 14 and 15 as they continued to fight for the position for third place as it was at the time. Akshay Bora got through as they both checked each other up at turn 15. And that then led to this side-by-side -side moment. Juan Cota bouncing across the runoff area, trying to get the inside any way he possibly could. And then unfortunately, the tires under rotate. He locks up Keanu Alazari, nowhere to go. Juan Cota and Alazari both out of the race. Safety car was out for a little while as Lucas Flusher uh, had some damage out there on circuit as well. James Gozi would continue on though. Another masterful safety car restart. He would lead as the race continued. Griffin Peebles was in the fight with the number 31 car. Akshay Bora uh, losing out to him there momentarily as they would continue to fight over what was uh, third position. Of course, uh, Pradell was watching in the wings, thinking I wouldn't mind a bit of this, and it would soon become a three-car battle as Peebles and Bora continued to fight. Lorenzo Castillo, he went low drag halfway through the race. Unfortunately, I understand there was contact involved in that. The two cram cars side by side at one point behind Thomas Strauven, who was outside the top 10 in this race after winning race number two. Gianmarco Pradell joined the fray in the scrap as Leah Block and Enzo Tarnvanichko had a coming together simultaneously. Akshay Bora back past Griffin Peebles and then Gianmarco Pradell snuck through for good measure. Peebles from fourth to fifth in that one. And uh, a one lap dash at the very end of the race was the last hurdle for James Agosi. And despite the pace of the 45 car, it was uh, Jack Beaton eventually having to settle for second place. Agosi did everything right on the final lap. Macedo, unfortunately, did one thing very, very wrong on the final lap and ended up in a spin. But it is Agosi, who I have to say is a Red Bull junior because you've seen the race suit. Uh, he is a race winner then in the Formula Win series. We'll miss him next time out in Barcelona. But we can now, as these highlights conclude, get ready to hand over to Lukas Gajewski, who awaits us on the podium for the Formula Wind Series. Thank you very much, Adam Weller. It's the last podium for Formula Winter Series this weekend here in Motorland, Aragon, with the big title decider coming up in a week's time in Barcelona. However, first of all, it's time to call our victorious drivers from today onto the stage and we kick off our podium celebrations with the rookie class please welcome in third place onto the rookie podium for campos racing ernesto rivera in second place for mp motorsports rene lamas and with another rookie victory to his name for MP Motorsport, it's Mace Guadish. Well done to Mace as we welcome the Gietlich Racing Organization team with Robin Seelbach, our Hankook tire partner being presented by Jakob Prasek and of course Andres Mendres from the Spanish Formula 4 organization presenting the trophies to our top three finishers in rookie class. And of course, Daniel, our championship photographer, 
uh, hard at work, of course, as everybody on a long day here in Motorland Aragon, gathering our top three rookies on the highest step of the podium. Uh, we are giving the uh, photographers downstairs in the pits some seconds as well. And then, of course, to round it off, can we please have a big round of applause? The rookie top three, Anissa Rivera, René Lamas and Marcel Guadish. And, of course, the rookie classification being decided in a week's time in Barcelona just as well. Next up, however, is our overall podium for the overall classification in the third and last weekend or race of the weekend in Formula Winter Series. And we start with the best team. Congratulations to Eduard Zelda and Campos Racing. Well done, Eduardo and Campos, just as well. In third place, for the first time on the podium, for us racing, is Akshay Bora. Well done to Akshay, third place in the last race of the weekend. In second place, for us racing as well, third podium of the weekend, for Jack Beaton. What a fabulous way to start his journey in Formula Winter Series. And for the first time on the highest podium in this championship for Campos Racing is James Egozi. Well done to James as we present the trophies to our... No, uh, hang on. Sorry, sorry. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the US American National Anthem for your winner for James Egozi. Well done, congratulations, James Egozi. And now, now <laughs> it's time for the trophies with Robin Silbach, Stefan, Stefan Lena from the uh, Gatelich Racing Organization, this time as well with the uh, trophy to Eduard Zelda and Campos Racing. And of course, we've got uh, Jakub and Andres with the uh, presentation of the trophies as well. Big cheers from the pits as we gather our podium finishes on the highest step and Eduardo from Campos uh, joining there just as well to round off the weekend. Fabulous racing in Formula Winter Series. Can't wait for the big season finale in Barcelona in a week's time. That's going to be exciting. One more big round of applause, please, for Campos Racing, Akshay Bora, Jack Beaton, and your winner is James Egozi. Thank you very much. So that's it for Formula Winter Series as far as this weekend here in Motorland Aragon is concerned. However, we've got two more races still in store for you on this afternoon in Motorland Aragon. And next up with the grid already being formed is the GT4 Winter Series. We've seen two sprint races earlier on this weekend. And now it's time for the big one, for the one hour enduro. And Easy Browning is downstairs in the uh, on the grid. We'll go down to Izzy then just as soon as we know she's ready to go, but we are almost ready to go with the hour long GT4 Winter Series race for SETI Motorsports. Jamie Day is your pole sitter for this one alongside Marcel Marshevik. So the championship battle on uh, spreadsheet and on paper is there in actuality on the grid as well. It's going to be an exciting race. Of course, we saw the Schnitzelaum car stop earlier on at the conclusion of race two after it won the race. So perhaps Izzy Browning might be able to do some detective work there on the grid uh, and find out exactly what went wrong earlier on in the day. And more importantly, whether they're confident the thing has been rectified. We'll have to wait and see there. 
Tom Lebanon and Alex Connor on that second row of the grid as well. And uh, we will hopefully go down to the grid before too long. Uh, Emil Yerdrum and Jaeger Kishin are on the uh, third row of the grid as well and all Pro-Am row two. Uh, of this grid of course if you're unfamiliar this will be an hour-long endurance race pit stop in the middle 10 of the race uh, 25 minutes complete and the window will open and once we're 35 minutes into the race the pit window will close so then the uh, grid already just starting to clear uh, down there and uh, we will no doubt soon see Werner Eichinger, the race director. In fact, I can already see Werner Eichinger, the racing director, making his way to the front of the grid where Izzy Browning is. Let's go there now. Hello, everybody. I'm stood down at the front of the grid. As Adam said, we have got the final race of the weekend for the GT4s. We've got Jamie Day at the start. He's uh, looking to get another race win like he did yesterday, but alongside him is that fast charging 11 Schnitzel Am with Marcel Martovitz in it first up, and then he will hand over to Joel Mesh. We heard earlier that he didn't really make the podium, so uh, possibly a bit of an issue. And as Adam said, I'm going to go and do some investigating down there. I do know that the one minute board is coming very quickly. They're keen to get this race started. But I will say the number 78 McLaren, they fancy their, ch their chances in this final race. I spoke to Zach Meekin just a minute ago and he said that the tailwind really helps them because it doesn't allow the Forsetti Aston Martin in front to charge off down the straight. So, as the GT4s have given us so many good battles already, I think we might be about to have another one with the McLarens and the Forsettis, and of course having that Schnitz Lamb in as well. Just saying in the background that we're just about to get the one minute board. But yeah, the GT4s never disappoint us. And I think they're going to give us a good race again. So final race of the day in Aragon for the GT4s. It's the 60 minute endurance race where the drivers will hand over in the pit stop between 25 and 35 minutes. And we'll go and do some investigating of what happened to that snitch lamb car. We'll see you then. Thank you kindly, Izzy. If you do get some word, let me know all about it because uh, it's still a bit of a mystery exactly what went down with Marcel Martovic at the end of race two. We saw the car stop between 12 and 13. Has to assume it's something hydraulic-y or gearbox-ish, but uh, not sure of the exact reasoning. Nonetheless, Jamie Day uh, will be the driver with the most on his shoulders. Day and Porter looking to get yet another win in the endurance race. But do you remember Zach Meekin's interview with Izzy after race two? It was something to the effect of, yeah, I know I'm going to win this race. <laughs> so Levin and Meekin uh, are going to be uh, ones to watch, as Izzy said, down there. Keep an eye on that elite McLaren. Uh, also keep an eye on some of those Pro-Am teams further back as well. They might be disruptors in this one, especially when the Pro cars are in there later on. Running through the grid in full in just a few moments time. But for now, the cars pull away for this 60-minute enduro. And so, as the cars are rolling, we will now take a look at the grid. Is going to, of course, be the championship battle, as we said, at the front. Jamie Day will be starting from pole position uh, in the Forsetti Motorsport. Number 19, Aston Martin Vantage GT4. Uh, the older generation Vantage, they've got a new one chilling uh, at the workshop at home. We'll hopefully see it again very soon. Marcel Marshevix in second place alongside Tom Levin is on road two of the grid with Alex Connor in of CV Performance just alongside also. Emil Yerdrum in fifth place is the first of the Pro-Am cars, the CV Performance number 85 
joined by Igor Hishin. In seventh place is Daniel Drexel in the Resume More Than Racing Cayman, joined by Alex Papadopoulos on row four of the grid. Max Huber and Mikhail Sander make up row number five. That's the AM and the Cayman Trophy uh, leaders, respectively. Wilhelm Kuhner in 11th place alongside Jan Nicholas Somershoff. Nicholas Kalus is in the Team Sur Grand Sport Cayman Trophy car. Uh, that is, of course, uh, formerly was going to be a GT4 entry, but then the GT4 uh, had an issue in race number one. Richard Wolf is meant to be in the Resume More Than Racing 81 BMW, but I don't see that car rolling on the formation lap. So it looks like we're down a BMW. But nonetheless... We will be going racing for an hour in just a few moments in the GT4 Winter Series. My objective for the evening is to try and figure out the mileage on that little Fiat Panda. And I wonder if how many of those miles have come here at Motorland Aragon. Uh, great to see uh, different pace cars every weekend. It's entertaining. Uh, Jamie Day has been the pace car for most of the time that he's been in the Facetti Aston this year. It's uh, obviously been a dominant season from Facetti Motorsport. Jamie Day spearheading the effort alongside Mikey Porter uh, and the rest of the team. And let's see what he can do from the inside. The Fiat Panda would pull in. Ideal pace car would be a Lotus Carlton, but I don't mind the Panda either. However, let's focus now on the race cars as we get underway for an hour. Who will lead it into the first corner? It's going to be Jamie Day, and I think Levin uh, may have a claim to second place. Oh, contact! Contact there! The Elite McLaren got nudged at the rear there. Carbon fibre flying through the field, and I think that might have been... Was it the CV Performance Group car that hit the Elite McLaren? Either way, the tyre has gone. Tom Leban and Zach Meekins hope go up in tyre canvas smoke, unfortunately. On the very first lap of the race, I didn't quite see every element of that incident, but what's clear is that Elite McLaren have a long race ahead of them. Lots of carbon fibre down there as well in the first few corners of the lap. Jamie Day then is your race leader as the NM Racing team car of Max Huber there getting uh, nudged or, or rather scared out wide a little bit by uh, Jaeger Hishin. We have Got the elite McLaren limping around at the back of the pack and Jamie Day surging forward at the front in third place. Alex Connor locking up there, going wide. Was he the other part of that uh, incident at turn one? I think he may have been. Huber just there being pursued by the 94 car of Nicholas Callus. So Callus immediately leading Cayman Trophy. He was real quick in the uh, Pro-Am car that he was running uh, prior to the engine letting go. And now we're seeing him muscle in amongst the Am cars and the Pro-Am cars in the Cayman Trophy machine that I think has been lent from uh, the SR Motorsport stable. Side by side then for uh, ninth position. No position gained there. Jamie Day leads from Marshavix by 1.4 seconds. Then Emil Yerdrum, Daniel Drexel and Axe Papadopoulos, your top five on the first lap of the race. Alex Connor has dropped down to sixth place, actually. So it's Emil Yerdrum, sorry, in the 85 car in third place. So Yerdrum had a very good start there. Yerdrum then running P3 and leading Pro-Am. see the kind of Pro-Am, Am and Cayman Trophy hybrid battle towards the back there with Heeshin, Huber and the Cayman Trophy cars. Unfortunately, you also see uh, the much wounded McLaren Archera GT4 of Tom Leban. If they do get that car back out there, it's getting back out there 
in a very second-hand state. And uh, being a GT4 car, it also runs five stud tyres instead of uh, centre-lock wheels. Therefore, getting the tyre off the car and replaced is quite a laborious process. So then Jamie Day continues to build his gap. In fourth place there, Daniel Drexel. He'd like to try and get an overall podium in the final race of the weekend if he possibly can. It's been a mixed weekend, a mixed bag for him so far. Of course, they had issues with the car earlier on in the weekend. Max Huber runs there in seventh place at the front of that long queue uh, further back in the pack. Yes, your Pro-Am second place, Papadopoulos. He'll be keeping an eye on Yerdrum more so than uh, Drexel ahead of him. And there you see them fighting to try and get the uh, canvas of the old tyre off the car as well as some of the uh, padding and externals from wheel arch. It's going to be a real effort to try and get that car back out there. They've got gaffer tape at the ready. Of course, they want to try and score points in the battle for second in the championship versus Joel Mesh. So they're going to try and get that car out if they possibly can. They score points if they can get into that top ten. Meanwhile, you see there Alex Connor looks like he's struggling a bit for car balance. Uh, not quite on the pace in the early going. Drexel still with Emil Yerdrum ahead of him, but I think Papadopoulos is the more imminent issue. It looks to me like the 36 car is closing in on the resume Porsche. Here they come through shot now, and yeah, that Mercedes, the NM Racing Team car that we've previously seen piloted by Alberto Di Martin and team boss Nil Montserrat is uh, not far behind Drexel at all and almost to the inside, is to the inside at turn 12. Papadopoulos through and of course that now means a headache for Emil Yerdrum because the Pro-Am lead uh, may be a bit less comfortable for him with Papadopoulos now hunting him down although Daniel Drexel the Porsche usually quick towards the end of this long straight. Maybe Drexel can try and fight back. There goes the McLaren, bearing its scars. And it goes back out onto the circuit. So Tom Leban will be hoping it all stays together now. It's no longer about winning. It's no longer really about much more than staying out there and hoping to have a claim to some points once all is said and done. Here comes Nicholas Kalus once again making life difficult for Max Huber. Huber and Hishin both go a bit wide going through turn eight, uh, 17, make that 16. On to the main straight we come. And Hishin leads the battle for seventh place. He runs third in Pro-Am of course as well. Huber, Kalus, Sander all in the queue. Wilhelm Kuhner not far behind either. He's gotten quicker and quicker uh, over the course of his tenure here in the GT4 win series in the Cayman Trophy class. He was a long way off in Estoril, but he's gotten faster and faster. The drivers press on up the hill towards turn seven. Shin. The rear view mirrors full of grey and white as they run down two turns eight and nine. The Corks group, Jamie Day at the front, leading by 1.3 seconds. And there's a big gap back to Emil Yerdrum in third place, who's got Papadopoulos hunting him down. And then the pack from seventh onwards, all pretty much in lockstep. It did look to me like Papadopoulos was really on the back of Emil Yerdrum as they went through 12 and 13. So perhaps there might be a move on there. 
and also might have Max Huber trying to get past the 24, but the Pro-Am lead is the one in third place, and I think Yerdrum might be under pressure a little bit. Wait and see in due course. Can't see from this camera angle, but uh, we continue to watch the third place battle in Pro-Am. Head down the straight, and uh, Max Huber again under pressure from Nicholas Callus. He goes to the inside line, he goes to eighth place. And he goes deep into the corner on his way as well. Max Huber continuing to pressure, goes two wheels on the grass there at turn 17. But Callus has gotten by, and Jaegor Gieschen is now going to have to worry about Callus behind him. Niklas, a driver with a good little resume. Very quick driver as well. And we're seeing Caymans once again act as the disruptors here in the GT4 Winter Series endurance race. Of course, the two SR Motorsport cars just going through shot there. The second and third place cars in Cayman Trophy. They will also be a force to be reckoned with later in the race once uh, Tim Neuser and Enrico Ferdera get in the two cars. Here comes Nicholas Kalus. Thought he was going to look to the inside for a bit at turn eight, but he wasn't close enough there. And in fact, here comes Huber. He gets a good run through 10 and 11, and Max Huber will be back past Nicholas Callus by the time they get to turn 12. Meanwhile, as they exit turn 13, the Pro-Am battle is heating up and heating up in a big way. Good run out of the corner there from Papadopoulos. I don't think it's going to be enough to draw him into the range of Emil Yerdrum by the time they get to turn 16. Yerdrum, uh, Stealing something from the copybook of the FWS by trying to break the slipstream a bit there. Of course, he came up through junior single seaters as well. Very successful in Norway, as a matter of fact, in single seaters. Daniel Drexel there going very, very deep into the corner. As the wind continues to uh, weave its chaotic hand through this race weekend. Driver's basically not on the track for the entirety of the straight there. Emil Yerdrum, Papadopoulos and Drexel. Through turn three they go. Papadopoulos will be handing over, of course, to Guillermo Eso. We've seen be very quick uh, in race one of the weekend. And then, of course, you've got Charles Dawson, who's also been getting better and better with each passing weekend. So I have no doubt that this Pro-Am battle is going to be one that endures across the race distance. Yerdrum and Papadopoulos head out of the seventh corner. Incidentally, Nicholas Callos is still ahead of Max Huber, so Huber didn't get the move done earlier on. Yerdrum be hoping there's no move to be made on him. There's your pair of leading cars. Jamie Day and Mikey Porter will be cheering on, or Mikey Porter will be cheering on Jamie Day from the garage at the moment. Well on their way to Getting more points critically in the championship. And Papadopoulos has gotten past Emil Yerdrum. Papadopoulos is past Emil Yerdrum. So Yerdrum has lost out on the Pro-Am lead. Will he fire back now as they approach the hairpin? I suspect he's going to. He looks to the outside line. And it looks like Papadopoulos has break quite late there, but he gets it stopped at the apex. Oh, and Yerdrum gets tagged there by Drexel. There seems to be an active campaign against the 85 car having an intact uh, diffuser on the rear of the car. Almost every race the diffuser seems to go on the back of that CV Performance Mercedes. Drexel has now passed Emil Yerdrum. 
because Emil Yerdrum is in the pit lane. So is it rather more than just the splitter? Alex Connor is now on the back of Drexel for fourth overall and third in pro. I think Emil Yerdrum may have something slightly more significant. Ah, drive-through penalty. My apologies, I missed that drive-through penalty. Car 85 causing a collision at turn one. That's lap number one. Emil Yerdrum was the driver who got into the rear of Tom Levin then. And Yerdrum has been punished as a result. So he's come into the pits to serve his penalty and drops down as far as, I think, 10th uh, place. Leaving Alex Connor and Daniel Drexel to continue to fight as Alex Papadopoulos disappears up the road in third overall, and more importantly, leading in the Pro-Am class. Here we see that battle then for third overall. Fourth overall, I should say, third in the pro class. And uh, the 84 car looming large in the wing mirrors of Drexel. However, that Porsche again just seems to have a kilometre or two more in its favour, kilometre an hour or two more in its favour by the end of the straight, but that's not going to deter Alex Connor. He goes for the dive and he gets it done, gets it stopped as well. And that was a very well executed move. We've got double yellows at turn 10 while this is going on. So Alex Connor has gotten past. I think we might have a car in strife further around the circuit. Alex Connor almost went defensive into turn one, but I think realized he didn't need to. Drexel was far enough behind. Safety car is out on the circuit. Safety car has been declared. I think that will uh, benefit perhaps the likes of Jaegel Hishin handing over to Ivan Ekelschik. But for Papadopoulos, for example, uh, the advantage he'd now built over Jaegel Hishin is uh, suddenly gone. And Wilhelm Kuhner is the car that's gone missing. And it would be at turn 10, so in other words, the next corner along from here, but uh, not yet sure what's happened. What we know is Wilhelm Kuhner's car is missing and the safety car is out. Jamie Day then is your race leader. His 2.4 second lead that he'd uh, taken time to uh, build up is now eradicated. You see the cranes and the flatbeds heading towards turn 10 as well. So I suspect Kuna is in the gravel at turn 10. Just to the uh, just to the right of the uh, the camera shot we saw at the corkscrew. So, uh, unfortunately, Wilhelm Kuhner is likely not taking any further part in this one and is more than likely beached in the gravel if they're bringing the crane. This will uh, benefit uh, Daniel Drexel quite a lot as well, actually. Brings him back into uh, the podium overall hunt after losing out to Alex Connor. Connor and Drexel brought into it. And again, I think uh, the one to watch potentially, there's uh, seven and a half minutes until the pit window opens, of course. And Jaegel Hishin will hand over to the very, very rapid Ivan Ekelschik. And I can see Ekelschik uh, really being a factor in that podium battle, as well as the battle for Pro-Am overall, or Pro-Am class honors. going into uh, the second half of the race. Yegor is a, a solid young driver, but he's not yet quite at the level of Ivan Ekelschik. 
So the time that Jaeger has lost being eradicated by this safety car is going to do Ivan a lot of favours. Tom Leban would be uh, hoping this was NASCAR right about now and getting the lucky dog lap back as you do in uh, the Daytona 500 and the NASCAR Cup Series in general. Unfortunately, such such things do not apply here in the GT4 Winter Series. So uh, Leban is uh, going to have to sit there still two laps back at the back of the safety car queue with the wounded McLaren Archera. Of course, Emily Erdram, who we now know for sure was the other party in that. Uh, he actually has his uh, drive-through penalty rather eradicated by this safety car as well. So Erdram while he still obviously lost some track position, the time that was lost is now somewhat cancelled out before he hands the car over to Charles Dawson. So Jamie Day will be keeping an eye on those safety car lights, which... I would think are probably not going out for another lap, considering the uh, recovery vehicles were still very much uh, on their way a lap ago. I think we'll probably have at least one more lap under safety car, but Jamie Day is primed and ready to go should he need to be. I think we're going to get one more lap under the safety car. some heat into the tyres. The record for Facetti Motorsports in the Enduros was second place in Estoril. Won it at Portimao. Seventh in Jerez. And second place in Valencia. Can they get another win this time around? Marcel Marshevich would certainly have point or two to raise in his own favour as well as that of Joel Mesh still not sure exactly what went down with the number 11 car earlier on in the day when it failed to uh, get back to the pit lane after winning the race Jamie Day ever extending that uh, championship lead. And a bulletin has just come through on the timing screen to say that the pit window has been delayed to one lap after the end of the safety car. So effectively, once the safety car comes in, you can't follow it. But the next time by, you can go in. I am told by the ever vigilant. Lukas Gajewski, that the number 11 car had electrical issues. So uh, an electrical gremlin made its way into the system of the Schnitzelaum car then. And that is why it came to a halt earlier on, much to the chagrin of Marcel Marshevich, who fresh off winning a race immediately had the disappointment of uh, riding a flatbed truck back to the paddock. But a win is a win. 25 points is 25 points. just told that uh, Lucas had that information fed to him via Izzy as well so thank you Izzy for the detective work there will the safety car come in this time we await confirmation of that but uh, obviously we haven't seen Vili Kuna and how that's progressing so it's hard to say for sure uh, exactly what uh, what the situation is down at turn 10 Keep an eye on the safety car lights. We'll keep an eye on the timing screen. Of course, again, the pit window is to be one lap after the safety car comes in now, rather than at the 
35 minutes to go, Marker. So it's not going to be safety car, or so it's not going to be pit window in two minutes. It's going to be pit window in green flag plus one lap, basically. And it does look like we're going to get one more lap under the safety car as the lights continue to blaze on the polo. Funny how a Volkswagen Polo can look like a van up against uh, the GT4 grid, but it does look a bit like it. A lot of suspension travel as well, relative to the uh, relative to the racers. Your order then, as we start yet another lap, completed the tenth lap this time by Jamie Day is your leader, the championship leader, currently on course to further extend that championship lead as it stands over Joel Mesh who of course will take over the second place car from Marcel Marshaviks in the second half of the race Alex Papadopoulos in third position Alex Connor in fourth place he's third among the pros Papadopoulos of course is the leading pro-am car Daniel Drexel sits fifth overall sixth place for Jaeger Hieschen Seventh place for Max Huber in the AM class Mercedes AMG GT4, the NM Racing Team car. Nicholas Gallus sits in eighth and leading in Cayman Trophy. Emil, Emil Yerdrum is ninth position and Mikael Sander rounding out the top ten. Nicholas Gallus, of course, the leading Cayman Trophy car. The rest of your order is Somershoff, Leben. Unfortunately, no Vili Kuna at the back anymore as his car has come to a halt out there on the circuit. Tom Leban is uh, at the back of the queue now, so he's... Uh, gotten to rejoin at least but uh, of course even though he is at the back of the field he's still going to be uh, a good couple of laps down and while this is all going on we continue to side eye that timing screen to see <laughs> when or when did we just <laughs> did we just cut to someone using the portal <laughs> I think we did uh, right then let's see if the uh, safety car will be in this lap it's usually a long back straight where those lights go out we haven't had any bulletins to suggest a safety car in yet we watch the lights intently with the hope of getting the race back underway day weaving some heat into the tires just in case he needs to use them imminently but he's not going to get the chance just yet it will be one more lap before the safety car is in then Jamie Day be able to hand over to Mikey Porter. Marcel Marshaviks won't be over to hand over to Joel Mesh et al. until the safety car is in. Coming into this weekend, Fossetti had a 45 point advantage over Joel Mesh in second place. That will have extended some way subsequently. I'm not sure of the exact on that front. But the championship battle as it stands would just about roll on to Barcelona, but uh, heavy favourites would be for Seti Motorsport in the overall championship. Of course, Marcel Marshaviks missed Estoril, so he's on a slightly lower score uh, than Joel Mesh. Tom Levin and Zach Meakin were hauling their way back towards the uh, second place fight in the championship against Joel Mesh. But uh, if things were to finish as they are right now, uh, it would certainly be a uh, sway in favour 
of Joel Mesh in the second place fight. Pit window would normally be just over three minutes old, but again, the window will open one lap after the safety car comes in. So there'll be one green flag lap post safety car before anyone is allowed to pit. Oh, and there we get the first look at Willi Kuhner's car, Wilhelm Kuhner. And uh, it wasn't just the gravel. He's taken some of the paint off of one of the barriers. Hopefully he's okay. And uh, that car, certainly not. goes some way to explaining the length of the recovery. It's just being t pulled away now. So we'll see whether or not the uh, safety car might make its way in now. The light's still on. You can see that the light is dimming now as well. We're getting towards the evening, getting towards the golden hour. Albeit it's not going to be that golden with the cloud cover overhead currently at the moment at Motorland Aragon. The light's still on the car at this point of the lap. I think, again, it's going to be one more lap before the cars are free to go racing, before the drivers are free to vacate their seats to their colleagues. And the window, as I understand it, would still be the full 10 minutes. So, potentially, if you're the pro driver in a Pro-Am lineup, that is uh, quite a useful thing. Should your Am value results over track time, and you've got a bit longer to hustle your way up there. Emil Yerdrum there in amongst the Cayman Trophy cars. Of course, he will be somewhat relieved, I suspect, that uh, the drive through penalty has been cancelled out. I don't think the marshal at uh, turn four is waving that flag in the back of shot, incidentally. I think that's just the wind. <laughs> oh, no, I do see some arm movement as well, but uh, it might actually just be trying to hold on desperately, clinging to the uh, king, clinging away to the flag. Another look there just briefly at uh, Kuna's car in the back of shot, and yeah, that thing is probably... Probably in need of a repair that will go beyond what we can do at the circuit. So they might end up pressing that 94 car into service for the SR Motorsport entry next week since they kindly donated it to uh, Sir Grensport. I don't think the word donate strictly applies, but uh, since the car is running well with Sir Grensport, I suspect it might end up being an SR Motorsport entry in a week. Providing that uh, Vili Kuna is okay and wants to go racing again in Barcelona. Once again, we wait with bated breath to see a bulletin, to see some information in regard to the safety car. Yeah, and this really does play into the hands of those supporting an AM driver in the Pro-Am class, or uh, I'd say it plays in the hands of uh, Nicholas Kalus a bit as well. Of course, if you... Hearing some indication that... Uh, the safety car is anticipated in soon, but the lights suggest not this time, at least. So, T minus one more lap with my fingers firmly crossed is the uh, the diagnosis here. Ah, now the race has been red flag, uh, red flagged, and the bulletin I will read you verbatim. Uh, well, I would have done if it hadn't just disappeared off my screen again. Um, race will be restarted. 
race direction will allow driver change during the red flag due to exceptional circumstances. Well, it technically says exception circumstances, but uh, I get the point. So they're going to red flag, bring everyone in, and then driver change by yeah, the sounds of it. If Ryan's going to drive to that side in a second, I might not see if there's barrier stuff or whatever. You might be able to tell us. We'll have to see uh, quite what happens next then in this one. Whether or not there may be uh, some barrier damage or something of that nature, whether this is purely to. Uh, eliminate the pit window or whether it's uh, whether it is more a matter of making sure the track is ready to go first we'll have to wait and see but the clock has been stopped at 27.28 in the race and uh, in the meantime we might well see uh, some of the driver changes going on down there in a more leisurely fashion than normal under the red flag as drivers swap under red flag as uh, race direction has suggested. It's going to be a fascinating race. It's effectively going to become a sprint race, isn't it? With the, uh, with the situation as it is. There's Joel Mesh running along with a, a seat insert. He and Marcel Marshevik's uh, slightly different shaped people, so they need an insert. And uh, yes, the most casual driver changes I've seen in many a moon <laughs> ongoing down there at the moment. There's no need to rush it. They'll be thinking to themselves, all of those laps that we spent in free practice drilling the driver change, what were they worth, ultimately? <laughs> because as it turns out, uh, they can now just do it at their own leisure. Hopefully get some uh, chats with the drivers getting out of the cars then, as this uh, situation unfolds under red flag. And as you can see, the... Uh, debrief ongoing between some of the teams having a little bit of a chat discussing maybe how the car is feeling how the tires are doing and uh, I've just been sent an image from uh, someone in Alpha Live uh, and there is indeed some barrier damage that needs rectifying at the moment uh, by the looks of it that's on the inside of the exit of turn 10, so that would imply that uh, Wilhelm lost it and then went to the inside barrier. Just listening in there to Emil Yerdrum, giving some tips and tricks to uh, Charles Dawson. And once again, TV performance have to break out the tape on the rear of that Mercedes. Not the first time, hopefully the last time. Just getting some information from Robin Selbach of Giedlich that uh, Sug Rensport actually carry a spare, a spare car in the form of a uh, Trophy Cayman, so uh, it isn't a SR Motorsport car, so there was no schnitzel exchanged in order to get hold of the uh, of, of, a, of a spare car from SR Motorsport. It was Sir Grensport's own car uh, that uh, they had in the back. Apparently, unliveried Cayman Trophy cars are uh, a common thing <laughs> just lying around the paddock, and uh, so Sir Grensport moving into their own Cayman Trophy machine. Of course, those Cayman Trophy cars also a regular part of the, uh, the NLS and uh, racing in Germany. So quite a few of the uh, Porsche specialist teams have them. There are some battle scars as well on the Razoon more than racing Porsche. 
is the additional CV performance car as well, the 84 machine. Good to have that with us for the first time this season. Alex Papadopoulos, the American racer, getting some conversation there, or rather, Asso now, of course, in the car, I should say. Guillermo Asso will have taken the car over from Papadopoulos with the, again, exceptional circumstances to uh, quote directly. But everyone has done their driver change. There he is. Mikey Porter at the front of the queue now. In at the number 19, Mercedes AMG GT4. Hopefully we can get uh, a little bit of conversation as this red flag goes on because I don't think it's going to be a matter of two or three minutes before this race gets back underway. Uh, We'll see if we can hear from anybody down there, but uh, it will be a completely different race that resumes. It will, again, effectively be one of the 30-minute sprints, won't it, once all is settled, because uh, we've had all of these driver changes. The first half of the race almost becomes like a qualifying race for the main event. That will be the run to the flag. Mikey Porter will take over the leading car. He will have to deal with Joel Mesh uh, for the remainder of the race. Alex Connor's third place car, the 84, uh, will of course now be in the hands of his co-driver Lachlan Robinson. He looked pretty feisty in race one of the weekend. Fourth place, that car, the Pro-Am leading machine, formerly driven by Emil Erdrum, will now be the domain of Charles Dawson and then I think potentially the driver that's benefited by this more than anyone else um, Ivan Ekelchik will take over from Jaeger Hishin in the second place car in Pro-Am uh, Ekelchik a young silver driver a quick young pro he will be uh, diving headlong uh, into the uh, into the battle and uh, Charles Dawson, as much as I have seen the improvement curve, he's going to be hard-pressed to stave off Ivan Ekelchik for the duration of the second half. But he will give it a very good shot, I'm sure. Sixth position, Daniel Drexel may also gain a couple of places in the overall running for the compacting of this grid. Oh, look who's out and about as well in the back of shot. Kenneth High is off to investigate what's going on see him there suited and booted of course ready to go for the GT winter series race and uh, you can see that there is a five minute board in the hands of one of the Motorland Aragon officials so with any luck uh, I'm going to see that displayed soon, which would be a jolly good sign uh, for our chances of getting this race back underway imminently. We reiterate, if you're just joining us, the race under red flags at just over half distance. The pit window uh, never came, and they have instead elected for a situation where under red flags, the drivers could be swapped out by the teams and they will effectively get them rolling again in a sprint race format, as it were. Albeit with a single file restart. Once again, see Kenneth Iyer having his wander down. He might be off to go to chat to Joel Mesh or something like that. Um, in fact, yes, he has gone down to the 11 car. Of course, he'll be racing in the GT3 in a bit. I have some uh, intel that the uh, barrier is almost repaired. Uh, so it isn't going to be too long now, they understand, until we get this one back underway. 
think my aspirations of uh, consuming the banana in my hands will have to wait until after the race. But otherwise, it's all very good news because that means we will get this race underway in very short order. So the situation in the points is something that I can now talk a bit about post-race two, uh, thanks to the efforts of Robin Selback and the team at Giedlick Racing. Effectively, it is somewhat stable between uh, Facetti and Schnitzelam because they both have 25 and 15 point scores, one first and one third place this weekend, which means they're still 45 points between them, which means that uh, come what may, the racing or the racing for the championship will continue on uh, into the final weekend at Barcelona. You see there some of the beautiful old buildings here uh, at the around the circuit. I think that might be the Parador, where a lot of the crews are staying this weekend. The castle at the top of uh, Alcanif. There is the uh, the hearty powder. Now, is that a 100 HP, or have I been misrepresenting? Keep an eye on the back of the car. Keep an eye on the boot lid. Do we have 100 HP? We do. Therefore, I'm going to make an offer on it. <laughs> it's a good little car commentary colleague Tom Brooks had one of those. I think he's now sold it, but um, you can say that for quite a lot of cars with Tom. <laughs> Hello if you're listening, Mr. Brooks. Of course, he is the voice of Formula E this year. He's loving that gig. And uh, he and I actually shared our first ever commentary gig together back in the day. Three minutes until the restart then. So restart at 16.56 is the conclusion from downstairs. So we will, in short order, get this race rolling. Once the cars are rolling behind the safety car, uh, the clock will start ticking down again. No formation lap situation post red flag, of course. We'll see the cars roll and no pit window from here, so it is effectively just a sprint race. And we can see everyone being waved away now from the cars as they are almost ready to roll with two minutes until the end of the red flag periods. So for Mikey Porter, he has quite a challenge on his hand with uh, hands, plural. He does have two of them. Uh, Marcel Marshevik's handing over to Joel Mesh. Mesh is a very confident young man and a very quick young man as well, as is Mikey. That's going to be a proper duel. And then the 84 car, of course, in the hands of Lachlan Robinson as well. I'm still not ruling out as well a, a charge from uh, charge from fifth place from the Vimvert Motorsport team, uh, Ivan Ikilchik, who at times was challenging for the overall lead back at Estoril, you may remember. Also had a solid effort at Portimao. They didn't show up with us in February, but they're back in the thick of it again now. Now, rather interestingly, I note that the CV Performance 85 car has ended up in fourth place with what I assume was the lap count back. And if I'm remembering rightly, that car was ninth when the red flag came out, which means the effect of the drive-through was actually completely eradicated eventually. Whether or not that is... Uh, how things will be, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, long and short of it is, in under 20 seconds time, these cars will roll. 15 seconds time, thank you, sir. 
And it will be 15 seconds until the cars roll and the clock resumes on this race. It will be Mikey Porter that leads them off. Mikey Porter with the most pressure on his shoulders as they go into what's effectively a 27-minute sprint. Camera crew is hard at work. I still want to know if this cameraman is also a racing driver because he's got the helmet for it. But some mysteries are perhaps best left never found out. Mikey Porter, of course, in the Facetti Motorsport cars, had so much success alongside Jamie uh, over the last several weeks. He's also, of course, finally got that first solo win at Valencia, which uh, cost his manager, James, precisely one tattoo and probably, uh, well, not a few drinks, actually. I don't think Mikey's old enough for that yet, but <laughs> whatever the equivalent is when you're a teenager, I guess getting the word safe tattooed on a grown man is the equivalent to uh, having someone buy a few drinks. <laughs> but the... Clock is ticking again now with 26 minutes and 20 seconds left to go. The point situation after race two is this. 262 points for SETI Motorsports. After the first two races here, Schnitzelam Racing's Joel Mesh on 217. The Elite Motorsport McLaren on 202 is what I'm told. But of course, uh, Elite Motorsports are in trouble in this race at least. A lap off the field and down in 12th place. The safety car, as one would anticipate, is coming in this lap, which means that in just a few moments' time, we are going to go racing. The GT4 Winter Series effectively running four sprints this weekend by virtue of the safety car. By virtue, I should say, of the red flag. There's the uh, still extremely uh, damaged Elite McLaren. They're going to be cannibalizing the spare car again, I think, before Barcelona. already missing a door. What can Joel Mesh do about Mikey Porter at the front of the order? What kind of challenge can be surmounted from third place Alex Papadopoulos? I'm noticing now that the timing screen order is quite significantly different from the order on the circuit, which might explain some anomalies such as uh, Charles Dawson being shown in fourth place. So as they get back underway, it's Mikey Porter from Joel Mesh from Guillermo Aso, I believe. And look at that immediately. Joel Mesh has got a brilliant start and he will get past Mikey Porter at the very first opportunity. But no, he spins and he really does do a good job or everyone else does a good job to avoid him. But as everyone stayed on the circuit, grass was being kicked up. Everybody continues on their way. Mesh went from hero to zero very quickly indeed that Mikey Porter then with a bit of a get out of jail free card courtesy of that mistake from Joel Mesh Guillermo Aso therefore is in second place and leading in Pro-Am third place is Lachlan Robinson fourth place Daniel Drexel fifth place is Ivan Ekelchik and oh another spin that's Charles Dawson and I think the suspension has let go on that car it looks like the rear Right has completely collapsed on that thing. Drama, drama, drama. As the car now gets going again, but that thing needs its garage quite badly. The 85 car is in the wars. Aso then in second place with a golden opportunity, potentially at an overall podium as Lachlan Robinson 
plays uh, something of a rolling roadblock here in the battle for third place currently. And look who's all the way up in sixth. Look who's all the way up in fifth. It's Max Huber, the AM class leader. He gets past Ivan Ekeltrick. That is very good going from Max Huber, but Ekeltrick now fires back as they come down the main straight and Huber realizes he's not gonna get the best of that, tucks in back behind. We've got some stricken CV performance Mercedes parts being uh, rescued by a marshal there. Lachlan Robinson goes deep into the corner. It's side by side for third place between Robinson and Drexel. Drexel with a nose to the inside at turn 18, but here comes Ivan Ekelczyk. He's the only one with a clear run through the final corner. He's got the momentum. He's being offered the middle of a three wide situation. Drexel deep, deep, deep into the corner on the brakes, but he gets it done. Holds on to third place overall. Ekelczyk moves up to fourth overall the expense of Lachlan Robinson Max Huber is now on the back of him as Ekelchik is right there on the back of Drexel for third overall also getting involved in this albeit a lap down is Zach Meekin Max Huber probably isn't aware that uh, Meekin is a lap down there's your top two, Mikey Porter disappearing up the road, Guillermo Eso trying to give chase. He's a solid driver, but I'm not sure he's going to be able to keep up with Porter. The big question actually for Eso is whether he can hold on to that second overall in the Pro-Am car, whether he can hold on to the Pro-Am lead. He is a bronze driver, but he's a quick bronze driver with some great successes behind him in Spain. 85. It's rather unceremoniously retired to the pit lane then. Hopefully that car is fixable ahead of Barcelona. The battle for third place in pro then is the thing that uh, I think we all want to see out there on the circuit. Wait to see some action. There we are. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, all in one big queue. Well, actually, no, because the Elite McLaren isn't in the scrap. That caught me out for a moment. But uh, Ivan Ekelschik going for third overall here. Daniel Drexel. I think makes it fairly easy there for Ivan Ekelschik. Oh, and both of the Mercedes going deep there, Robinson and Huber, and that allows Manuel Lauk up to fifth overall. Manuel Lauk in the 99 car. I hadn't thought about that possibility. He now makes it a uh, Pro-Am, three Pro-Am cars in the top five. Daniel Drexel doesn't realize he's not racing Zach Meekin strictly. He's trying to go defensive against him. Meekin is showing what he could have done had the car not being taken out early doors. Mikey Porter leads by 4.9 seconds then over Guillermo Eso, who will now be the next target of Ivan Ekelschik, who is through into third overall. Manuel Lauk is also, if he can get past Daniel Drexel, going to be a factor in that Pro-Am battle. Here he comes, trying to get around Drexel. We've seen Lauk race magnificently previously in the GT Winter Series. He's now racing the GT4s with East Racing. He's up the inside and through into fourth overall. We haven't seen a move at the corkscrew many times this weekend. He gets it done. He's up to fourth overall, and he will now give chase from third in the Pro-Am class. Ekelchik and Lauk are going to make life very difficult indeed for Guillermo Eso, who I'm sure is being coached every inch of the way here by Neil Montserrat on the headset. Neil, the team boss, of course, he is here this weekend. He's simply not at the wheel. Max Huber just behind Lachlan Robinson. Through turn 15 we go. Oh, and Huber dips a wheel on the gravel there. I was going to say, I thought he put the power down quite early. Clearly an iota too early. There's Joel Mesh in the back of shot from ninth place. Now, with Mesh down there in ninth, only scoring a couple of points, again, the championship won't go to Porter and Day per my maths, but it will be 
a very, very, very big advantage going into the following weekend at the circuit Barcelona Catalonia. Seventeen minutes and twenty five seconds left on the clock in this rather compacted endurance race that we've ended up with. Mikey Porter just needs to lap carefully, lap sensibly, really, at the front at this point. Max Huber leading AM, the only car that started in AM with Richard Wolf missing the start. He's going to win AM regardless, so he's really just in it for the kicks at this point, and he's having a great fight with Luckland Robinson. Ivan Ekelchik is the latest driver to be pursued by Zach Meekin, regardless of Meekin's true position on the circuit. Elite motorsport car on a roll. We've had a few track limits warnings for Christian Kuhn in the Team Sur Grand Sport car. Manuel Lauk lurking behind Ivan Ekelchik in third place overall be it with the significant buffer of uh, spares and repairs looking McLaren Archura between them the elite motorsport car of Zach Meekin who felt like he had a real shot at winning the race sadly not getting to fulfill that uh, prophecy Max Huber has gotten past Lachlan Robinson at the back of shots as well so he's up to sixth overall he's gotten past uh, the pro am, uh, the pro class car, so a pro rated driver, a silver rated driver, Robinson, losing out to Max Huber. Huber, a bronze rated driver, but a, a bronze rated driver who does a lot of driving, both in modern and historic racing. He's raced cars like AC Cobras uh, in historic competition. There goes Ivan Ekelchik up to the rear now of. Guillermo Aso, so we now have the Pro-Am battle on circuit for the lead in Pro-Am, second overall as well. Zach Meekin playing spectator as Ekelchik closes into the rear of Aso, who gets tagged there. Oh, and Meekin really doesn't need to be so involved in this if he can avoid it. I respect that he's got the pace, but the last thing he wants to do is knock out the Pro-Am battle. It's the Pro-Am top three battle now because Manuel Lauk is there as well. It's a three-car scrap for Pro-Am honours, second overall, and there's an interloper as well. This could be very, very dramatic stuff. Guillermo Aso is currently doing, well, currently getting favours from Zach Meekin. While Meekin is behind him, uh, Ekelschick and Lauk are... Uh, being staved off basically the McLaren is playing rear gunner right now for Guillermo Aso whether intentionally or not the answer is or not Aso there a little bit sideways out of 12 Ekelchik will be aware of the situation now I'm sure someone has told him you're not racing that car and Zach Meekin goes through oh and he doesn't leave room for Guillermo Aso, Aso into the gravel then. And that allows the Pro-Am Porsches to go seething by Guillermo Aso. Uh, that's a shame really for the number 36 crew, Ivan Ekelchik now deep on the brakes, still thinking he's fighting the 78 by the looks of it. Now it's Manuel Lauk and Ivan Ekelchik side by side for the Pro-Am lead. And they just about managed to avoid each other there. Oh, it's getting very, very close. They touch. Coming out of the final corner, Guillermo Aso sends his opportunity. He now tries to get to the inside of Manuel Lapp, but that's not going to happen there. The best thing that can happen really now for this fight is for Zach Meekin to clear these two or these three and let them get on with it. Manuel Lauk certainly is getting on with it. I've heard rumours and speculation from Manuel Lauk that Manuel Lauk will be racing in the GT Winter Series next weekend. 
least that was the plan a little earlier in the year. Through turn seven they go. And Lauk senses an opportunity to elevate himself and Jan Nicholas Somershoff to Pro-Am honours. He's just going to find his way past Ivan Ekelchik without allowing Guillermo Eso an opportunity to get through. While all of this has been going on, Mikey Porter has cleared off at the front of the order. 14 seconds to the good. So easy stuff now from... Mikey just needs to get that car home. He's circulating a good second and a half off the car's ultimate pace in the race, so I think he is just managing. Oh, and Guillermo Eso has pushed it a step too far. He ends up facing the wrong way. He falls then behind several of the other cars. He will not lose third in Pro-Am because fourth in Pro-Am is in the pits. Charles Dawson... Uh, has ended the race in pit lane, of course, with that suspension issue. But Guillermo Eso loses a lot of overall position and his opportunity to potentially salvage a Pro-Am win. So then the second place overall battle, the Pro-Am lead battle, is now just too strong between Ivan Ekelschik and Manuel Lauk. Lauk still just four tenths away last time across the line in the battle for second overall. Ekelchik and Lauk uh, vastly contrasting drivers from an experience standpoint, but uh, seemingly quite similar on pace out there on the circuit. Daniel Drexel losing a bit of time to them. Twenty-four of the ninety-nine power out of turn seven. The wounded McLaren disappearing up the road from them. A lap behind. Meekin can now have some clear track to try and uh, get some quick lap times in there and see how the car is feeling after the various damage. You can hear the wind. Listen to that. been no let up on that front all day for the most part don't understand it gone down a bit earlier on but in general the wind is proving to be the defining factor of the day here at Aragon and well out there rotating the car nicely through turn 14 A kick up of gravel there from one of them. I'm not quite sure whether that was uh, Ekelchik or Lauk. Ekelchik is under a lot of pressure from Manuel. Manuel, who's been driver coaching for East Racing all season, gets his opportunity to do some racing now. And we're very much enjoying watching this. This is something of a, a, a slightly scaled down version of the battle we saw last year. Remember, Manuel Lauk versus Mikael Kapfinger. Uh, no, Mikael Jus, I should say. Mikael Jus versus Manuel Lauk in the season finale of the GT Wind Series last year. One of the most exciting battles uh, in series history. In the GT Winter Series, that was of course in GT3 Porsches. In the GT4s, it's again Manuel Lauk who found, finds himself in a very exciting scrap. This time around, it's for second rather than the overall lead, but it is of course the Pro Am leading battle. Joel Mesh has worked his way up to sixth overall as well. He's on the back of Max Huber. There is Mesh through the shot there. So after his spin, as the race resumed, Joel Mesh is knocking on the door of the top five once again. Lachlan Robinson ahead of Tim Noiser, the Cayman Trophy leader. And then Guillermo Eso, of course, recovering from his 
dramas as Manuel Lau, oh, he almost had a go into turn 14 there. Ivan Ekelchik defended late. He's now got a very tight angle for turn 15. This could be the opportunity for Lauk, who drifts the car out, gets on the gravel a little bit there. That might have compromised his run a bit. Uh, we will see if he can make a move into turn 16. I don't think he's quite close enough, but uh, I'm not a driver. Drivers have different viewpoints from me on that kind of thing. Sure enough, Ekelchik goes defensive, and that could be the opportunity for Lauk now. They're side by side through 17. Lauk gets a much better run through the corner, straightens and uh, minimizes turn 18 as well. Some very cool racecraft here from Manuel Lauk, but uh, still not getting past the number 24. It's a great dice for second place overall here. All these Pro-Am honours. Another showcase of everything the GT4 Wind Series delivers each and every weekend on the Giedlich Racing Winter Series package. There's Drexel in fourth. Joel Mesh has gotten through into fifth overall as well, so he's past Max Huber. Two Caymans are down through turn number 10 now. And here is Guillermo Aso still on the back of Noiser and Lachlan Robinson. Three different classes, Pro, Cayman and Pro-Am, all going at it at once. And uh, Robinson with the best of that right now, but we'll see how Noiser and Aso go from there. Mikey Porter, 16 seconds clear at the front, while this battle for second place isn't going to change into the hairpin, I don't think. Lauch still too far back. Looked like Noiser and Asa, Asa were side by side there as well. So we'll see if that order changes momentarily. Deep into the corner goes Ekelchik. Ekelchik there did not get the run. But he would have needed out of the corner. I wonder how close Lauk is going to be by the time they get to the first corner. Not close enough is the answer. With Echelchik going deep there, it did look for a moment as if uh, Manuel might have a go. Of course, Joel Mesh, he'll be back on the pro class podium now, and he might yet get second in class as well, because he's closing in on Daniel Drexel with four and a half minutes left to go. Lachlan Robinson fighting for seventh overall here with Noiser, who is much braver on the brakes there. He's side by side now with Robinson, and Robinson uses the torque of the Mercedes AMG GT4 to hold on for now. Guillermo Aso, of course, still looking to recover and save some face after his mistake earlier on. Still side by side as they go through five. In what order will they come into view at seven? It will still be Lachlan Robinson just ahead. Tim Noiser still has to make do. Three different classes represented in one battle. Lachlan Robinson again going defensive, doing everything he can to hold off Noiser and Aso. There is Drexel being closed in by Joel Mesh, and just ahead of them, I wonder how Ekelchik and Lauk are looking this time at down the straight. Robinson, oof, a little bit sideways there, coming out of T12. Noiser and Aso sitting on the rear of the one remaining CV Performance Group Mercedes AMG GT4. I think it's still 
even Stevens between Ekelchik and Lauk. In fact, Ekelchik has been quicker than Lauk on this lap, so the gap has extended. Meanwhile, Tim Noiser to the outside of Lachlan Robinson. He got a good run down the straight there. I thought the Cayman Trophy cars were less powerful. Oh, he went too deep into the corner and loses out ultimately to the other Mercedes of Guillermo Aso. So now Lachlan Robinson with another adversary behind him in the form of Guillermo. Close to the armco they are at turn one. Goodness me. Uh, yellow flags at turn 11. Not sure for whom. Ah. Looked like there was some gravel there, but I didn't see what it was. Ah. It's a stray Christian Cohen that has caused the uh, yellow flag down there. Mikey Porter won't be far away, so hopefully Porter... Uh, gets to see that car and avoid it as <laughs> once again Guillermo Aso is now on the back of Lachlan Robinson who hasn't had a moment of peace in this race since taking over the car during the red flag it's been all systems go all defences up for Lachlan Robinson one minute and 15 seconds left of this race incidentally so Mikey Porter is going to cross the line to start the 26th and final lap next time by in the GT4 Winter Series. To the inside then goes Aso. Trying to get a good run around the corner. Christian Kuhn, I think, has had enough for one day. He's limping the car back as... It's three cars still in the fight for seventh overall. Robinson, Aso, Noiser. Here comes Aso to the inside. Everybody's got the cars stopped just about. Noiser with the inside line into turn 17, but I think Aso is going to get the better run. Yes, Aso then remains in eighth place. He now once again leads the charge up to Lachlan Robinson's rear. Robinson with the rare luxury of a whole car length between himself and the car behind for just a little while. We are on the final lap of the race though. And Mikey Porter is well clear at the front. Ivan Ekelchik is still just uh, six or seven tenths clear of the Manuel Lauk car in the battle for second overall. As well as the Pro-Am win. Mikey Porter is a man on his own island at the moment. It's a very safe island indeed. A big gap between himself and the chasing pack. Side by side there between Daniel Drexel and Joel Mesh. I think Joel Mesh has gotten past Drexel there. He had a nose ahead as they went through turn 10. So that will be second in the pro class for Joel Mesh. Mikey Porter on the brakes into turn 16. Joel Mesh has done enough, I think, to get through. He's got the car ahead for now. And unless... Daniel Drexel does something special out of turn 15. I think that's all she wrote. That is not special. That's not a good run at all out of the last corner. Uh, Joel Mesh will not be challenged. Mikey Porter is our race winner, though, alongside Jamie Day. It's a race win in the GT4 win series for Porter and Day. Uh, the battle between the various classes has shuffled again. Tim Noiser now ahead of Robinson. So this is shifted again. Ivan Ekelchik has won Pro-Am and set, taken second overall. Manuel Lauk has taken third place. And Guillermo Aso way too ambitious in the final breaking zone of the lap. He goes straight on but will at least reach the flag in ninth position. 
I'm sure that was a scare for Noiser and Robinson. It's Noiser that crosses the line seventh and takes the Cayman Trophy win. Ahead of him, Max Huber has crossed the line to take sixth overall and the AM class honors. And uh, Guillermo Aso, after a <laughs> dramatic race, uh, flashes the headlights. I think he enjoyed himself in spite of all that. Crosses the line in ninth. And Zach Meekin has already taken the flag, of course, a lap down in 10th. Christian Kuhn has also taken the flag to finish 11th. Well, there we go. We've still got one more race to contend with this weekend here at Motorland Aragon. That, of course, being the GTs, but their little brothers, the GT4 Winter Series cars, have uh, once again delivered here at Motorland Aragon. Three spectacular races. Spectacular races or maybe even four sprints given the timing of that red flag during the mid-race. But uh, Mikey Porter and Jamie Day won't mind that. They'll celebrate the win all the same. They will celebrate an extended championship lead. Again, I think it's a hand and four fingers that are on that championship trophy. The 19 car rolls down the main straight then Zach Meekin will be uh, I'm sure pretty happy he had a fun stint there working his way through the field and then getting some clear track space at the end and uh, he proved there that the car is A-OK -okay mechanically even if the bodywork is damaged so that will be useful information for uh, Elite McLaren as well going into next week 19 car though, Jamie Day, Mikey Porter celebrate at yet another endurance race win in the GT4 Winter Series. Towards the pit lane goes Mikey Porter then. He'll be greeted by Jamie Day, Joe Holloway and the team. And uh, so Porter and Day, Joe Holloway and everyone else. OK, we're going to go to the results before the podium, uh, before the interview then. Mikey Porter claiming the win in that one ahead of Ivan Ekelchik in second place, the 24 car. Of course, the Pro-Am winner in second overall. Manuel Lauk taking P3 overall and uh, second in Pro-Am in a very good battle there. Joel Mesh taking fourth, uh, second in Pro-Class as well for Schnitzelam Racing, ahead of Daniel Drexel. Max Huber, sixth overall, the only Am car left standing after a tricky weekend there. Tim Noiser wins Cayman Trophy for SR Motorsport, just pipping Lachlan Robinson in a great battle to the line. Guillermo Aso finishing ninth and choosing his own adventure in the last hairpin of the weekend. Zach Meekin rounding out the overall top ten. Cohen just reaching the flag. Charles Dawson and Vili Kuna unfortunately not able to say the same. But it was Mikey Porter that took the win in the GT4 Winter Series. So then we will see, of course, the next grid out there in a few minutes. And uh, we will now see uh, whether or not we can get an interview. We will, of course, see the podium uh, in the next few moments as well before we shift focus to the, uh, to the GT Winter Series, which uh, has been really very exciting indeed this weekend. The uh, battles between the AMG GT3s. Um, ten cars at the ten cars at the uh, entry list only. I grant you, but it has been a very exciting uh, set of races so far, and we are no doubt going to see another Mercedes battle at the front in the GT3 class with uh, SR Motorsports car, the sister car from Schlitzlaum Racing, and also PTT uh, up at the sharp end. And 
Rinaldi Racing's Porsche 991.2 GT3R also going to be on the grid. Of course, Cup 2 uh, with six of the 992 GT3s, although we know that there won't be a couple of them. The Rakar Motorsport car, unfortunately, uh, is no longer going to be racing this weekend after the damage sustained in race one. As for the other cars, we'll have to see. There were two others missing earlier on. And uh, while we shift focus briefly to the GTs, we see the celebrations ongoing in the GT4s. I note that James isn't wearing shorts, so we can't get his uh, tattoo on camera. That's uh, that's a strategy. I suppose it's not shorts weather, so I can't really blame him for that. Uh, Mikey Porter uh, is getting his helmet off, and I think in just a few seconds, Izzy Browning is gonna dive in there with her mic and hear from our winner. Yeah, we're down here with Mikey Porter, our winner. The Forsetti boys have taken another win. Mikey, so excited. You drove straight past us in the pit lane, but still an amazing drive from you today. Yeah, slightly missed it. Uh, don't know what I was doing, to be honest. But yeah, no, uh, told him done an amazing job. Jamie, Jamie did an amazing job um, bringing, it, bringing it into me in P1, and I finished the job. You know, done a great job. Everyone's done a great job. We'll win the series, and um, yeah, I can't thank everyone enough. And it's more of a sprint race for you than an endurance race. So uh, how was the wind and the track when you finally got out there? Yeah, it was a bit strange, red flag, and then, you know, them letting us do a driver swap in the middle. Um, yeah, I mean, the wind is um, different, changes all your braking points and everything. But, um, yeah, you know, just managed it and bring it home in V1. And for you guys, the championship, I'm afraid, does go to Barcelona, but the momentum is very much with you guys. I mean... It's been a fantastic season for you so far. I obviously have seen you race in Genesis, but this is a massive step up and you just look so confident in that car now. Yeah, it's a big step from something so little, got a lot more power, a lot more everything. But um, yeah, I think I've taken to it quite well. And um, yeah, looking good for Barcelona. And finally, yourself and Jamie have announced this week that you're going to be doing the British GT Championship together. I think you two might be a force to be reckoned with. You seem to work pretty well together. Yeah, hopefully. We've bonded a lot over the uh, past four or five months. Um, yeah, British GT, you know, another step, and um, I'm looking forward to it. Congratulations. We'll let you go enjoy the podium. Mikey Porter, our race three winner. Wow, the Forsetti boys are turning into uh, quite the unstoppable pair together. We're going to go back up to Adam for all the replays of that race. A very interrupted race. I did tell you that the GT4 would be an interesting, interesting watch. They never disappoint us. So back up to Adam for all the replay. Well then, let's take a look then at some of the moments from that race. Uh, this, I think, was after the uh, red flag. Yes, it was. This was Joel Mesh getting a very, very good restart as we came back to green flag racing in the second half. Ah, but it didn't last long, did it? A spin in the first corner. He would be down to the back of the order. He'd recover well, but unfortunately for him, there was no more uh, chance of a win. And unfortunately for Charles Dawson, no more chance of a Pro-Am win either. The suspension seemingly collapsing on that 85 car. It did get a few knocks earlier in the race. Meanwhile, Ivan Ekelchik was making his way through the overall and the Pro-Am order, albeit with some interruption from the AM leader, Max Huber there, who uh, dived up the inside uh, to gain a position only momentarily as Lachlan Robinson continued to get uh, dispatched by drivers. Drexel got past him. Uh, Ekelchik would follow soon thereafter as Ekelchik's sight were f set firmly on Guillermo Aso in second position, the current Pro-Am leader at this point in the race, the 24 car uh, of Ekelchik getting past uh, the 84. But Drexel holding on to third overall at that moment in time. It was side by side for the Pro-Am lead after Guillermo Aso lost the lead in the class to Ekelchik. It was then side by side for second overall and the Pro-Am lead. Aso tried to give chase, ended up in a spin. Ekelchik was ahead of Manuel Lauk and that is a situation that we would not see change again uh, before the end of the race despite the best efforts of Manuel Lauk who put on a real uh, racing masterclass, masterclass just trying uh, to get himself past the uh, 24 and the 99 having a great scrap there and uh, it was certainly 
uh, a case of Manuel Lauk doing everything he could, everything that could be reasonably expected of him, but nothing was doing. Lachlan Robinson ended up being pursued by both the uh, Tim Noiser car, the Cayman Trophy leader, and Guillermo Aso as the race went into its final minute. Noiser lost out to Aso at one juncture. Uh, the recovering Christian Cohen was limping home to the chequered flag after his spin. Lachlan Robinson felt that he was sure of seventh place. Guillermo Aso thought he was sure of a move into the final corner. Couldn't get it done. The 84 car uh, dived into seventh, remained in that seventh place. And that was that. In that battle, Mikey Porter wins overall. Mikey Porter and the crew now on the podium with Lucas. seem to have a bit of an audio issue there with Lucas. In due course, I'll clear the airwaves again for him. Uh, but we should have them up there. We do have them up there in the top three. So that's Daniel Drexel, third in the Pro-Am class. In the Pro class, I should say. Second place in Pro going to Joel Mesh in the Schnitzelalm Mercedes, along, of course, with Marcel Marshaviks, but it's Porter and Day again on top in the pro class. So once again, Forsetti Motorsport unmatched at the top. Trophies presented then by Sergio Fonseca, Robin Selbach, and a representative from Pirelli to the Pro Class winners. Daniel Drexel looks pretty happy with his efforts. It's been a difficult weekend for him, so I think to an extent, quite happy just to see the flag as they pose for the pictures. So then the pro class podium continues. I think uh, Lucas Gajewski is trying to direct the drivers without a microphone. It's hard enough to do it when they have a microphone. I'm disappointed by the lack of commitment to champagne spraying, but I do like the finger guns from Joel Mesh. There's a running joke there going on between Joel Mesh, Enrico Ferdera, and our uh, videographer Emilio on that front. Anna Estevez and Stefan Lennart putting some more champagne up for our next podium, which should be the Pro-Am category. The Pro-Am class, of course, uh, really hotly contested over the course of that race. And uh, it was, of course, eventually a battle between those two Porsches. But the team that finished third in Pro-Am was Alex Papadopoulos and Guillermo Aso. Third in the Pro-Am category. A great result for them. Second in Pro-Am, uh, falling to Tomashoff and Manuel Lauk. Uh, great to see Manuel racing for the first time on our package this year. I don't think it's the last time either from what I've heard, but it's Wimmer Havert Motorsport on top in Pro-Am. Uh, Ivan Ekelchik suggests that he's going to spray some champagne along with Jaeger Hishin there, judging by that uh, body language, which is good news. Trophies represented again by representatives from Giedlik and from tyre partner to the GT4 Wind Series Pirelli as uh, Daniel Bjergen continues uh, to uh, take the photos here uh, on the podium. Ekelchik and uh, Hishin. Look pretty happy with their efforts in that one. And the champagne bottles are being readied. Yes, here we go. They spray the champagne. Great stuff from everybody. A bit more commitment to the cause. And I think Ivan Ekelschik was inviting a shower there uh, from Jan Nicholas Somershoff.
So the AM class will be next, we believe, although there is only one uh, in the AM class, that, of course, being Max Huber. Hence, there's only one bottle of champagne. So Max Huber uh, had heads up there for what would be the penultimate podium before, of course, the, uh, the Cayman Trophy guys get out there. Max Huber, of course, is our winner in the AM categorization for NM Racing Team. Here he comes to the top step. He lost all of his competition. They started out with three in the AM class, but he'll still be pretty happy with his efforts getting in amongst it in the overall battle. So then Max Huber vacates the podiums. As, as you may have heard there, the car's already rolling away for the formation lap on GT Wind Series. Fortunately, being quite a compact grid for their 55-minute enduro, we can speed through that quickly at the conclusion of this final podium. Just the two bottles of champagne, of course, because of Willem Kuna's crash before the red flag. Hopefully, he's doing well. But for now, we can pay attention to Christian Cohen. Uh, going up there with Nicholas Klaus to take the second step of the podium for Serg Team Rensport in their spare car, the Cayman Trophy car, and up to the top step of the podium with applause from their rivals. Tim Neuser and Mikhail Sander will secure the honours in the Cayman Trophy category. Again, representatives uh, from Pirelli and Gielik Racing presenting the trophies to our winning drivers in the the Cayman category, Noiser and Sander uh, on the top step once again in Cayman Trophy. And they'll score some good points over Kuna and Ferdera in the Cayman Trophy class championship battle as well uh, with their absence from this particular podium. Champagne sprayed one more time then. And while that's going on, I imagine it's now time to switch focus to the GT Winter Series. So then, cars on the formation lap, and it is going to be Kenneth Heyer starting the number 11 SR Motorsport Mercedes AMG GT3 Evo. Uh, let's quickly run through the grid, uh, not in vision, but in sound. PTT Racing's car sadly not present. He said to me he might do the endurance race, but Martin Kazmarski uh, isn't there, unfortunately. David Thelinius is lining up second in the grid overall alongside uh, the leading car then. Uh, Pierre Ellett on uh, third place. Fourth place, Hubert Darmetko, who I understand is sharing with Matthias Lizovsky. Fifth position, Pablo Brass. Sixth position, Joachim Bulting. Werner Panhauser and Pedro Brass set to complete the order. So just the eight cars, unfortunately, taking the start for this one, but still some interesting battles to be had here, particularly, uh, I think, among the Cup 2s, but also Kenneth Heyer isn't going to have it all his own way as well with David Thelinius behind him. So the 55-minute enduro in the GT Winter Series begins now. We are underway. We are racing. And look at that. Pierre Ellett having to dive to the inside. He gets to second place, though. Thelinius is rather rudely punted down the order there. Not literally punted, but he is a long way down in the GT3 car. He got swallowed whole there as the race began. Kenneth Heyer then leads the way. Pierre Ellett in second place. Third place is your Cup 2 leader, Joachim Bulting. Fourth place uh, is uh, Pablo Brass at the moment. <laughs> Kenneth Heyer then heads down to the corkscrew for the first time and is our race leader. He'll probably be quite relieved that his recurring sparring partner, partner Martin Kazmarski isn't there right now. David Thelinius will be the complete antithesis of relieved that he's fallen behind all of these pesky Porsche Cup cars. Um, Hubert Darmetko has also dropped a lot of positions there. I think he got caught behind Thelinius on the approach of the first corner, which is why Darmetko now finds himself struggling and off oh, the inside there. 
goes David Fellinius. He gets uh, past Hubert Darmetko then. Darmetko up to, or down to, I should say. What is, oh, well, he's gone back past now, never mind. David Fellinius then losing out to Darmetko uh, for sixth place overall. This is not a great start at all uh, for Fellinius, unfortunately. He's going to have some work to do before handing over to Moritz Viskirchen in the mid phase of this race. It is a 55 minute endurance race, of course, here. So 55 minutes of racing to come. And uh, the pit window will open with 25 minutes of the race complete. Ergo, uh, with half an hour remaining in the race. Joachim Bolting on the back of Pierre Ellett. He uh, could face a bit of an issue there with Ellett maybe getting in his way a little bit with Pablo Brass just behind him. Uh, Ellett is uh, not a bad driver by any means, but Bolting, if he's hustling that cup car, might end up on the back of the GT3. Panhauser and Darmetko fighting for third in cup two here. And look at the speed that Darmetko carried there. That is confidence in one's car and one's setup personified there from Hubert Darmetko. He gets through into fifth overall, third in cup two once again. And now Thelinius says, well, I'll have a go at that too if you don't mind. And goodness me, uh, the Mercedes nearly felt the brunt of the attempt. Was uh, a little bit close for comfort there between the two. Panhauser bouncing across the curbs at the corkscrew. Higher and Elliott, 2.1 seconds removed from each other at the line, but that gap is surely extended in the battle for second overall. Uh, Balting and Brass, uh, third and fourth. Oh, Darmetko very wide into the corner as well there. Darmetko, I think, maybe slightly over-pushing as he tries to make up for uh, the loss of places off the line. Zelenius so then con continues to shadow Werner Panhauser. Again, not the start to the race that he would have enjoyed. Elliot keeping an eye on Bolting, and I love how the Porsche's bonnets lift. Uh, the cup cars, quite a few of their bonnets lift as they get to the end of the straights, um, as the air starts to get uh, dissipated all around them. Elliot and Bolting, just a few tenths apart then. That is going to be a battle for second overall before long, I think. Uh, Pablo Blas. Uh, is in fourth. Here comes Thelinius. He's to the out inside, I should say, of Werner Panhauser. And uh, for now, Panhauser stays ahead. The Mercedes should be quicker, of course, uh, in the corners. And sure enough, I think that's going to be the position made by Thelinius. Yes, sixth place then uh, for the triple one. goes David Linnaeus then up into P6 overall meanwhile at the front of the order Kenneth Iyer is extending that advantage five seconds to the good and then you've got this battle for second overall with Hubert Darmetko closing in at a rate of knots and I do think my hypothesis regarding Pierre Ellett might not be too far wrong in that the times of the cars behind are about four seconds off the quickest laps we've seen uh, out of cup cars this weekend. So I think Pierre in corners like this is actually slightly holding up Joachim Bolting, which is bringing Pablo Brass and Hubert Darmetko ever closer to the rear of the 38 plus line racing team car. Pierre Ellett there deep into turn 14, gets it stopped for 15 regardless. It's a great battle here between the four very, uh, very fast Porsches. Of course, two different specs at play with the GT3 leading the trio of 992 Cup cars. Here comes Balting, having a look to the inside. Of course, if he can get past Pierre Ellett, Ellett is then a bit of a buffer for Joachim, and Joachim might have the opportunity to do just that. Yes, he powers out of the corner and gets himself into second overall and puts Pierre Ellett between himself and his Cup 2 adversaries. That was very heads-up stuff then from Joachim Balting. 
he will continue to press on in second overall. And he'll be hoping that Pierre Elliott staves off Pablo Brass and Hubert Darnetko for as long as possible. He will get the chance to break free. And I think for Bolting's chances, it's particularly important uh, that uh, the number seven car remains ever so slightly hindered uh, because it will be taken over by Matthias Lizowski. Matthias Lizowski, who of course has driven solo in uh, previous uh, endurance races here in the GT Winter Series. He's won every single time uh, in Cup 2 in the solo races. So... The longer that Hubert Darmetko is held off in the number seven car, the better it will be for, uh, for the 38. Felinius is also starting to close in uh, on the cars ahead. Now that he's passed uh, Panhauser, he can start to use the potential of that AMG. He's lapping quicker than anybody else uh, outside of Kenneth Heyer now. Heyer already some 10 seconds clear. Bolting, Elliott, Brass and Darmetko, your top five. Darmetko looking to the inside there of Pablo Brass. Rounding turn 15 they go. And now Darmetko is right there in the wheel tracks of Pablo Brass. We've got the rather show-stopping newcomer who debuted in GT Winter Series uh, in Estoril. Debuted in racing with us in the GT Winter Series versus the Spanish GT champion from last year. Defending champion, as it were, or at least the reigning champion, Pablo Brass. And for now, Brass is holding on despite the best efforts of Hubert Darmetko. 10 seconds, the gap between Haya and Joachim Bolting. Bolting, of course, not shooting for those particular stars. Oh, and Hubert Darmetko, the slightly ambitious lunge to the inside of Pablo Brass there. Oh, Brass loses it a bit there, kicks up the gravel, have slightly dirty tyres on his left side, but still gets it through turn three very quickly. And, uh, well, Pierre Ellett is now getting to disappear up the road while this battle for fourth place continues. Which is about as ideal as the situation could get for him. To the inside there goes Hubert Darmetko in the seven. Darmetko just gets through. So Darmetko is past Pablo Brass. That's very important in the Cup 2 battle. He gets through into second place and now he can try and pursue Pierre Ellett, but I know for a fact Pablo Brass isn't taking that lying down. We've seen him and Darmetko go at it previously on Villico Motorsport's previous appearance with Pablo Brass at the Autodromo Internacional do Algarve. Port him out. We have 45 minutes and 15 seconds left in this race. Kenneth Heyer is building his lead nicely. He's just nursing the car around, I think, uh, not testing the limits. There is second through sixth place in one shot. Mercedes gradually honing in on the cup cars and the GT3 of Pierre Ellett. Brake disc slowing there on Hubert Darmetko's machine. He now closes in quite rapidly on Pierre Ellett. I think it's already a good two, three tenths he's taken out of Ellett uh, in the last couple of sectors. So Pierre is more than likely going to come under fire from Darmetko for third overall in the not too distant future. into turn number five they go. Thelinius again just sneaking up there. He is lapping about a second quicker than uh, Pablo Brass ahead of him. So that Mercedes is more than likely going to get into it before too long as Darmetko there 
with a big step out there going into the corks group. And he's now on the back of Pierre Ellett, as anticipated. Here comes the battle for second then. Through picture, and there's a change for third place. Hubert Darmetko gets through. Darmetko then has recovered himself back up to third place. And his next target is the Cup 2 class winner. His next target is Joachim Bolting. And for Bolting, again, this is not the scenario he would have liked because uh, this means the car that's going to be handed to Matthias Lizowski is uh, right on his rear bumper and may even be ahead of him before the end of the stint if Hubert Darmetko continues on in this fashion. There's Pierre Ellett in the 115 going straight on almost there, a bit deep into turn 16. Of course, the wind still proving to be a big factor here. The tailwind into turn 16 has been making its presence felt all day. Darmetko. Will soon be on the back of Balting then. He's closing in very quickly indeed. His last lap was one and a half seconds quicker than that of Jürgen Balting, which means we've probably got uh, about half a lap before Darmetko is challenging Balting for the honours here. Felinius still closing in on Pablo Brass as well. Battle for second overall is the one that... Uh, promises to be the most frenetic over the next couple of moments as Balting and Darmetko fight it out. Darmetko looked like he was struggling with a bit of understeer there, maybe a bit of a wash out as he tried to follow Balting out of the corner. And there you see the situation. Balting versus Darmetko. Darmetko shadowing Jürgen. He'll be looking for a good run out of turn 15 here to try and get it done at the hairpin. Oh, no, he's not. He's going to do it at turn 15. A bit of a lunge there from Darmetko, but an effective one. He gets through into the Cup 2 lead then. Great move from Hubert Darmetko. Pierre Ellett uh, in fourth place is now under some pressure as well. Here comes Pablo Brass, whose cup car should be a bit quicker by the end of the straight, given the relative lack of downforce compared to Pierre Ellett. Goes to the inside line, can't get it done there, but Ellett is going to go straight on, is he? No, he just about gets it stopped. Uh, David Felinius, though, does end up going almost straight on. It's going to be a three-way battle for fourth place before too long here. Battle for second overall is now in favour of Darnetko. The battle for fourth overall is currently in favour of Pierre Ellett, but uh, the latter doesn't feel stable right now with Thelinius and Pablo Brass right behind him. Thelinius, of course, should be quicker through this section of the circuit in his GT3 car. Just crossing the line further back is Werner Panhauser and Pedro Brass as well towards the rear of the uh, Cup 2 category. Only eight cars in this race, unfortunately, with a couple of dropouts across the weekend. But we once again proved the GT Wind Series races are always exciting. Even when the numbers are limited. Thelinius runs in sixth position. He is possibly going to be the spoiler soon in that battle between Brass and Ellett. Ellett again under a lot of pressure. Thelinius using the brakes nicely there, much later than either Porsche on the brakes going into turn 12. Flashing the headlights as well, stating his intent. The battle for fourth place heads out. Onto the back straight once again, then does Pablo Brass have a good enough run to maybe challenge Pierre Ellett once again? Second in GT3.
Here comes Pablo Brass. Not quite able to get through. Yes, he is actually. Elliot's too deep into the corner. Pablo Brass gets through then into fourth overall. And now that Elliot has been overtaken by Brass, uh, I think Brass is probably going to get himself going up the road because uh, Brass has been looking a bit held up at times over the last couple of laps. And now the battle is for third in GT3 and fifth overall uh, between Elliot and Thelinius. I should say second in GT3, of course. So Thelinius now on the back of Pierre Elliot, and Thelinius looks a little bit more confident in his brakes than Elliot does in his. So one may suspect that uh, Pierre will come under pressure soon. He is firmly under pressure, but uh, that will only mount. As this three-car battle for fourth overall continues, Darnetko continues to extend his lead there in Cup 2, as you saw. Vaulting only 1.2 seconds back, but that's enough right now for Darmetko, especially given the weapon in the back pocket known as Matthias Lozowski. Brass, Eric Thelinius come through shot. And David Thelinius may well try and set himself up for a move here at the hairpin if he can get close enough. He Explores the track limit somewhat on the inside there of 13 to uh, ease the corner. Elliot bouncing across the curves there a bit. Wasn't a bad run out of the corner from Pierre. Now will he still be at the head of this battle for second in GT3 by the time they get to turn 17? They approach 16 now, and yes. Elliot gets the car stopped nicely, didn't overshoot again this time, so Thelinius is going to have to get this done, I think, uh, the hard way. It's not going to magically open for him. At the head of the order, SR Motorsports' Kenneth Heyer leads the way by 16 seconds over Hubert Darmetko. Of course, Jamo Hartling is still to come in that uh, SR Motorsport car, so uh, as long as Heyer stays mistake three as long as the car stays underneath higher and Hartling I suspect that uh, JMO is going to uh, take over a situation that should yield a fairly easy run to the flag battle for fourth place between Brass, Ellett and Thelinius hasn't uh, quite shaken out as I expected to be honest I thought Pablo Brass would get away however that hasn't quite proven to be the case Pierre Ellis has held on nicely and David Thelinius is uh, now stuck there behind them both the pace has notably increased from both Brass and Ellis over the last couple of laps as well in the dirty air of the Porsche up ahead. Can't really do much right now. Of course, that is the previous generation Porsche, the 991.2 GT3R. We're expecting to see some 992 GT3Rs again in the uh, GT Win Series next weekend, as I understand. And possibility as well of Pierre Ellett and Christian Hook being back in the 296 Ferrari from uh, Rinaldi stable Pierre Ellett sandwich then between Brass and Thelinius at the moment there's not much in it at all Spoken about this previously, of course, in these broadcasts, but Pierre Ellett's racing history. A very, very lengthy one indeed. Driver who uh, has sometimes resided in the US. A 67-year-old racer from Dusseldorf who uh, 
Started out in single-seaters in the mid-1990s over in the States, and has been a proponent of the highest levels of endurance racing for almost two decades. Dives to the inside here of Pablo Blas. Thought he was going to go for a move there, but not quite able to do it. Uh, looks like he's building confidence in the Porsche as well. It's... Uh, the American Le Mans series, the Le Mans series, FIA GT, and of course the Le Mans 24 hours have all been uh, taken on variously by Pierre Ellett, the World Endurance Championship as well. Pierre. stood on the podium in GT2 at Le Mans way back when and he's unfortunately maybe not going to stand second on the podium in GT3 after that he rather got hindered by Pablo Brass coming out of the corner had to lift out of the throttle to avoid the rear of his car and now Felinius is right in the wheel tracks once again Elliot deep on the brakes into turn 16 but uh, actually got it stopped just about perfectly there Dometko and Bolting have actually closed in on each other over the last few moments as well so Bolting is coming back to Dometko see how Bolting fares against Matthias Lozowski but one would expect Lozowski based on regular form to be uh, home free and clear of course uh, Hubert Darmetko I think will end up once all is said and done at the end of this weekend second in the overall championship in the GT Winter Series with Leandro Martins on the sidelines here Elliot once again Looking feisty as they run through the corkscrew section. Through shot they go once again at turn 11. A bit wide there from Bolting. Pablo Brass also very wide there. I think they might have been a renewal of the gusts of wind uh, from behind them going into turn 12 because everyone seemingly got caught out and went deep there. Ooh, and Pablo Brass almost spun there. Managed to catch the slide. Thalinius tried to dive up the inside of Pierre Ellett and ended up having to effectively stop on the apex at 15. Now Pierre Ellett is in the slipstream of Pablo Brass. Let's see if Ellett has the confidence to try and dive to the inside or... Will he go to the outside, perhaps? He goes to the outside. There was a car's width on the inside. Does he get the car stopped? No. That was a little bit ambitious, but uh, nonetheless, Pierre Ellett continues on. And had a jolly good go there at Pablo Brass in what is a very exciting little race here. Pit stop window has just opened. 29 minutes and 55 seconds to go. The pit window, of course, opening at the 30 minute remaining marker. As uh, the rally crossing there from Pablo Brass. Pierre Ellett again closing in then as Pablo makes that unforced error. This battle for fourth has been great entertainment thus far in the race. Powering now out of turn seven. Blas under some more pressure. Yellow flags, meanwhile, at turn 16, and that is for Pedro Lorino. Pedro Brass, uh, unfortunately, in a spin. And let's hope he can get that car going again. Doesn't look like it's hit anything. It's just not wanting to play ball at the moment. Yellow flag at turn 10 as well. So something's happened at turn 10 also. 
And that was where, ah, Pierre Ellett has gone missing. Pierre Ellett has gone missing. The number 115 car of Pierre Ellett is no longer there with Pablo Blas. Where is the 115 car? Turn 10. Briefly had yellow flags, they've now been withdrawn. Turn 16, yellow flags will also likely now be withdrawn. Hubert Darmetko is into the pit lane. So Hubert Darmetko is the first to blink and head into the pit lane. As he and Pablo Brass have also come in. David Thelinius too. In comes Thelinius. Villico Mode Sport doing their thing. Further back in the pack. Or further back in the pits, I should say. Just behind Tarmetko, as a matter of fact. So there are a lot of Porsches all in one place there. Of course, there is a minimum pit stop time that they have to hit here. So everyone will be keeping an eye on their respective watches as Darmetko, Darmetko's former car pulls away, now in the hands of uh, Matthias Lizowski. Thelinius making way for Moritz Viskirchen. And... Uh, Darmetko's car in the hands of Matthias Lizowski heads back out onto the circuit. And was it within the pit stop time? 76 seconds is a minute and 16, and the stop was a minute and 18. So, yes, that was all good. 76 seconds is the minimum pit stop time from pit in to pit out. There you see Kenneth Hyatt going into turn one as well. Continuing on in the... AMG GT3. There is Matthias Lizowski. Out on circuit in the number seven car. 992 Cup car making a wonderful sound. Pierre Ellis has continued on out there on the circuit. So whatever happened to Pierre, he is still running. According to the timing screen, there is the 115 car car is also undamaged so I suspect just a moment unforced error perhaps and it looks like he's maybe angling for the pits no not quite uh, one more lap then before Christian Hook jumps in if Christian Hook jumps in there have been there has been at least one occasion where Christian didn't end up doing any of the endurance race we'll have to see whether that proves to be the case this time. Christian is named as the driver for post pit stop on the documentation for the race, but uh, we've seen that swap before. We have 25 minutes of this one left to run then, halfway through the pit window. Werner Panhauser is in. Werner Panhauser will hand over to Leo Willett in the 128 car. Werner, another one on team open face, along with Martin Kazmarski in the helmet department. Werner Panhauser is an Austrian. He's previously raced with us in a Cayman in years gone by. He's also done Rallycross and the Le Mans Classic, which feels like the opposite ends of a spectrum. Assuming that 993 on the door is a, an homage of sorts to the Porsche 993, of which I approve. I also see Screwed McDuck. I also like swimming, albeit not in pools of money, so I approve. Very cool livery on that car. That's up there with the Gebhardt Motorsport prototype for... Uh, Unique liveries and go baby go is the instruction from the team as the car rolls away in the hands of Leo Willett. Now Leo, he's got a, a brand
Rain I really want to get to pick at some point. I haven't got to speak to him this weekend, but uh, he raced at GC4s very early in the category's history back in 2008 and has uh, since raced Porsche Cup cars in the Middle East, Central Europe, and also runs a Ferrari FXXK in the uh, Ferrari SX Cliente uh, track events. So I'd very much be keen to hear how one of those things compares to a, a Porsche 992 Cup. Our race leading car of Kenneth Heyer is coming out of the pit lane then. Now in the hands of Jamo Hartling and Joachim Bolting also in the pits as you saw there. Bolting will more than likely come out uh, second in Cup 2 behind Matthias Lezowski. So then the 11 car turns through turn 5. Still says Hubert Darmetko on the graphics. However, the timing screen uh, has updated to Matthias Lizovsky as scheduled. So we will assume it is Lizovsky in that number seven car. The car currently listed second in Cup 2, but it will ultimately, I think, be the uh, Cup 2 leading car. I don't think there are any uh, particularly uh, problematic pit stops to consider either. Everybody seems to have stayed within the confines of what they're supposed to do. Actually, the shortest pit stop of all came from the car we're following, our race leader, Jamo Hartling. I say race leader, we are yet to have... Uh, no, we are now uh, seeing uh, the Pierre Ellick car switched over, aren't we? I think that stop has already happened. In fact, no, it hasn't. Pierre Elliott is still out there and he has not yet pitted. So he's the one driver that owes us a pit stop and Christian Hook will more than likely get back into that car. Moritz, uh, Moritz Viskirchen has been setting a lightning pace out there on the circuit. He's just set the fastest lap at 2 minute point seven three zero. but I suspect that this man, Jamo Hartling, is about to go quicker still uh, now that he's getting into the swing of his stint. Pierre Ellett is in from the lead. Uh, last man to pit in the 115 uh, for a Porsche, which means that Jamo Hartling will assume the race lead. And while that's going on, big news within Cup 2. Matthias Lizovsky has just received a drive-through penalty for speeding in the pit lane. So Lizovsky, who felt like he should be home free now that he's taken over from Hubert Darmetko, is going to have it a little bit harder. Obviously, I can't uh, swear to whether it was Darmetko or Lizovsky that did the pit lane speeding, but someone did it. And that is going to cause perhaps some drama in the up to class depending on whether Lizovsky can rejoin ahead or behind the battle for second in Cup 2, which is also very close out on track, actually. Uh, Moritz Viskirchen is in fourth overall. Then just behind, Joachim Bolting and Pablo Brass are having a brilliant scrap for fifth overall. There they are at the moment. Pablo Brass is uh, behind now. Let's see if he can outpace Joachim Bolting. Their best laps are much of a muchness in the mid 202s. Through eight and nine we go. Less than 20 minutes are left on the clock, the pit stop window has closed. Everyone has served their mandatory pit stop. Your race leader is Jamo Hartling, who will more than likely go uncontested from here. Hartling is setting a scintillating pace out there on circuit. His last lap, a 1.57.6, the only driver under a two minute lap time acres faster than anybody else out there on the track right now.
Darmetko's car in the hands of Lizovsky is coming through the pit lane. So where will this car come out relative to that Cup 2 battle? <laughs> and PTT love it. PTT are in hysterics at their situation, which I suppose is quite good. Here, though, comes the Cup 2 second place battle. They're going to come through shot. Yes, Matthias Lizovsky has some work to do. He rejoins the race third in the Cup 2 class. Now, judging by the way that Lizovsky was being laughed at by BTT Racing, I have to assume that this is a challenge that he's created through his own errors. And uh, the PTT boys, fun lovers that they are, are now going to do exactly what we're doing. And that's sitting down, sitting back and watching as Matthias Lizovsky now begins the process of chasing down Joachim Bulting and Pavlo Brass. For those of you joining us for the first time, Matthias Lizovsky, a former Scirocco R Cup champion, when that was a support series to the uh, DTM many moons ago. He won the championship in 2011. He also, at one point, was a Silver Cup champion in the uh, what is now known as the GT World Challenge Sprint Cup here in Europe. And so, we have good reason to believe that he is going to be on the money. However, neither Pablo nor Joachim Bulting are slouches. So, even though he probably has the lap time advantage, well, we know he has the lap time advantage, He's still going to try and get past. And Pablo Brass, uh, a champion here in GT racing in Spain last year. Joachim Bolting, someone who's been racing for the better part of a decade in GT machinery. That's uh, two drivers that uh, Darmetko is going to, or rather that uh, Lizovsky is going to have to work quite hard to get past. You have to forgive me. Uh, it's the first time Lizovsky has appeared in this car. He's usually in his own number 13 machine uh, in the endurance race. So it is catching me out a little bit, seeing the uh, Darmetko car in the hands of Matthias Lizovsky. Pablo Blas has already been closed up then by the number seven driver. And Joachim Bolting again, I think somewhat has his destiny in the lap of somebody else, because if Pablo Blas can make life difficult for Matthias Lizovsky, then that plays into the plus line racing driver's favor and his chances of maybe, just maybe, lasting long enough to become the Cup 2 winner. But looking at this pace differential, I think it's not long at all. I think it's about three seconds before Matthias Lizovsky moves into second in class. And sure enough, that's exactly what's happened. Matthias Lizovsky gets through. P2 in the Cup 2 class is his, and now he can go Joachim Bolting hunting. I will reiterate that I've never seen a uh, team laugh at their own driver's misfortunes in quite the manner we saw from PTT earlier. That's all part of the fun of the GT Winter Series. We have some incredibly professional uh, drivers and teams throughout the paddock, but a lot of them are also letting their hair down and having a lot of fun too. It's a, a really good mix, a really good atmosphere in the GT Winter Series. PTT know what they're doing. They prepare an armada of Porsches and GT cars most weekends in our championship. They're also just a very fun bunch of people. Matty Sazowski, I'm sure, had a chuckle to himself as he rolled down the pits as well. But the serious work starts now. He's got himself up to second in class. He's now got to try and get the lead back. For as much as I've enjoyed talking to Joachim Bolting over the years, I've known him. I think he's a lovely chap. I do also think that uh, he's going to struggle to stave off the seven car for 14 minutes, but he'll give it his best shot as they run through turn three. We saw a lap ago that Lizovsky can get it done at the corkscrew. He might try that again. Here they come up to turn seven. Lizovsky 
setting himself up for a good run out of the corner. And sure enough, he again looks the inside. Will he be brave enough on the brakes? Well, yes, but contact between the two of them. That's a big moment. Lizovsky and Bolting meet in the middle. And does he have to do it again, again? Is the car okay? It looks as though the car is. Is it okay, though? He just braked in a part of the circuit he wouldn't normally. Let's keep an eye on that number seven. Is it damaged? Is it not? Matthias Lizovsky being made to do this the hard way. Where is... Let's see. Uh, yeah, that car looks okay. Let's see how it goes through 14 and 15. Yeah, that looks pretty much fine to me. So he's got to do it all again. He's got 12 minutes and 45 seconds to make up what is probably about five seconds, six seconds on the Cup 2 leader. He's got to get past Pablo Brass and then go and uh, enter a new negotiation with Joachim Bolting after the first set of meetings clearly went awry. Jamo Hartling, some 40 seconds clear at the front of the order here. He is absolutely hammering home the point that he will take this victory so long as all things stay good underneath him. Viskirchen, 40 seconds back in second place. Not setting lap times too far away from uh, Hartling, mind you. And then this battle for third overall and the Cup 2 lead is for sure the most intriguing thing on the circuit. Especially with Matthias Lizovsky trying to climb this mountain without any Sherpas in his favour and continually getting knocked down the hill in the process. He takes the class lead, he gets a drive through for speeding. He goes for the class lead again after working his way up from third. There's contact at turn eight. It's not being made easy for Matthias Lizovsky on this occasion. Here they come once again then towards turn 12 of the lap and can Lizovsky get it done? That is the big question. The other question we should ask that I have hitherto not is how is Joachim Bolting's car? It does look as though he might be a little bit off the pace now relative to Pablo Brass. Brass is closing in. And this could end up being a three-way fight. Bolting, Brass and Darmetko head down towards turn 16 then. You see the bonnet lifting there on uh, Joachim Bolting's car. Metko, I should say, Lozovsky caught me out again, uh, running quicker and quicker once again. Last lap, a 201.325. He just set his personal best fastest lap of the race. Uh, so Lozovsky is on the warpath. Previous lap from the two cars ahead in the 203s, so he's going a good two seconds a lap faster. And Pablo Brass is probably something like a half a lap away from having Lizovsky on his rear boot lid once again. Of course, last time, Lizovsky got through quite easily on Pablo Brass. It was Joachim Bolting where the uh, dramas began. Again, the top three in Cup 2 are within a matter of tenths of a second here in what is promising to be a very compelling finish to the GT Winter Series 55-minute Enduro. Covered by two and a half seconds at the line. It's probably more like 1.8 or something like that as they go through turn 12. And Pablo Brass is probably not going to be second in class for that much longer because Matthias Lizovsky is now right there with him. Lizovsky will set himself up nicely for 15. 
He does set himself up beautifully there. Look how much quicker he is out of the corner. He's going to be closing in all the way down the straight. And he'll get the opportunity to draw alongside before they get to the braking zone or at least set himself up nicely for an outbreaking manoeuvre. He's going to be off at the outside line. And no, he's going to dart to the inside. And uh, will he squeeze himself past Pablo Brass? Yes, he will. Matthias Lozowski once again assumes second in the Cup 2 category and fourth overall. Pablo Brass again having a look to see if he can maybe try and retaliate and again Joachim Balting would thank him for it but it's not to be. And now Balting is once again the target and if Matthias Lozowski was going easy on Joachim previously it didn't really look like he was. I somehow doubt that there's going to be any such easement this time around. Lozowski will probably be a little bit more careful to make sure that there's no repeat of that coming together. He will do the thinking for both parties, I think, to an extent, but uh, there is now a whiff of inevitability. Or will lightning strike twice? Battle for third overall, the battle for Cup 2 honours here in the GT Winter Series, coming down to the final seven minutes. No plus one lap in this race, of course, so once the clock hits zero, it's done. But even with that in mind, I don't think Joachim Balting is getting himself wide enough to uh, hold off Lizovsky for that long. Already, Lizovsky is right on the back of the plus line racing team Porsche despite the best efforts of Joachim Bulting. Lizovsky flashing the headlights, another good run out of turn 15. Will Bulting try and defend this or will it be Lizovsky's moment? Lizovsky goes to the inside line. Doesn't look like Bulting is trying too excessively hard to defend this one, both late on the brakes. Lizovsky, though, makes it look easy. Academic, he's through into the lead of the Cup 2 class, this time definitively, one would suspect, unless Bultin can pull something out of the bag. But the form book would suggest that once you allow Lizovsky into the class lead, short of another drive through, car number seven has found its place. Jamo Hartling, meanwhile, at the front of the order, is now 45 seconds clear at the front of the pack. Every time Jamo Hartling gets in the car at the moment, it feels like he's making a statement. Directing the cameras on him and saying, look what I can do. We've seen him race wheel to wheel with the likes of uh, Finn Wiebelhaus, Van der Mokowina, some of the youngsters being backed by top Mercedes, top GT3 teams. I love watching the sparks fly as well as we get closer and closer to the night time once again. Firmly into the dusk here at Motorland Aragon. And at this point, it really is a demonstration for J-Mo Hartling. See if he sparks up at all through eight and nine, the corkscrew. The Mercedes is one of the more sparky GT3 cars, but I don't think we're going to get a look at that on this occasion. It powers out of turn 10 then. J-Mo Hartling pressing on. Four minutes and 25 seconds left on the clock and Jamo, at this point, he can just nurse it, but he's not. <laughs> he's still lapping in the 156s out there on the circuit. Moritz Viskirchen is in the 58s. Everybody else is up over two minutes. The gap between Lizovsky and Bulting at the front of Cup 2 is out to two seconds already. So as anticipated, Lizovsky is now vanishing up the road. Jamo Hartling 
is taking the opportunity to soak in a few more laps of Motorland Aragon. We got a brief look there at Viskirchen. He's in second place. He was just putting a lap on Leo Willett there rather than fighting for a position. In fact, it was Miguel Gomez, but yes. Moritz Viskirchen then running nicely in second position. Out of turn 15 we go. Viskirchen. Will maybe be a little bit perturbed by the, the pace differential between himself and J-Mo. Both Viskirchen and J-Mo have exciting plans within the Schnitzelalm SR Motorsport setup for the 2024 season. Viskirchen Second place is going to have to do because JMO keeps hammering those laps away. Interesting that there's no sparks on his run through the corner. Maybe running slightly higher on the front end of that car. And I'm not talking about Kenneth. This will be, I believe, the penultimate lap of the race, just about. Indeed, be the penultimate lap as Jamo Hartling will cross the line momentarily. To begin what will be our final tour of Motorland Aragon for this weekend. Hartling comes past my commentary position now, having just set the fastest lap of the race. <laughs> J-Mo is on a roll. Meanwhile, Jürgen Bolting putting a lap there on Leo Willett. Go, baby, go. More like gone, baby, gone. As Jürgen puts a lap on that car. Good to see MS Racing Team back in the grid. I think they're with us in Barcelona as well, if I'm not mistaken. It's going to be a very strong grid in the GT Wind Series from everything I've heard. Next weekend, a fitting conclusion to what has been a really exciting year in the GT Winter Series. The GT Winter Series is the progenitor of all of this. It was the only championship for the first several years. And... Uh, Though we have spawned many a sister championship here now in Giedlik Racing. There's always going to be eyes on the GT Championship and seeing which big names show up on a given weekend. The magic of seeing someone like Nicky Team going up against drivers he never normally would. It's all part of the GT Winter Series mantra as well as putting cars together that you'd otherwise never see on track at the same time from teams that would never normally encounter each other in the same paddock. Pablo Brass puts a lap on Willett as well then. He seemingly will have to accept third in Cup 2 behind Joachim Bolting. Jamo Hartling, meanwhile, will be coming through the last couple of corners now to finish this race. And indeed, Jamo Hartling does cross the line to secure the race victory. Jamo has done it for SR Motorsport. He will further extend the championship advantage. I think that's a big think on that, that uh, Jamo and Kenneth are not quite the 2024 GT Win Series champions. If anyone has better maths, I defer. Uh, but uh, Hartling and Hyatt go into Barcelona with the title firmly within their grasp. Moritz Viskirchen will cross the line in second place. He's just coming through turn 16 now. It 
it will be a 1-2 for the Schnitzelaum family, SR Motorsport and Schnitzelaum Racing. This Kirschen crosses the line in P2. Matthias Zizovsky, meanwhile, through obstacles in his own way, had obstacles of other natures to contend with as well, but he's on his way to third overall and the Pro-Am Pro -Am Cup 2 win. His perfect run of form within Cup 2 in the GT Win Series endurance races continues, and this time he's dragged along a friend in the form of Hubert Darmetko. It's a win in Cup 2 for Darmetko and Lizovsky in the Cup 2 category. Joachim Balting will hold on to second in class in fourth overall. Pablo Brass will be next across the line in fifth place. He's still getting into it, though, with Leo Willett by the looks of it. And everyone has now crossed the line as uh, Pablo Brass is the last man to take the flag in fifth overall. And that then is the conclusion to our race weekend. At least in terms of the on-track action, we will now celebrate the weekend together. One last set of podiums. One last interview as well, I imagine, down in the pits with Izzy, all going well. The GT Win Series, the prototypes, the GT4s, and indeed the formulas will all head to the incredible Circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia, next up. Delightful slash horrible feedback down there. I do apologize to anyone who's getting their ears exploded. Does the car have a name above its left headlight there? Have they named the car? It does look a bit like they might have done. Jamo Hartling. You can't name him anything but the winner once he gets behind the wheel at the moment. Another really magnificent weekend from him and Kenneth Hyatt. The duo right on the verge of being the 2024 GT Winter Series champs. Obviously, the Schnitzelaum guys do name their cars, I think, because look, there's a name on the Schnitzelaum car above the left headlight as well. I hadn't spotted this before. I'm going to have to go have a look, aren't I? Uh, after the racing is done for the day. Got to know what to call these cars for the season finale. Moritz Viskirchen is out of the car. And congratulates J-Mo Hartling. Moritz, wait until you see J-Mo's lap deltas. Scary stuff. J-Mo has been exemplary this weekend. And... Uh, Kenneth Hyatt started the race off perfectly as well. Handed it to J-Mo in a solid position. All that remained to do from there was bring it home. The last of the light is fading over Motorland Aragon then. And we have overseen some really incredible motor racing over all five of the categories this weekend. Of course, the guest appearance for the non-championship round of Euro Cup 3 was really very exciting to see. But for now, we can hear about the last race of the day, Jamo Hartling and Izzy Browning. Hello, everyone. Welcome down for the final time, our final race of the weekend. And I've got our winner here, Jamo Hartling, with me. Jamo, that was a really, really incredible drive. That was so impressive to watch. How did that feel for you in the car? Uh, for me also, it feels uh, incredible. Uh, Kenneth did a great, very great job at the beginning of the race. Um, yeah, and then we have the, uh, the driver change and I only carry it, try to carry it at home. Well, you were nearly a minute up the road and you didn't, didn't want to back off. You set the fastest lap right towards the end of the race as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, what I say, I give my best and uh, yeah, carry it only at home. Kenneth, you, you want to jump in with us? I mean, look at that. 
camaraderie between it's the gold. two. That was an absolutely fabulous drive from both of you. Not quite the champions yet, but it was a champion's drive from both of you. So just give us your thoughts on that and uh, Jomo here at the end. Yeah, Jamie, it's more or less a rocket now. Uh, it's getting better and better every weekend so fast. Uh, I prepare the car for him as good as possible in the lead and uh, don't use so much tire, no no track limits and so on. And then he yeah, improved another time. 56-3 in the race is really great. And you're looking forward to next weekend in Barcelona? Yeah, we want to be champions and we have to be smart at the weekend, I think. Definitely. All right, well, congratulations, guys. That was really, really fun to watch. We'll let you get off to the podium. See you later. OK, guys, that's our final race of the weekend done. I'm a bit sad. It's uh, gone quite quickly, actually. Although I will say I won't miss the wind. So hopefully we'll get less of that next week in Barcelona. We're going to head straight up to the podium as the drivers go. But before, we're just going to head back to Adam Weller. You know what, Izzy, I'll concur. The wind truly does blow. Otherwise, it's been a brilliant weekend here in the Gielik Racing paddock. And what a way to uh, find the cherry and put it on top of the cake. J-Mo Hartling and Kenneth Heyer there. Always great to hear from the both of them. A great relationship between two of the drivers as well. We did a video feature a little while ago with uh, Kenneth where he talked a little bit about uh, his uh, admiration for uh, his young protege, J-Mo Hartling, as a matter of fact. And uh, really a great driver pairing. Moritz Viskirchen and David Felinius will be pretty pleased with second place as well. Lizovsky and Darmetko, of course, third in class, ultimately. Uh, sorry, third overall, ultimately, winning the Cup 2 class. And uh, Macias Lizovsky definitely didn't make it easy for himself. It was a... I get knocked down, but I get up again. A tub-thumping kind of motor race for him. Could call it a chumba-wumba kind of motor race as well. If any of you know what I'm talking about, then brilliant, you're on my wavelength. <laughs> but uh, it was a very tough going for uh, Matthias Lizovsky once he took over the car from Darmetko, but he has the raw pace uh, to tackle adversity and still get to the flag first. And that's exactly what we saw from him. Bolting will be happy with second in class, hopefully. And Pablo Brass ending the weekend on a high after a bit of a, a low earlier on. Spinning off into the gravel on the first lap, he'll get to stand on the podium once more here at Motorland Aragon. Here are the results. J-Mo Hartling winning the race by 54 seconds over Moritz Viskirchen. Hubert Darmetko taking third overall ahead of Joachim Bolting and Pablo Brass, the orange class there, the Cup 2 category. Of course, your overall, your Cup 2 podium there in third, fourth and fifth overall. Christian Hook finishing sixth and third among the GT3s for Rinaldi Racing alongside Pierre Ellett. Leo Willett and Werner Panhauser finish seventh. Miguel Gomez and Pedro Brass share the car that comes home in eighth. So then the sun is setting for the final time before we drive down on Monday to Barcelona. If you're, for some reason, doing the improbable journey between Alcanaz, Alcanaz and Barcelona, uh, do bear in mind you will see a lot of racing trucks on your way down from our four categories. Uh, it is always fun to be involved in that little convoy as they make their way down uh, to our next venue. And uh, the four championships will be on the line. In the case of the GTs, and the GT4s, it feels fairly secure to the respective favourites for SETI Motorsport and SR Motorsport. In prototypes, anything could still happen. Sufi has a hand on the title, certainly. Uh, but the real big question mark, I think, going into that weekend will be the formulas. Who will come out on top between Peebles, Cardenas, or any of the others involved as well. There's still a couple of others in mathematical contention there too. Uh, there have been a lot of interesting developments in all of our championships here at Motorland Aragon. Uh, the first time that uh, the Giedlik Racing Wind Series package has been here to this circuit, and uh, certainly it has delivered on its promise for the drivers who've all been very keen to go racing here for the first time, and indeed, uh, for those of us trackside, uh, we can now, I believe, go down to the podium. Let's go there now. 
Absolutely. Thank you very much, Adam Weller. Into the commentary box, it's one more podium to go for the GT Winter Series. Thank you very much for still joining us in the live stream and, of course, downstairs in the pit lane just as well. It isn't very comfy, is it? But it's another set of podiums to go through. And, of course, well done to all of the drivers. Well deserved after a long, long day. We start our podium procedure with the GT3 class. So let's please welcome for the first step onto the podium for this weekend for Rinaldi Racing and Pierre Eret and Christian Hook. Third place for Pierre Eret and Christian Hook in GT3 class. Well done, guys. Thank you very much. One driver is missing, I think. Right, okay. So let's continue with our second place drivers. For Schnitzler Arm Racing, it's David Thelenius and Moritz Wiskirchen. And your GT3 winners in race three, Foressa Motorsport, Kenneth Heyer and Jamo Hertling. Well done. Proper, proper title contenders next week in Barcelona. So Diego Ferrao, Sergio Fonseca and Stefan Lehner are there to present the trophies. Of course, all three members of the Gatelich Racing and GT Winter Series organization with a set of trophies there to our GT3 podium finishers in race three. We've got uh, Daniel Bergin and Emilio Pekarik, our photographer and videographer as well up here on the podium to collect some more shots from our drivers and of course we uh, will give some seconds to our po uh, no we won't uh, there's champagne being sprayed that's all right well done guys that's well deserved big round of applause once again to the podium finishers in gt3 pierre Eret and christian hook in third place david Thelanius and moritz wiskirchen in second and your winners kenneth heyer and jamo hertling Well done, guys. Thank you very much. And of course, we would like to speak to uh, our driver, Christian Eurov. Okay. <laughs> okay. Then, then we speak to uh, Joachim Bölting there, of course. Uh, the, he was, he's going to be on the uh, second podium. You're cold, Kenneth. Yeah. It's quite cold in Aragon. <laughs> it's uh, GT Winter Series. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're really reminded why it's called GT Winter Series, aren't we? Uh, Jamo, absolutely fantastic stuff. Uh, you spoke to our guys down there in the pits. Uh, let's speak to Moritz, of course, as well. Let's turn around, guys, because we've got our camera over there. That's a bit easier. Uh, I guess a well-deserved bottle of champagne there. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Uh, first time in a GT3 car, so, and with this guy, it was <laughs> and a great team, so it was all, it was, can't ask for more than that. And Morris, despite the, uh, g the the windy bits, did you enjoy your time out in the uh, Motorland Aragon this time? Yeah, I mean, this track is just absolutely amazing in combination with this car. Uh, it was a lot of fun, yeah. Well done to you guys. Thank you very much. I think all the others are gone. Yes, indeed. They are freezing cold, which is absolutely fair. So thank you very much to all our GT3 podium finishers. One more weekend to go in a week's time in Barcelona as the Gatelich team are preparing one more set of champagne bottles for our second and last podium. And this is for our Cup 2 runners and the Porsche Carrera uh, cup cars with three more driver pairings or single drivers coming onto the stage. And we start with our third place driver, and that's for Vileco Motorsport, Pablo Bras. Congratulations. And by the way, it's not only third place on the podium, but it's also his birthday. So happy birthday to Pablo just as well. And congratulations and all the best. Well done to Pablo. In second place, what a great weekend for him. S third time on the podium for Plus Line Racing, Joachim Bölting. Not only quick on the circuit, but on the podium just as well as he was almost ready to climb as I was still announcing him. And here come your winners in Cup 2 class for PTT Racing, Hubert Ametko and Mateo Schlizowski. Well done, guys. Congratulations to the PTT Racing Squad. 
as Sergio Diogo and Stefan are heading out onto the podium once again to present the trophies to our winning Cup 2 squads with Pablo Brass in third place with Joachim Bölting for the third time on the podium this weekend joined by Hubert Dametko and of course Mateusz Lizowski who um, as usual stepped into the car for the third and last race of the weekend just as well as we collect some more photos and now <laughs> that was quick it's time for champagne at least for some of them <laughs> there we go that's a, st a two-stage champagne shower there the ptt guys being very quick and the others joining in as well i'm trying to gather everyone once again in front of our stage uh, pablo happy birthday <laughs> and uh, joachim what a great weekend for you three per podium positions yeah. fantastic wasn't it yeah one two and three all together it's perfect it was the plan <laughs> i'm kidding <laughs> enjoy the evening joachim where's the rest i think they are all gone uh Okay, well, that's it then for our podium ceremony. They're still here. Yeah, guys, please, please join me again on the stage. Thank you very much. Just give us a second, and then we are back with our uh, two winning PTT Racing Porsche 911 Carrera Cup drivers. Uh, who but another streak of podium finishes this weekend. How was your weekend here in Aragon? Uh, good enough. Uh, thanks to the team, of course, and coaching from Mateusz. Uh, but I had a really bad start today on the endurance race. But luckily, uh, we made it. Now, Mateusz, of course, you're always coaching Hubert. It's always the same car. But the beauty about GT Winter Series is all the weekends are a bit different, aren't they? So is that something you need to adopt in your coaching as well? Yes, of course. I'm a coach as well, Martin Kaczmarski. He did a really good job this weekend. And so back to the race. The <laughs> race was uh, really tough because we get a drive through penalty. So I had to push. And after uh, I was too aggressive on the overtaking, so I spawned around. Yeah, but hopefully uh, I put the clutch, you know, uh, did really good, uh, really good back on the on the circuit and I could uh, beat the, the competitors. So thank you for them. Thank you for the fight. Thank you for the organization and of course of the team because they are amazing <laughs> <laughs> like always <laughs> they are absolutely great supporters thank you very much guys and enjoy your evening good to see you next time out so that concludes our sets of podiums at the GT Winter, S Winter Series here at Motorland Aragon Hello everyone, welcome down for the final time to the podium. We've come to the end of the weekend here at Aragon and I'm joined by Adam Weller who is in a t-shirt. I am most definitely not going to be in a t-shirt anytime soon. And Lucas Gajewski. Guys, my first weekend in a winter series paddock. It's been amazing. How's your day been? lengthy but good uh yes a temperature is a social construct wind is a reality and we saw that a lot over the course of the day obviously euro cup three the guinea pigs earlier on all straight lining as did the fws guys we got our head around that as the day went on and in general i think all of those races were upper sevens out of ten if not higher very fun very true lucas i mean you were on the podium all day i was down in the pit lane so you uh, you felt the wind that adam was just talking about and it did affect some of our drivers today didn't it it, it definitely did and i i think it produced very interesting racing which of course is also down to the specifics of this circuit with this enormous straight in the last sector uh, we've seen amazing battles out there and it was very very good fun to watch wasn't it yeah, it definitely was. I've had a fantastic first weekend in the Winter Series paddock. Okay, you know what I'm going to do. Oh. Put you on the spot. 
Highlight of the of the weekend? Oh, highlight of the weekend. That's a different spot than I thought you'd put me on. Go on, highlight of the day then. Oh, gosh, OK. <laughs> um, I will say uh, Thomas Strauben's win in FWS, not only because, obviously, it felt like a little while coming that Roding would have a car up there, it felt like a long while coming that Strauben would have such a good result, but also because of the execution. There was a lot of racing acumen behind those last few laps for Thomas Strauben. Very worthy win for him. I'm glad you said that because it gives me an opportunity to thank the Road and Motorsport team who have looked after me all day and have kept me in their garage and have kept me out the wind. But yeah, it was. It was fantastic to see Thomas take that win. And I was, as I said, in that garage and they were all elated for him. So I think it's going to do a lot for his confidence. Lucas, you've had the time to think. Mm -hmm. What's your highlight of the day? Highlight of the day, either the uh, last lap dash in Euro Cup 3, which I think was very interesting to watch, but I'm honest. It has to be the uh, Fiat Panda 100 HP uh, <laughs> leading car. I think that's our <laughs> highlight of the day, isn't it? Yeah, I'll give you that. My highlight of the day, we're going to give for the final race, J-Mo Hartling and Kenneth Heyer. I mean, they did a fantastic job and I thoroughly enjoyed watching them do that. Right, that brings us to the end of the weekend. As I've already said, it has been an absolutely fabulous time in the Winter Series paddock for me. Lucas, we're saying goodbye to you. You yes. won't be with us at Barcelona, so uh, we'll miss you very much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, and please make sure to tune in and enjoy the year Barcelona season ending next week. This is going to be a good one for sure. It is going to be a good one. So all that's left to say is thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you as well to the Alpha Live guys who have also braved the elements today. They have done an amazing job to bring you the stream. And all that's left to say is we'll see you in Barcelona.